Lecture 21 of the Proper Distinction Between Law and Gospel by C. F. W. Walther Translated by W. H. T. Dow This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 21st Evening Lecture, March 6th, 1885 My friends, the world of unbelievers regards the tenet of the Christian religion that for salvation everything depends on a person's faith as an impossibility and discredits it it seems to them a manifest folly yea a proof that even the christian religion like all the other religions that have originated from so-called supernatural revelations is bent on deluding people they claim that the christian religion which purports to be supernaturally revealed by making faith the chief requisite for salvation is not superior to brahmism which requires faith in the vedas the sacred books of the hindus or mohammedism which requires chiefly faith in the koran of mohammed the acknowledged prophet of lies as containing the true religion of salvation their argument is that it is a matter of no moment to the father in heaven that a person believes or disbelieves since true religion cannot consist in anything else than an upright life the exercise of virtue and good works what sin they say can there be in a person's failure to believe something that is utterly contrary to his God-given reason. If there is a God and a future judgment, men, they claim, will on that day not be asked what they have believed, but how they have conducted themselves during their present life. Others, endeavouring to enter more deeply into the matter, assert that if the Father in heaven is especially pleased with the person's faith, because it is such a glorious work and such a beautiful virtue, they can see no reason whatever why he should not be equally well pleased, for instance, with a person's charity, patience, fortitude, justice, impartiality, truthfulness, and similar qualities. What is the source from which these objections to the Christian doctrine concerning faith spring? Gross ignorance is without question the primary source. People simply do not know what faith is according to the Holy Scriptures. Far from regarding justifying and saving faith as nothing else than holding fast stubbornly and strictly to certain religious teachings, as the Hindus and Mohammedans view faith, the Christian doctrine rather declares this to be entirely useless, yea, as leading people astray to perdition. It tells men that if they have no better reliance, they are building on sand. Moreover, far from assigning to faith such a prominent position, on the assumption that faith is a glorious work and oppressor's virtue. Christianity teaches, on the contrary, that faith does not justify and save a person because it is such a good work, but on account of the redemption accomplished by Jesus Christ, which faith apprehends. This reflection takes us back once more to our tenth thesis. A week ago we were told that faith is not a dead, inert affair, but something that transforms and renews the heart, regenerates a person, and brings the Holy Spirit into his soul. Tonight we shall be occupied chiefly with the second part of the tenth thesis, which states that the word of God, the law and the gospel, is not rightly divided, but commingled when the preacher describes faith in a manner as if it makes a person righteous and saves him for the reason that it produces in him love and a reformation of his mode of living. Holy Scriptures emphatically testify that there can be no genuine faith without love, without a renewal of the heart, without sanctification, without an abundance of good works. But it testifies at the same time that the renewal of the heart, love, and the good works which faith produces are not the justifying and saving element in a person's faith. Innumerable passages of Scripture could be cited in proof of this statement. We shall only dwell on the principal passages. Romans 4.16 says, Therefore it is of faith, that it might be by grace, to the end that the promise might be sure to all the seed. Paul here declares that the very reason why we teach righteousness by faith is because we teach that a person is justified in the sight of God and saved by grace. Now, if faith were to make us righteous because of some good quality inherent in us, it would be a wrong conclusion to teach a person's justification by faith since he is justified and saved by grace. Justification is by grace through faith, however, not because of good qualities inherent in faith. In justification, that is not at all taken into consideration, but merely the fact that Jesus Christ has long ago redeemed the entire world, 
that he has done and suffered all that men ought to have done and suffered, and that men are merely to accept his work as their own. Hence, the way to salvation is this. We are doing nothing, absolutely nothing, towards our salvation. But Christ has already done everything for us, and we must merely cling to what he has done, draw consolation from his finished work of redemption, and trust in it for our salvation. The passage in Romans is a precious text, a text that deserves to be remembered. If something that we must do belonged to the justifying quality of faith, the apostle would, in this text, be drawing a false conclusion. In that case, he should have said, By faith, in so far as it aids us to accomplish something good. But that is not the reason why faith justifies. It justifies because it accepts the merit of Christ. Faith is only the hand with which we grasp what God offers. Philippians 3, 8 through 9, the same apostle states, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Another precious passage, a veritable sun shedding bright light on the real essence of faith. The apostle declares that he is indeed righteous. However, the righteousness which he has obtained by faith is not at all his own righteousness, but the righteousness of Christ. Accordingly, when we become righteous by faith, we are made righteous by an alien righteousness. God beholds in us absolutely nothing that he could count as righteousness to our credit. It is another's righteousness which we have by faith. We have not acquired it or contributed anything towards it. Had we contributed love towards it, and were God to justify us on that account, our righteousness would not be an alien righteousness, or it would at least be only half alien, to supplement our own imperfect righteousness. The apostle declares, I have no righteousness of my own, but only the righteousness which God credits to faith. Romans 4.5, the apostle states, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. When a person is justified, he has been previously a godless, not a godly person, made godly by faith, and on that account godly. Any one possessing genuine faith acknowledges that he has been godless, meriting hell and damnation, lost, contaminated with sin from the crown of his head to the sole of his feet, and that a divine miracle of grace was performed on him when God said to him, the moment he believed in his Saviour, Thou art counted as righteous. I behold in thee no righteousness of thine own, but I cover thee with the righteousness of my Son, and henceforth behold in thee nothing but righteousness. Whoever does not come to Christ as an ungodly person does not come to him at all. Ephesians 2, 8-9 we read, for by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. This sounds as if the apostle felt that he was not saying enough to keep men from being led astray into self-righteousness. First, he says, by grace are ye saved. Next, he adds, through faith. Lest someone think he had achieved this feat by his faith, the apostle continues, and that not of yourselves. Whence, then, is it? It is the gift of God. And to head off any thought of a person's own merit, he adds, not of works, such as a person's love or charity would be. He winds up with the statement, lest any man should boast. Now, a person who claims that faith justifies on account of love which follows it, could say, I have been justified by faith, but that was because I loved at the same time because I had performed good works at the same time, because I had become a different person. That is why God regards me as righteous. This thought the Apostle rules out of order by his concluding remarks. Whoever imagines that there is a little areola, a little glory, that he may claim as his own, is still without the faith that justifies, is still blind, and is not walking in the way of salvation, but is headed straight for perdition. Romans 11.6, the Apostle writes, If by grace 
then it is no more of works. Otherwise grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise work is no more work. The apostle tries to make the element of grace quite plain. He invites his readers to reflect that when they admit that their salvation is by grace, it cannot be by merit. For that would destroy the idea of grace. Adding merit to grace renders grace void. In that case, all talk of grace is miserable bosh. On the other hand, if salvation is by the merit of works, grace does not count, or merit would not be merit. Nothing remains, then, for a person but to believe firmly that he has been made righteous out of God's pure, everlasting mercy by faith. Even when his faith bears good fruits, these follow later, after he has received all that is necessary for his salvation. First a person is saved, then he becomes godly. First he must be made an heir of heaven, then he becomes a different person. Here we have the wonderful quality of the Christian religion. If a person wants to do everything himself to get to heaven, he is lost. No, he must first be made an heir of salvation and be saved. After that he begins to live a life filled with gratitude to God. That is why Luther says that the Christian religion is, in a word, a religion of gratitude. All the good that Christians do is not done to merit something. We would not know what to take up for the purpose of acquiring merit. Everything has been given to us. Righteousness, our everlasting heritage, our salvation. All that remains for us to do is to thank God. And then there is this, that out of great kindness God proposes to give to those who are specially faithful in this life a peculiar glory in addition to their salvation. That is no paltry affair in the life to come. For God bestows extraordinary gifts when he gives those gifts of glory. There will be a great difference among Christians in the life to come. For even the least plus, which one of the saints receives above that which his fellow saints get in heaven, is no trifle. Why? Because it is an ever-enduring gift. For that reason we must be truly grateful to God after having received eternal life for all that we are and possess. Only works proceeding from gratitude are genuinely good works. Even in our secular relations, when a person is very willing to render service to another because he hopes for a reward, we denounce him as our miserable cheat who pretended love to us while he speculated on financial gain and simulated disinterested service for pay. Such a person nauseates us. He figures on getting more from us than he does for us, and becomes malicious and hostile to us when his hopes are frustrated. The real good works, therefore, are works to which gratitude toward God prompts us. Whoever has true faith never thinks of meriting something good for himself by his service. He cannot help expressing his gratitude by love and good works. His heart has been changed. It has been softened by the richness of God's love which he has experienced. Over and above this, God is so gracious that he rewards even the good works which he accomplishes in us. For the good works done by Christians are God's works. The objection is raised against us that in sanctification a person is surely doing something himself. But a person never begins any good work of his own accord. God must prompt him and work in him even to will to desire to do the good work that he is to perform. Accordingly, whenever Christians seem to do something good, it is by the power and operation of God in them that they do it. The papists occasionally say that a person is justified and saved by faith, but they add, provided love is added to faith. They do not mean to say merely this, that the person who has no love has no faith. That is what we also teach, in accordance with Scripture. What they mean is this. A person may have the true faith wrought in him by the Holy Spirit, but if love is not added to it, faith is absolutely worthless. That is why they call love the forma of faith. In theological terminology, you know, forma is that which makes a matter what it is, that is, an essential quality. The papists declare that if love is not added to faith, faith may be genuine, but it is not justifying faith. Because love is the forma of faith, it makes justifying faith what the name indicates. 
Such faith they call fides formata, faith that has received the proper form. If love has not been added, they call that faith fides informis, faith without its proper form. The Council of Trent, in its sixth session, adopted chapter 7, canon 28, which reads, Faith, when love is not added to it, neither forms a vital union with Christ, nor does it make a person a living member of the body of Christ. Catechumens acquire the faith which confers eternal life, which faith without love cannot confer. For this reason they are told immediately the word of Christ, If thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. The papists do not speak of faith from which love springs. That would be correct. For if faith does not produce love, it is a mere sham. What they mean is this. You may have a good faith, but it does not justify you if love is not added to it. Love is not to flow from faith. That is something altogether impossible, according to their teaching, because they understand by faith the mere inert mental perception of the doctrines of the church. Love, they say, must be added to faith. Then faith will justify you. Well, if that is the case, what then is it that justifies? Only love, or a person's good works. They do not say this in plain terms, but any person who reflects but a little on what they say is compelled to get this meaning out of their remarks. If faith does not justify in the first place, then it must be that alone which is added to faith which does the justifying. By catechumens, the papists mean those who want to join their church. These are told that without love, faith does not confer everlasting life. And the words of Christ in Matthew 19.17 are cited to them for proof. Here we have the papists' faith. Faith, though admittedly necessary, does not obtain everlasting life. They say, if a person does not keep the commandments, faith is of no help to him. After he has complied with the command of Christ to believe, he must comply with the other command, to keep the commandments. The rich young man in Matthew 19 had asked the Lord, What good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? His question had not been, What must I do? But what good thing shall I do? Accordingly, Christ had to tell him, You must keep the commandments. That did not mean that the rich man could really keep them. The Lord was simply answering the question of the person who was head over heels merged in self-righteousness. When the Lord failed to cure him of his awful blindness by telling him he must love God above all things and his neighbor as himself, he gave him an additional lesson by telling him to sell all that he had and give it to the poor. That lesson sent the young man away with a sad heart. The sting had without question been driven home to him. He knew now that he did not love God above all things. He had to acknowledge that Jesus had judged him rightly. But he was not seriously concerned about his salvation, otherwise he would have admitted that he was unable to do what the Lord commanded, and would be lost if that was the only way to obtain everlasting life. Had he admitted that, the Lord would have told him, Here is one who can save you. Believe in me, and though you were an abominable man and had wantonly transgressed the commandments, you wilt be saved. But he went away. Without doubt, if he had become a believer, Scripture would have recorded that fact. Someone might think that possibly the papists, after all, meant only this, that a dead lip faith does not justify a person, exactly what we teach ourselves. But no, they mean to say, no matter how good a person's faith is, it does not save him unless love is added to it. That is about as wise a statement as if I would say, An apple tree may be ever so good, but unless you add fruit to it, it is not an apple tree. Why, the reverse is true. Apples do not make an apple tree, but the apple tree produces apples. However, the papists have expressed themselves quite plainly on this matter. In the aforementioned chapter in Canon, the Council of Trent decreed, If any one says that faith is lost at the same time when grace is lost by sin, or that the faith which remains in the sinner is not genuine faith, although it may not be a living faith, or that the person who has faith without love is not a Christian, let him be accursed. They assert, then, that a person falling into mortal sin does not lose faith. 
we would say that a person living in mortal sin may possess a perfect historical faith. However, we add that such faith is not genuine, but a mere sham. The papists, however, declare it to be genuine faith. They speak of faith as something apart from love. Love must join faith, in their view, in order to make faith good. They regard faith to be a beautiful receptacle that serves no other purpose than to store something away in it. The treasure that is to be placed in this vessel is love. When placed in the vessel, it makes the vessel much more precious than the vessel previously was. Thus the papists hold that faith is made precious through the addition of love. Or, they may put it this way, faith justifies, however, with the understanding that it has love. In the days of John Gerhardt, the theologians of Cologne, at that time the best reputed theologians of Rome, published the Centura Coloniensis. In this treatise they state, The fact that the just lives by his faith is not due solely to Christ or his work. Yea, its justifying forma or power it does not derive from Christ, whom it apprehends and possesses, but from its own love. This statement declares, not only that love must be added to faith, but that in justifying faith love is the only reason why it justifies. Let us now hear a few testimonies from Luther on the so-called fides formata, as contrasted with the fides informis, or faith that has a true essence, as placed over against that faith which, according to the papist view, is indeed true faith, but does not justify. In his commentary on Galatians, Luther says, the sophists, he means the papistic theologians, ready to pervert the scriptures, add these acute glosses to this passage, Galatians 3.11, the just lives by his faith. However, by the faith that is efficacious, operates, or has obtained its proper form by love, formata caritate. If faith lacks this form, informis, it does not justify this gloss they have spun out of their own brain. They are doing violence to the prophet's, Habakkuk's, words. Luther means they have twisted and perverted this precious, comforting passage. Indeed, they say, the apostle, as well as the prophet Habakkuk, have stated, the just lives by his faith. But what faith does he mean? Why, an active faith that does good works, that has love, and that has renewed the person. That, that alone is the faith which he meant, and it is only for this reason that man lives by faith. Luther proceeds, I would not be displeased with their gloss if by faith properly formed they understood a genuine faith, of which we speak in theology, or, as Paul calls it, faith unfeigned. For in that case, faith would not be set up as something distinct over against love, but it would be in opposition to a vain opinion which men may have of faith. We too distinguish between spurious and genuine faith. A spurious or fictitious faith exists in a person who has heard about God, Christ, and all the mysteries of incarnation and redemption, who has perceived these matters mentally and knows how to talk about them beautifully, yet all remains vain imagination. His hearing of these matters has merely left an echo of the gospel in his heart, concerning which he babbles. But it is not in reality faith for it does not renew and transform the heart, does not produce a new man, but leaves the person in his former opinion and conduct. Such faith is actually baneful. It would be better for such a person not to have it. A moral philosopher of this world is better than a hypocrite who has this faith. Mark well. Luther admits the phrase fides formata, if it is to signify nothing else than genuine faith of the heart. He knew that faith which does not purify the heart does not justify, but keeps its possessor in sin. The papists have at all times represented the Lutherans as teaching that faith alone justifies, and that therefore the believer must do no good works. This is a shameful doctrine, calculated to repel people from the practice of good works. It would amount to telling the people to quit doing good works and only to believe, and heaven would immediately be their heritage. The better informed papists, of course, know that this is not Lutheran doctrine. However, there are ever so many papists, even among the priesthood, who actually regard the Lutheran Church as a noxious sect, 
which teaches that the mere mental perception of certain tenets justifies and saves men and lands them in heaven, no matter what kind of life they lead. In opposition to this view, Luther declares that if fides formata signified the faith wrought by the Holy Spirit, this faith is a fruitful source of all good works. And if it is said that this faith justifies, he is in full harmony with the papists. However, they must not add, faith saves because it has the aforementioned beautiful form. For faith first justifies and saves a person, and after that it is also productive of good works. Luther continues, Accordingly, if they, the papists, were to distinguish faith properly formed, fidem formatum, from false or fictitious faith, their distinction would not be offensive to me. But they are speaking of faith that receives its proper form from love, and they establish two kinds of faith, faith unformed and faith properly formed, in formem et formatum. This altogether noxious and diabolical gloss I am forced to repudiate in the strongest terms. For they say, even where there is infused faith, which is a gift of the Holy Spirit, and in addition acquired faith, which we produce ourselves by many acts of believing, still both these kinds are unformed. They receive their proper form by love. Let us remember that a host of people have been snared by the Jesuits, and when reproved by Lutherans that they do not teach justification by faith at all, they reply, Your Lutheran preacher has told you that. We do not teach that doctrine. We are teaching a better doctrine than yours. You say, only believe, and you will go to heaven. We say, a person is justified by faith, namely by faith which worketh by love, as the Apostle Paul teaches. Now, a person not knowing that all this is a piece of knavery, imagines that he has been wrongly informed about the doctrine of the Catholic Church. However, let no one permit himself to be deceived. The Jesuits do not speak of faith as a source of love, but of faith that has love existing alongside of it. Hence it is a lie when they say, in any sense, that a person is justified by faith. When they add the term formata to fides, they really mean works. For they say that a person is justified by faith if he has works in addition to faith. Their faith is worth no more than the imitation money used in a business college, or the toy money of children, which looks like real money but has no purchasing power. The Roman doctrine of justification is nothing else than a complete denial, annihilation, and condemnation of the gospel. Any sect is incomparably better than the papacy, the Roman church. The sects worry ever so much over their works of piety, their wrestling for grace, and their prayers, but they still hold fast the teaching that faith in the Lord Jesus alone justifies and saves a person. When a poor Methodist or Baptist is in his final agony, he realizes that faith alone saves, and he dies saved when he takes refuge in the Lord Christ. But the dying papist has to think of purgatory, and how long he may have to be confined in it because he lacks charity and good works. He has to consider himself lost. That was the devil's aim when he founded the papacy. He wanted to destroy the redemption of Christ by the abominable doctrine that faith does not justify and save, except when there is another element added to it which acquires salvation. In conclusion, Luther writes, According to their fancy, Faith without love is like a painting or anything beautiful to behold that is placed in the dark and cannot be seen until light is let into the place, that is, until love is added to it. By this view love is made the essence of faith, and faith the material on which love works. That means that love is placed above faith, and a person's righteousness is ascribed not to his faith but to his love. For whatever gives a certain quality to something, possesses that quality in a higher degree. Therefore the Romanists are really ascribing nothing at all to faith, because they ascribe righteousness to faith only on account of love. Moreover, these perverters of the gospel of Christ say that infused faith, which has not been obtained by preaching or some other operation, but is wrought in man by the Holy Spirit, can exist in a person who is guilty of a mortal sin, and can be found in the worst scoundrels. 
For this reason, they declare it an inert and useless thing when it is alone, even if it were to be of the wonder-working kind. Thus they rob faith entirely of its function and ascribe it to love, by declaring faith utterly worthless, unless that which gives faith its proper form, namely love, is added to it. In his commentary on Galatians, on chapter 2, verse 19, Luther writes, When I have thus apprehended Christ by faith, have become dead to the law, justified from sin, and liberated from death, the devil, and hell by Christ, I begin to do good works, to love God, to show Him gratitude, and to practice love towards my fellow man. But my love, or the works that follow after faith, neither give the proper form to my faith, nor do they adorn it. But my faith gives love its proper form, and adorns it. Caritas non est forma fidei, said fides est forma caritatis. This axiom of Luther shows up still more plainly the hideousness of the papist teaching regarding faith. For, mark you, they do not say that faith does not save when a person has formed faith by his own effort. But even when it is genuine faith, produced in a person's heart by the Holy Spirit, even this true faith, they hold, can exist in a person who lives in mortal sin, as the Council of Trent has declared, and it does not justify a person unless love is added to it. The very opposite, Luther says, is true. It is faith that gives love its real essence, and makes it genuine and good, not vice versa. The papists regard Galatians 5.6 as a valuable proof-text for their doctrine, but they totally misinterpret the text. Commenting on this text, Luther says, The sophists force this text to support their view that we must be justified by our love and good works. For not to say anything of faith which a person has obtained by his own effort, de fide acquisita, they declare that even faith infused into a person by God does not justify unless it is given its proper form by love, because they call love that grace which makes a person acceptable in the sight of God, gratiam gratum facientem, what we, speaking in the words of Paul, would call justifying grace. Moreover, they say that love is obtained by our merit, which God is in justice bound to reward, nostro merito congrui, and so forth. Yet they even maintain that infused faith can exist in a person living in mortal sin. Thus they remove justification entirely from faith, and attribute it to love alone. And they want to establish this doctrine of theirs by what Paul says in this passage when he speaks of faith that worketh by love. Just as if Paul had meant to say, See, faith does not justify, it amounts to nothing, unless work-producing love is added to it, which gives faith its proper form. However, all these strange, horrible ideas have been fabricated by unspiritual men. Could anyone tolerate the doctrine that faith, the gift of God which is poured into men's hearts by the Holy Ghost, can exist alongside of mortal sin? One could tolerate such teaching if they were referring to faith which a person acquires by his own effort, or to historical faith, that opinion which a person, by using his natural reason, forms from a study of historical faith, their teaching would apply correctly to the latter kind of faith, but since they speak of imparted faith, they plainly reveal that they have no true understanding whatever of faith. Besides, they read this passage of Paul through a colored glass, as we say. They pervert the text and twist it, so as to make it favor their fancy. For Paul does not say, faith which justifieth by love, or faith which makes a person acceptable by love, a sense of that kind they have imagined and foisted upon this text by violence. Much less does the text say, Love makes a person acceptable. No, this is what the Apostle says, Faith which worketh by love. He states that works are performed by faith through love, not that man is justified by love. The Papists, in their unchristian error of work righteousness, mistake the scope of Galatians 5.6. That text does not state what faith affects before God, but what it does viewed by itself. It is active through love, after it has obtained for the believer righteousness before God and everlasting salvation. With the papists, this error is fundamental, 
and within the Protestant churches there is also, in most instances, faulty teaching on this point. After declaring that salvation is altogether by grace through faith, many Protestants add, of course, faith must produce also good works. Because they are afraid the above statement might offend people if it were not qualified. But by adding the qualification, they have perverted and upset their whole preaching. For with that qualification, all their preaching about grace and faith is futile and a wasted effort. For what they say with that qualification sounds as if faith were not sufficient for justification, and had to be reinforced by love. When you preach on this subject, this is how you must speak. Of course, a person that has not love, let him understand that he has not faith either, hence he cannot be righteous in God's sight. That is the proper way to speak, not because love justifies a person in God's sight, but because only that is genuine faith, wrought by God through the Holy Spirit, which flows forth in love of God and our fellow men. End of Lecture 21、22nd Evening Lecture, March 13th, 1885. It is an undeniable fact, my friends, that at the present time there is a greater number of believing theologians than when I was young, fifty years ago. In those days, hardly any others than vulgar rationalists occupied not only the ecclesiastical offices created by the government, but also almost all the pulpits. The small number of believing theologians were tolerated, provided they behaved by keeping quiet. made no serious attempt to confess their faith, and above all, did not zealously oppose the forces of unbelief. What a change has taken place since then within the so-called Protestant Church! Vulgar rationalists, who turn the Bible into a code of ethics and declare the specifically Christian doctrines to be oriental myths and fantasies, valuable only as far as moral lessons may be drawn from them, these men have done acting their part and have gone into bankruptcy. Persons laying claim to intelligence nowadays refuse to be classified as vulgar rationalists. True, the so-called Society of Protestants has made an attempt to reintroduce and rehabilitate vulgar rationalism, but without success. Even the spokesman of the Society declares that vulgar rationalism is antiquated. In order to be regarded as a person of brains, it is nowadays absolutely necessary for one to acknowledge that the Christian religion is a religion supernaturally revealed, and the Bible, in a sense, the word of God, namely, in as far as it contains God's word. By what process did these up-to-date believers attain to their faith? Was it by a living knowledge of their misery under sin, or by a keen perception of their damnable condition and their need of redemption? Alas, there is pitifully little evidence that such has been the case. A careful observer can hardly get any other impression than that they arrived at their faith by rationalistic speculation. That is the reason why nearly all of them reject the verbal inspiration of the Bible, and subject all books of the Bible to criticism such as only enemies of the Bible would engage in. Of course they are not conscious of being enemies of the Bible. They have turned the Christian religion into a religious philosophy. Modern theology, as to its essential qualities, is something entirely and absolutely different from the theology of former times. It does not pretend to be a system of faith. It wants to be a system of science. Modern theologians propose that, starting out from the principles of human knowledge, they are able to prove as absolute truth what the common people merely believe. Accordingly, there is not in modern theologians that fear which animated David when he said, My flesh trembleth for fear of thee. Psalm 119-120 Such a reverence in the presence of holy writ is found hardly anywhere. The Bible is nearly everywhere treated like the fables of Aesop. I am telling you the truth when I say this. When you begin later to compare the old with the modern theologians, you will see that I have not exaggerated. Science has been placed on the throne, and theology is made to sit at its feet 
and await the orders of philosophy. Accordingly, as soon as some one has become prominent in a domain of science that had not been cultivated by any one previously, he is promptly created a doctor of theology, as if science or learning were identical with theology. Oh, my dear friends, unless you keep the light of the pure gospel shining in this land of the setting sun, which has been visited last by God, it is not possible that the day of judgment be delayed. Our time is down to the dregs of the cup. The end is at hand. While the world stands, may God help us, at least in this part of it, which was reached last by the gospel voice, to remain true to it. Do not forget, my dear friends, that there is but one way to arrive at true faith. God did not construct two or several ways, one for learned, the other for simple folk. God is not a respecter of persons. If the learned scholar wants to become a believer and be saved, he must come down from his height and sit with poor sinners, just like the cowherd or other simple folk. There is no other way to faith than that which leads through a person's knowledge of his sin and damnable condition, through the inward crushing of his heart in contrition and sorrow. A person that has not come to faith in this way is not a believing Christian, much less a theologian. However, I hope that I shall not be misunderstood when I call the aforementioned matters the only preparation for faith. If this statement is not understood correctly, it may result in an abominable confounding of law and gospel. This reflection leads us to the consideration of Thesis 11. Thesis 11. In the seventh place, the word of God is not rightly divided when there is a disposition to offer the comfort of the gospel only to those who have been made contrite by the law, not from fear of the wrath and punishment of God, but from love of God. This thesis describes chiefly the method of the Roman Church. However, the same method is adopted by all fanatics and all pietists within the so-called Protestant Church. If among these people a person is found who is alarmed over his sin, and is in a state of contrition and sorrow because of them, he is asked to state the source of his contrition, particularly whether he feels sorry for his sins merely because he knows that he is going to perdition, and sees nothing above him but the wrath of God, and nothing beneath him but the abyss of damnation. If he admits that such is his condition, the papists and fanatics tell him that contrition, to be genuine and worthy of the name, must proceed from love of God, and the gospel cannot be proclaimed to him until he has such contrition. This is an appalling error, which can easily be shown to be such. Since the fall, the law, you know, has but a single function, namely, to lead men to the knowledge of their sins. It has no power to renew them. That power is vested solely in the gospel. Only faith worketh by love. We do not become spiritually active by love, by sorrow over our sins. On the contrary, while still ignorant of the fact that God has become our reconciled God and Father, through Christ, we hate Him. An unconverted person who claims that he loves God is stating an untruth, and is guilty of a miserable piece of hypocrisy, though he may not be conscious of it. He sets up a specious claim, because only faith in the gospel regenerates a person. Accordingly, a person cannot love God while he is still without faith. To demand of a poor sinner that he must, from love of God, be alarmed on account of his sins and feel sorry for them, is an abominable perversion of law and gospel. Here is the biblical doctrine. The sinner is to come to Jesus just as he is, even when he has to acknowledge that there is nothing but hatred of God in his heart, and he knows of no refuge to which he may flee for salvation. A genuine preacher of the gospel will show such a person how easy his salvation is, knowing himself a lost and condemned sinner, and unable to find the help that he is seeking, he must come to Jesus with his evil heart and his hatred of God and God's law, and Jesus will receive him as he is. It is his glory that men say of him, Jesus receives sinners. He is not to become a different thing, he is not to become purified, he is not to amend his conduct before coming to Jesus. He who alone is able to make him a better man is Jesus, and Jesus will do it for him if he will only believe. 
The proof for this doctrine from God's word is contained in the most general statement, Romans 3.20. By the law is the knowledge of sin. Here the apostle states the function of the law. It produces not love, but the knowledge of sin. A person can indeed possess that knowledge without love of God. Romans 5.20 we read, The law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. The Greek text reads, Hina pleonase ta peroptama, that is, that sin might be increased. Many sins are slumbering in a person who is still ignorant of the law. Let the law be preached to such a person forcefully, let it strike his conscience with lightning force, and the person will not become better but worse. He begins to rear up against God and say, What, am I to be damned? True, I know that I am an enemy of God, but that is not my fault. I cannot help it. That is the effect of the preaching of the law. It drives men to desperation. Blessed the person who has been brought to this point. He has taken a great step forward on the way to his salvation. Such a person will receive the gospel with joy, while another who has never passed through an experience of this kind yawns when he hears the gospel preached, and says, That is an easy way to get to heaven. Only a poor sinner on the brink of despair realizes what a message of joy the gospel is, and joyfully receives it. Romans 4.15, the apostle writes, The law worketh wrath, Luther, wrath only. It incites men not to love God, but only to hatred of Him. Romans 7, 7 and 8, St. Paul says, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, brought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law sin was dead. We always reach out for what was definitely forbidden. Man is always tempted to act contrary to an injunction or a prohibition. Even filthy Ovid had made this experience when he wrote, Litimur invetitum semper cupumusque negata. To be sure, even a heathen could have an experience of this kind. Ovid was a genius, but a profligate person. Among other things, he turned his thought also upon himself. Galatians 3.21, the Apostle writes, Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. Why this question and the hypothetical clause? The Apostle no doubt means to make the intended negation stronger. Often, when a question is raised concerning something which everybody knows is not so, the intention is to bring about a very strong negation. That is the case in this text. The Apostle means to say, The law certainly cannot save a person. Second Corinthians 3.6 we read, The letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. This precious text is horribly perverted by the evangelical, unierte, church. These people argue, it is wrong to insist on the letter of Scripture. The Spirit, general ideas drawn from the Scripture, is what must be held fast. Luther's action at Marburg, when he wrote the words, Tuto esti to somo mu, and pointed to these words again and again, is regarded as not a Christian action by these people. Indeed, Luther's action was not unionistic, but it was genuinely Christian. The meaning of the Apostle in this text, as further study will show you, is, the law killeth, but the gospel giveth life. These Bible texts are illustrated by beautiful examples recorded in Scripture, which relate exactly the conduct of certain persons before their conversion and after they had become believers. There are not many of these instances recorded, but all of them show that contrition does not flow from love of God. On the first Christian festival of Pentecost, a multitude of people had gathered and heard the Apostle Peter preach. The gist of his remarks was that they were the murderers of the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth, and must tremble when thinking of the judgment. They had listened to Peter's whole address, but when he reached the point where he raised this charge against them, they became alarmed by the Holy Spirit. The record says, They were pricked to the heart. 
they felt as if Peter had run a dagger into their heart. They reasoned, If we have done that, we are all doomed men. What will God say to us when we appear before his judgment seat? He will charge us with the slain of the Messiah. We are not told that they said, Oh, we feel so sorry for having grieved our faithful God. It was not love of God, but fright and terror that made them cry, What shall we do? Nor does the Apostle Peter say to them, My dear people, we shall now have to investigate the quality of your contrition, whether it flows from love of God, or from fear of the punishment due you for your sins, from fear of hell. Not a word of this. When they put their frightened and terrified question, Men and brethren, what shall we do? The Apostle says, Repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. Since these people were already in terror over their sins, the term repentance in this text refers not to what is called the first part of repentance, contrition, but to the second part, faith. We are told that they received baptism immediately. Their metanoia, or change of mind, consisted in this, that they no longer desired to be murderers of Jesus, but wished to believe in him. Accordingly, the apostles received them, and they were numbered with the congregation of those who were saved. The example of the jailer at Philippi, to which I have referred a number of times, also illustrates the point now under discussion. I have to refer to it again and again, because it is one of the most illuminating passages of Scripture. The jailer was a scoundrel, who relished the task of beating the servants of the Lord, casting them into the inner prison, or deepest dungeon, and putting their feet in the stocks which he had not been commanded to do at all. When he imagined that all his prisoners had escaped during the earthquake, he was seized with despair and wanted to commit suicide. Paul cried to him, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. And now the jailer fell, writhing and trembling at the apostles' feet, and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Nothing but his fright and terror moved him to do that. Now Paul does not say to him, First you must become contrite from love of God, but believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. Saul was put through the same experience. He had persecuted the church of God, breathing threatenings and slaughter against all Christians. He was on the way to a place where he wanted to shed the blood of Christians when the Lord himself met him in a vision. He was hurled to the ground and was astonished, stunned, while Jesus said to him, it is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. When the gospel, with its sweet heavenly power, had entered into his heart, this wretched man was plucked out of his distress and misery. And now the Lord prescribed for this sinner, who had been terrified and crushed and then comforted, no other lesson than this, that instead of persecuting him, he was to confess him, after he had received baptism as a seal of the forgiveness of his sins. When you preach... Do not be stingy with the gospel. Bring its consolations to all, even to the greatest sinners. When they are terrified by the wrath of God and hell, they are fully prepared to receive the gospel. True, this goes against our reason. We think it strange that such knaves are to be comforted immediately. We imagine they ought to be made to suffer much greater agony in their conscience. Fanatics adopt that method in dealing with alarmed sinners. But a genuine Bible theologian resolves to preach the gospel and faith in Jesus Christ to a person whom God has prepared for such preaching by his law. There is a passage in Scripture that is frequently misunderstood, namely Second Corinthians 7.10, which reads, For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. Godly sorrow is supposed to mean sorrow of contrition from love of God. This is a mistake. The apostle refers to sorrow which man has not produced himself, but which God has caused in him by his word. The text reads, Kata theon lippe, sorrow in accordance with God, or produced by God. It is another grievous perversion of the Christian doctrine to tell an alarmed sinner that he must first experience contrition and when he asked how he must go about that, to tell him that he must sit down and meditate, and try to draw or elicit repentance from his heart. 
that is what the papists teach but their teaching is sheer hypocrisy there is not in all the world a person who can produce contrition in himself he may labour to bring it forth until he becomes dissolved in tears but it is all a hypocritical sham godly sorrow is required because faith is required god by terrifying us wants to produce this sorrow we must not imagine that contrition is a good work which we do but it is something that god works in us god comes with the hammer of the law and smites our soul a person who wants to make himself sorrowful desires ever to increase his sorrow over sin but a person merged in the right kind of sorrow yearns to be rid of it he is tormented day and night he may frequent saloons and make a futile attempt to drive away his sorrow by drink among his companions he may be a braggart but when he is at home his conscience tells him you are damned if you die to-night you will go to perdition that is godly sorrow produced not by man but by god himself god has no regard for any miserable product of man let me present two testimonies from the apology of the augsburg confession we read moreover our adversaries teach and write many things that are still more inept and confusing they teach that grace may be merited by contrition when they are asked to explain why Saul and Judas, in whom there was quite an awful contrition, did not merit grace, they ought to answer that Judas and Saul lacked the gospel and faith, that Judas did not comfort himself with the gospel and did not believe. For faith constitutes the difference between the contrition of Peter and Judas. But our adversaries give no thought to the gospel and faith, but to the law. They say that Judas did not love God, but was afraid of the punishment. Is not this an uncertain and inept way of teaching repentance? In that real great distress described in the Psalms and Prophets, when will an alarmed conscience know whether it fears God as its God from love, or whether it flees from and hates His wrath and eternal damnation? These people may not have experienced much of these anxieties, because they juggle words and make distinctions according to their dreams. But in the heart, when the test is applied, the matter turns out quite differently, and the conscience cannot be set at rest with paltry syllables and words, as these nice, leisurely, and idle sophists are dreaming. In the papist's view, the reason why Judas perished was because his contrition did not flow from love of God. If it had, he would have acquired merit. Papists are always looking for some merit, either of the de congruo or of the de condigno kind. The adversaries infer that works merit grace, sometimes de congruo, and at other times de condigno, namely when love is added. Again from the Apology. It is impossible to ascertain the motive of a person's contrition. No matter what it is, when we behold someone in terror of hell, we are to comfort him. The love of God will surely be manifest by him later. Papists talk about contrition as a blind man talks about color. They have never experienced the salutary terror on account of their sins. When a poor sinner comes to one of their learned theologians, he asks, What is the quality of this contrition that causes your distress? The poor man may be unable to explain this point properly, and he says that he knows nothing about it, but that he feels terribly distressed. Then the learned doctor may direct him to apply to a surgeon for a cupping. He will feel better when he is rid of his sluggish blood. Good heavens! What great theologians! How can they properly speak of matters of which they have no experience, and which are to them mere subjects of speculation? Again, the Apology says, When we speak de contritione, that is, regarding genuine contrition, we cut out those innumerable questions which they cast up, namely, whether a person's contrition flows from love of God or from fear of punishment. For these are nothing but mere words and a useless babbling of persons who have never experienced the state of mind of a terrified conscience. But we say that contrition is the true terror of conscience. When it begins to feel its sin, and the anger of God against sin, and is sorry for having sinned, and this contrition takes place in this manner when our sins are censured by the word of God. Amidst these terrors, the conscience feels the serious anger of God against sin, 
which is a matter entirely unknown to such idle and carnal men as the sophists and their like. It is then that the conscience first becomes aware what a great disobedience to God sin is. It is then that the terrible anger of God presses down on the conscience, and human nature cannot possibly bear up under it unless it is raised up by the word of God. Thus says St. Paul, By the law I am dead to the law. For the law does nothing but accuse the conscience. It commands people what to do and terrifies them. In this connection the adversaries do not say a word concerning faith. Hence they do not teach one word regarding the gospel, or Christ, but their teaching is entirely from the law. They tell people that with their pain, contrition, sorrow, and anguish they are meriting grace, provided their contrition is from love of God, and provided they love God. Good heavens, what kind of preaching is that to consciences that are in need of comfort? How can we love God when merged in such great distress and unutterable agony? when we feel the great and terrible earnestness and anger of God, which is stronger than any person could express by words. Why, it is nothing else than sheer despair that these preachers and doctors are teaching, when they preach to poor consciences in distress, not the gospel nor any comfort, but only the law. The Lutheran confessions offer to poor sinners this sweet comfort, that when God has given them the grace to be alarmed on account of their sins, they are in a fit condition to approach the throne of grace, where they receive forgiveness, the true remedy for all their ills. They must indeed have contrition, however, not to the end of acquiring some merit by it, but in order that they may gladly accept what Jesus offers them. Even when there is love of God in a person's heart, it will be spoiled by the devil. Under the influence of false teaching, a dying person may be led into despair. He may have contrition, but he feels that it does not flow from love of God, but from his fear of the anger of God and of hell, into which he fears he is about to be hurled. But when instructed in the true doctrine, he knows that he believes in the Lord Jesus and clings to him, and hence the love of God will also enter into his heart. You see, this teaching is no jest. When our Lutheran theologians wrote our confessions, they sat down to their work as true Christians, and did not intend to construct a system of doctrine. They knew in what way a poor sinner is given rest, and the consolation of salvation. In the Apology, Melanchthon has spoken like a simple Christian. What has made this confession all the more precious is that he speaks all that he says from the fullness of Scripture, and his own experience. In 1545, an edition of the Latin writings of Luther was published. In the preface to the first part, Luther relates what was the condition of his heart before he had received the light of the gospel. He makes a personal confession, saying that while he was in bondage to the law, he had read the words of the Apostle Paul that the righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel, and had become terrified by the statement. Having been terrified previously by the law, and reading now that the gospel too, the righteousness of God, is revealed, he was in an awful dilemma. The law had condemned him, and now God sent him the gospel to do the same thing to him. He makes the personal confession, saying that while he was in bondage to the law, he had read the words of the apostle Paul, that the righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel, and had become terrified by that statement. Having been terrified previously by the law, and reading now that in the gospel too the righteousness of God is revealed, he was in an awful dilemma. The law had condemned him, and now God sent him to the gospel to do the same thing to him. In the gospel too, God demanded righteousness of the sinner. We cannot sufficiently thank and praise God for giving Luther, shortly before his departure, leisure to relate some of the inner experiences of his life which were to prepare and fit him for the work of the Reformation. He writes, St. Louis edition 14, 446 and following, I verily had a hearty desire. Indeed, I was yearning to understand the epistle of St. Paul to the Romans. So far, nothing had hindered me except only the single phrase, Justitia Dei, the righteousness of God in verse 17 of the first chapter, where Paul says, The righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel. 
I was very wroth at this term righteousness of God, because my training had been according to the usage and practice of all teachers at that time, and I had been told that I must understand this term after the manner of philosophers as signifying that righteousness by which God is righteous in His essence, does right and works righteousness, and punishes all sinners and unrighteous persons. What is called justitia formalis, seu activa, a sensual or active righteousness. Now my condition was this. Although I was leading the life of a holy and blameless monk, I discovered that in the sight of God I was a great sinner. Moreover, my conscience was troubled and distressed, nor did I venture to reconcile God with my own satisfactions and merits. For this reason I did not at all love this righteous and angry God who punishes sinners, but I hated Him, and was full of secret anger against Him, and that in all seriousness. I am afraid that this was, or may have to be accounted as blasphemy. Frequently I would say, Is God not satisfied with having loaded all manner of misery and affliction, besides the terrors and threatenings of the law, on us poor miserable sinners who are already condemned to everlasting death on account of hereditary sin? Must he increase this misery and heartache still more by the gospel? and by its preaching and its message proclaim his righteousness and serious anger and add to our terror in my confused conscience i was full of indignation nevertheless i continued my meditation on blessed paul endeavouring with a great thirst for knowledge and a hearty desire to ascertain his meaning in the passage i spent days and nights in these musings until by the grace of god I perceived the connection of these words in the passage thus. The righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel, as is written, the just shall live by his faith. From this connection I learned to understand that righteousness of God by which the righteous lives by the gracious gift of God through faith alone, and I perceived this to be the apostle's meaning. By the gospel, that righteousness is revealed which is valid in the sight of god and by which god from grace and pure mercy makes us righteous by faith in latin this righteousness is called justitia passiva and to this righteousness the fact refers which says the just shall live by his faith at this point i immediately felt that i had been entirely born anew and had found a door wide open leading straight into paradise Luther's life as a monk had been irreproachable. He had tormented himself nigh unto death, trying to keep his monastic vows. In spite of all his endeavors, he had become broken-hearted, for the Holy Spirit, by the law, had revealed to him the corruption of his heart. He did not regard this condition of his heart as a trifling matter. It filled him with anxiety and uncertainty. He desired to make full satisfaction for his sins, and to keep not only the Ten Commandments, but also the commandments of the Church, which were not enjoined at all by God. Thus he lived on in papistic blindness. Occasionally he would doubt the validity of all his doings, and ask himself, What does God care whether I am lying on a sack of straw, or on a couch of velvet and satin? Luther confessed that, at the time, God had become hateful to him. Now, ask any modern theologian whether he had loved God prior to his conversion, and he will say, Why, yes, who would not love God? We have always been taught to do that. But that shows their blindness. If we would watch ourselves, we would become aware that our condition, before faith was kindled in our hearts, has been identical with that of Luther. No one who has been smitten by the law will be surprised at Luther's confession. While in terror and distress under the law, Luther read in the epistle of Paul to the Romans that also in the gospel the righteousness of God is revealed. At that time he had no inkling of the sweet consolation contained in that statement. Nowadays every child knows that the text does not refer to that righteousness which God requires of us in the law, but to the righteousness of Christ which God wants to give us and which Luther has well expressed by translating he dikaiu sine tu theu, the righteousness which is valid, or passes muster in the sight of God. By this translation, even the simplest person can understand that the text does not refer to the righteous life which we had lived, 
and according to which we shall be judged, but to the gracious righteousness which Christ acquired for us on the cross. While Luther's natural heart was raving against God, he was but a short step from the brink of despair. He picked up his Bible again and again, and kept staring at Romans one seventeen. He began to think that possibly the text had a different meaning after all. During his persistent musing, reading, and meditating, God helped him to see the light, and what happened to him when he found the meaning of the text he has told us. The same man who had previously hated God and murmured against him now was filled with joy unspeakable. He began to love God with all his heart after hearing the most blessed tidings of joy. Christ, the Son of God, has acquired righteousness for the whole world. Only believe in this righteousness. God grant to all of you, as he did to Luther, to see the gates of paradise wide open to receive you. Then your congregations will get a taste of your own happiness, and you will be kept from falling into dead orthodoxism. In his Vindiciae Sacrae Scripturae, paragraph 79, page 125, Hulesman, commenting on Second Corinthians 7.10, writes, Paul does not say, You have roused sorrow in yourselves from love of God, but you have been given by me a godly sorrow, that is, a sorrow which is in accordance with the will and commandment of God. Accordingly, Paul interprets godly sorrow to signify a sorrow which had been roused in the Corinthians by the power and command of God. On the other hand, the sorrow of the world signifies a sorrow which arises from worldly causes, such as the fear of temporal punishment, the loss of personal honor, an evil conscience, and other causes which produce sorrow over some crime, even in heathens and unregenerate persons. This passage, then, refers to a sorrow in the presence of God on the part of the person who has become alarmed because of his sins. When I am terrified by the thought of my sins, hell, death, and damnation, and perceive that God is angry with me, and that being under his wrath I am damned on account of my sins, that is godly sorrow even though I may be in the same condition in which Luther was before he got the right knowledge of the gospel. Such sorrow comes from God. On the other hand, when a fornicator, a rake, a drunkard, begins to sorrow because he has wasted the beautiful time of his youth and ruined his body, and has become prematurely senile, that is a sorrow of this world. When a vain person is thrown into sorrow over his sins because he has lost somewhat of his prestige, when a thief sorrows over his thieving, because it has also landed him in jail, that is worldly sorrow. However, when a person grieves over his sins because he sees hell before him, where he will be punished for having insulted the most holy God, that is godly sorrow, provided that it has not been produced by imagination through a person's own effort. Genuine godly sorrow can be produced by God alone. May God grant us all such sorrow. End of Lecture 22。Lecture 23 of the Proper Distinction Between Law and Gospel by C. F. W. Walter, translated by W. H. T. Dow. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 23rd Evening Lecture March 20, 1885. Among the various functions and official acts of a servant of the Church, the most important of all, my friends, is preaching. Since there is no substitute for preaching, a minister who accomplishes little or nothing by preaching will accomplish little or nothing by anything else that he may do. Here is where the Papists differ with us. They call their ministers priests and assert that the most important of all functions of a priest is to baptize, hear confession, and pronounce absolution, administer communion, and above all, to offer to God the sacrifice of the Mass. Setting aside the sacrifice of the Mass, which is the greatest abomination that has ever been practiced in the Christian Church, we are forced to say that all baptizing, pronouncing absolution, and administering of communion is useless if these matters have not been previously made the subjects of preaching to the people. For they are not the works of men, but of God himself, who has connected with them a promise to be apprehended by faith. Accordingly, 
all these acts do not profit, but are rather harmful in the absence of faith. If these operations of God are to be of any use, it is absolutely necessary that a thorough instruction concerning them be first given from the word of God by preaching. When Christ was about to return to the glory which he had with the Father before the foundation of the world, he gave his disciples, together with their commission, this instruction. Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. Or, as Matthew puts it, Go ye, and teach all nations. Then he adds, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Not satisfied with having said this, he concluded his instruction with these words, Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Behold, here the Alpha and Omega of the Apostolic Office, or the ministry of the Church, is its preaching and teaching. This function, however, is not only the most important, but also the most difficult function assigned to a minister of the Church. There are ministers who imagine that preaching is easy to them, and the longer they are in the ministry, the easier preaching becomes to them. For they reason that if they are only careful to preach nothing but the pure word of God, without any admixture of heresy, that must be sufficient. Such preachers are laboring under a great, an awful, a very pernicious error. A mere pious talk without aim and logical order is not real preaching. Genuine preaching is inspired only by the Holy Ghost through His Word. Accordingly, a real sermon is produced only after all the spiritual and intellectual energy of a truly believing preacher has been exerted to the utmost, after fervent prayer, after all earthly cares have been chased from the mind, and after the preacher has been freed from all vain desires. That is a difficult task. Administering baptism properly is easy. Anybody can do it. Likewise, pronouncing absolution correctly is quite easy. Even a boy can do it. Administering Holy Communion is also very easy. Any intelligent Christian can do it. But to preach properly is difficult. For this reason, a student of theology ought to make proper preaching his highest aim. For if he is unable to preach, he does not belong in the ministry. In our Orthodox Church, a servant of God is a minister of Jesus Christ, and his worth does not lie in a certain undefined quality that has been imputed to him at his ordination or consecration, in something that other people have not, and which for that reason makes him such a sacrosanct and precious person. By no means. The worth of a true minister of the Church lies exclusively in his ability to preach properly. If he has not this ability, the pulpit is not the place for him. For the pulpit is for preaching. Preaching is the central element of every divine service. What is to be effected by preaching? Bear in mind that the preacher is to arouse secure souls from their sleep and sin. Next, to lead those who have been aroused to faith. Next, to give believers assurance of their state of grace and salvation. Next, to lead those who have become assured of this to sanctification of their lives. And lastly, to confirm the sanctified and to keep them in their holy and blessed state unto the end. What a task! A preeminent point that we must not forget is this. To achieve this task it is especially necessary to divide the truth, as the Apostle says, or properly to divide the law and the gospel from each other. When a person does not understand how to do this, and always mingles either doctrine into the other, his preaching is utterly futile, in vain. More than this, a preacher of this kind does harm, and leads the souls of men astray. He leads them to a false faith, a false hope, a false contrition, makes them mere hypocrites, and frequently hurls them into despair. To divide law and gospel properly is a very, very difficult task. As Luther says, all preachers cannot but remain mere apprentices in this art until death. Nevertheless, a young theologian must be able to recite at least the first lesson in this curriculum. He must know the goal that he is to reach, and he must have made a start in reaching that goal. In our previous evening lectures, we learned something about the difficulty of dividing law and gospel. Let us increase the conviction which we have already attained, 
by considering another instance of the commingling of these two doctrines. Thesis 12. In the eighth place, the word of God is not rightly divided, when the preacher represents contrition alongside of faith as a cause of the forgiveness of sins. There is no question but that contrition is necessary if a person wishes to obtain forgiveness of his sins. At his first public exercise of the preaching function, our Lord cried, Repent and believe the gospel. He names repentance first. Whenever this term is placed in opposition to faith, it signifies nothing else than contrition. When Christ gathered the holy apostles about him for the last time, at the moment when he was about to send to heaven, and to withdraw his visible presence from the church, he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ, to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name. Luke 24, 46-47 Why is repentance required as well as faith? Our Lord gives the reason in these words. They that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Matthew nine twelve through 13 With these words the Lord testifies that the reason why contrition is absolutely necessary is that without it no one is fit to be made a believer. He is surfeited and spurns the invitation to the heavenly marriage feast. As far back as Solomon we find this proverb, The full soul loatheth and honeycomb. Proverbs 27, 7. Where there is no spiritual hunger and thirst, the Lord Jesus is not received. As long as a person has not been reduced to the state of a poor, lost, and condemned sinner, he has no serious interest in the Savior of sinners. However, while bearing this fact in mind, you must not forget that contrition is not a cause of the forgiveness of sins. Contrition is not necessary on account of the forgiveness of sin, but on account of faith which apprehends the forgiveness of sin. Here are the reasons why we say that the doctrine of contrition is a cause of the forgiveness of sins, is a commingling of law and gospel. 1. Contrition is an effect solely of the law. To regard contrition as a cause of the forgiveness of sins is equivalent to turning the law into a message of grace and the gospel into law perversion, which overthrows the entire Christian religion. 2. Contrition is not even a good work. For the contrition which precedes faith is nothing but suffering on a part of man. It consists of anguish, pain, torment, a feeling of being crushed, all of which God has wrought in man with the hammer of the law. It is not an anguish which a person has produced in himself, for he would gladly be rid of it, but cannot, because God has come down on him with the law, and he sees no way or escape from the ordeal. If a person sits down to meditate with a view to producing contrition in himself, he will never gain his object that way. He cannot produce contrition. Those who think they can are miserable hypocrites. They seek to persuade themselves that they have contrition, but it is not so. Genuine repentance is produced by God only, when the law is preached in all sternness and man does not willfully resist its influence. It is not likely that one who calls himself a Lutheran preacher will ever say outright that contrition is a cause of the forgiveness of sins. Only papists will say that, never a Protestant preacher who has some conception of the pure doctrine. Still, it not infrequently happens that preachers who claim to be true Lutherans mingle law and gospel by the way in which they describe contrition. In two ways they speak of contrition as if it were a cause of the forgiveness of sins either by saying too little or by saying too much about contrition. Owing to their lack of experience, many preachers are afraid that they might lead people to despair. They do preach, as they should, that contrition must precede faith, but they fear that unless they add some saving clause to that statement, one or the other member of their congregation may become despondent. For that reason they qualify their statement by saying that the pain one feels in contrition need not be very great, and that a person will be received by God if he only desires to be contrite. A comforting qualification of this kind really presents contrition as the cause of the forgiveness of sins, which is a false comfort. 
What the preacher ought to say is this. Listen. When you have come to this point where you are hungering and thirsting for the grace of God, you have the contrition which you need. God does not require contrition as a means by which you are to atone for your sins, but only to the end that you may be roused from your security and ask, What must I do to be saved? Accordingly, Luther says that when he had for the first time grasped the meaning of the term repentance, penitentia, no word seemed sweeter to him than that because he perceived that its meaning was not that he must do penance for his sins, but that simply he must be alarmed on account of his sins and desire the mercy of God. The term repentance was to him the very gospel, because he knew that the moment he had been brought by God to the point where he acknowledged himself to be a poor and lost sinner, he was a proper subject for the attention of Jesus, and could go to him with the assurance that he would receive him as he was, with all his sins and anguish and misery. A person must not inquire whether his contrition is sufficient for admitting him to Jesus. His very question about his fitness shows that he may come to Jesus. If one has desire to come to Jesus, he has true contrition, even if he does not feel it. It is the same as when a person begins to believe. I know from my personal experience that a person can have contrition without being aware of it. For years I had been genuinely contrite and on the brink of despair. I did not have the sweet consciousness that my heart was dissolved in sorrow for having grievously offended my Father in heaven, but I had the lively feeling that I was a lost sinner. At that time I applied to a person who was more experienced in these matters than I was, and in a few minutes he made me see the light. The statement, then, that God is satisfied with a person's mere desire to have contrition is evidence of a mingling of law and gospel. For such a statement represents contrition as a merit on account of which God is gracious to a sinner and forgives him his sins. The same mistake is made when a pastor is readily satisfied with a slight sign of contrition in his parishioners. In wicked men who have lived a long time in sin and shame, the conscience may suddenly become aroused and charge them, for instance, with having perjured themselves. They are seized with palpitating fear because of the consequences. Or their conscience may reprove them with having soiled their hands with the blood of murder. However, these people are not alarmed because they regard themselves as poor sinners. But it is one particular sin that frightens them. Outside of that, they imagine they are pretty good at heart. I witnessed an instance of this kind in Germany. A wicked person had committed perjury. He would not admit it but began to be agitated every time someone spoke to him about it. During a call which I made on him, he had to take hold of the table to keep down his trembling, but he could not be induced to confess his sin. The result was that I could not preach the gospel to him. There are many abandoned villains of this kind, who have already had their sentence of doom served on them. They may tell the pastor that they admit being at fault in this, that, or the other thing in which they slipped unavoidably but they appeal to the fact that they are good at heart. If a pastor is satisfied with a partial contrition of this sort, he treats contrition as a merit, while it is nothing else than the bursting open of an ulcer. When a healing salve is spread upon an open wound that still contains pus, the pus will eat deeper into the person and the wound will not heal. The healing balm in spiritual therapy is the gospel. Others, again, probably say to their hearers that contrition is necessary, as Scripture testifies on every page, and that their own reason must tell them that God cannot forgive their sin which they treat so lightly. Then they proceed to describe to them what must be the quality of their contrition from texts like Psalm 38, 6 through 8. I am troubled. I am bowed down greatly. I go mourning all the day long, for my loans are filled with a loathsome disease and there is no soundness in my flesh. I am feeble and sore broken. I have roared by reason of the disquietness of my heart. Or Psalm 6, 7 and 8. I am weary with groaning. All the night make I my bed to swim. I water my couch with tears. Mine eye is consumed with grief. It, it waxeth old because of all mine enemies. Legalistic pastors will ask their client whether he can say all these things concerning himself whether he has ever gone 
bowed down in mourning for a whole day, whether there has been a time when his loins were dried up, whether he can say that there was no sound part in his whole body, whether he has wailed because of the unrest of his heart, whether he has watered his couch with his tears all night long, whether his friends have noticed that he looked as if he had grown fourteen years older in two weeks, and so forth. Unless he can point to these criteria of what they regard as genuine contrition, they tell him not to imagine that he has been truly contrite. This method is utterly wrong. True, the texts cited describe David's repentance, but where is there a text that prescribes the same degree of contrition for everyone? There is no such text. On the contrary, we find that when the hearts of Peter's hearers on the first Pentecost were pricked, and they were moved to cry, What shall we do? The mercy of God was preached to them immediately. David's own case serves as an illustration. He had lived in impenitence for an entire year when Nathan came to hold his awful sin up to him. With a contrite heart, David cried, I have sinned against the Lord. That was all. The prophet Nathan noticed at once that David had been struck down and was crushed. Accordingly he said to him, The Lord also hath put away thy sin. Second Samuel 12.13 The same thing we read about the jailer at Philippi. Only a few minutes before he had been so terribly agitated that he was about to take his own life. When he fell down before the apostles and cried, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? He was not told that he must produce contrition in himself, and that a profound, a serious one. He was not reminded of the penitential acts of David, but he was promptly told, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. The apostles saw plainly that the man was crushed and craved mercy, and they regarded that as sufficient. When a person has been made to hunger and thirst for mercy, Contrition has done its full work in him. The pietists claim that faith must be preceded by a long time of penitence. Yea, they have warned people not to believe too soon, telling them that they must allow the Holy Spirit to work them over thoroughly. A person, they said, cannot be converted in two weeks. Sometimes it takes many months and years, during which God prepares him for conversion. That is an awful doctrine. These preachers do not consider what a tremendous responsibility they assume when they warn a person against believing prematurely. What will become of such a one if he dies before he is ready to believe? I know the awful effect of this teaching from experience. A pietistic candidate of theology had instructed me in the same manner which I have described. I did everything to become truly penitent and finally fell into despair. When I came to him... To tell him my condition, he said, Now it is time for you to believe. But I did not credit his advice. I thought he was deceiving me, because his last direction was out of keeping with the marks of penitence which he had described to me previously. Accordingly, I said to him, If you knew my condition, you would not comfort me. What I want is rules for my further conduct. He gave them, too, but it was useless. If we may assume in all reasonableness that a person has been pried loose from his self-righteousness and wants to be saved by grace alone, we should for God's sake confidently preach the gospel to him. It will not be too soon. A person cannot possibly come to Jesus too soon. The trouble is that people frequently do not really go to Jesus. They call themselves poor sinners, but are not. They want to bring before God some merit of their own. It is sheer hypocrisy when they say they are going to Jesus, for, as a matter of fact, they do not come to him as poor beggars with all their sins. A person whom God has granted grace to see himself crushed and broken, without any comfort anywhere, and looking about him anxiously for consolation, such a one is truly contrite. He must not be warned against going to Jesus, but to him the gospel must be preached. He must be told not only that he may, but that he should boldly come to Jesus, and not imagine that he is coming too soon. If such a person were to die after I had told him that he cannot yet come to Jesus, God would demand the soul of that sinner from me. 
one of the principal reasons why many at this point mingle law and gospel, is that they fail to distinguish the daily repentance of Christians from the repentance which precedes faith. Daily repentance is described in Psalm 51. David calls it a sacrifice which he brings before God and with which God is pleased. He does not speak of repentance which precedes faith, but that which follows it. The great majority of sincere Christians who have the pure doctrine have a keener experience of repentance after faith than of repentance prior to faith. For having good preachers, they have been led to Christ in no roundabout way. While they are with Christ, their former self-righteousness may make its appearance again, spite of the fact that it has been shattered for them many a time. God must smite these poor Christians again and again to keep them humble. David's example may serve to illustrate this point. He had come to faith in a moment. What misery did he have to pass through later? A prophet had spoken to him the word of the Lord, but to his dying day his heart was burdened with anguish, distress, and misery. God had ceased to prosper his undertakings. He met with one misfortune after the other, until God released him by death. But all that time, David had contrition together with faith. That is, indeed, a sacrifice with which God is pleased. Contrition of this kind is not a mere effect of the law produced by the law alone, but it is at the same time an operation of the gospel. By the gospel, the love of God enters a person's heart, and when contrition proceeds from love of God, it is indeed a truly sweet sorrow, acceptable to God. God is pleased with it, for we cannot accord him greater honor than by casting ourselves in the dust before him, and confessing, Thou art righteous, O Lord, but I am a poor sinner. Have mercy upon me for the sake of Jesus Christ. Let me submit a testimony from the small called articles. Part 3, Article 3. It is a precious passage, one of the gems in our confessions. For the true doctrine of confession is not found in any of the sects, but only in our Lutheran Church, and it is laid down in this passage. Luther, you know, wrote the small called articles himself. We bless him even in his grave for having bequeathed to us this heritage. He says, The office of the law the New Testament retains and urges, as St. Paul, Romans 1.18, does, saying, The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Again, Chapter 3, verse 19. All the world is guilty before God. No man is righteous before him. And Christ says, John 16, 8, The Holy Ghost will reprove the world of sin. This, then, is the thunderbolt of God by which he hurls to the ground both manifest sinners and false saints, and suffers no one to be in the right, but drives them all together to terror and despair. This is the hammer, as Jeremiah says, 23.29, Is not my word like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces? This is not activa contritio, or manufactured repentance, but passiva contritio, true sorrow of heart, suffering and sensation of death. Manufactured repentance is nothing else than acting as though you were penitent. This, then, is what it means to begin true repentance, and here man must hear such a sentence as this, You are all of no account, whether you be manifest sinners or saints in your own opinion. You all must become different and do otherwise than you are now doing, no matter whether you are as great, wise, powerful, and holy as you may. Here no one is godly, and so forth. But to this office the New Testament immediately adds the consolatory promise of grace through the gospel, which must be believed, as Christ declares, Mark 1.15, Repent ye and believe the gospel, that is, become different, and do otherwise, and believe my promise. And John, preceding him, is called a preacher of repentance, however, for the remission of sins, that is, John was to accuse and convict them of being sinners, that they might know that they were before God, and might acknowledge that they were lost men, and might thus be prepared for the Lord to receive grace, and to expect and accept from Him the remission of sins. 
Thus also Christ himself says, Luke 24, 47, Repentance and remission of sins must be preached in my name among all nations. But whenever the law alone, without the Gospels being added, exercises this its office, there is nothing else than death and hell, and man must despair. Like Saul and Judas, as St. Paul, Romans 7.10 says, Through sin the law killeth. On the other hand, the gospel brings consolation and remission, not only in one way, but through the word and sacraments and the like, as we shall hear afterwards, in order that there is thus with the Lord plenteous redemption, as Psalm 130, verse 7 says, against the dreadful captivity of sin. However, we must now contrast the false repentance of the sophists with true repentance, in order that both may be the better understood. It was impossible that they should teach correctly concerning repentance, since they did not know the real sins. For as has been shown above, they do not believe aright concerning original sin, but say that the natural powers of man have remained unimpaired and incorrupt, that reason can teach aright, and the will can, in accordance therewith, do aright, that God certainly bestows his grace when a man does as much as is in him, according to his free will. It had to follow thence that they did penitence only for actual sins, such as wicked thoughts, to which a person yields. For according to them, wicked emotions, lust, and improper dispositions are not sins. And for wicked words and wicked deeds, which free will could readily have omitted. And of such repentance they fixed three parts, contrition, confession, and satisfaction, with this magnificent consolation and promise added, If man truly repent, confess, render satisfaction, he thereby would have merited forgiveness, and paid for his sins before God. Thus, in repentance, they instruct men to repose confidence in their own works. Hence the expression originated, which was employed in the pulpit when public absolution was announced to the people, Prolong, O God, my life, until I shall make satisfaction for my sins and amend my life. There was here no mention of Christ nor faith, but men hoped by their own works to overcome and blot out sins before God. And with this intention we became priests and monks, that we might array ourselves against sin. As to contrition, this is the way it was done. Since no one could remember all his sins, especially as committed through an entire year, they inserted this provision, namely, that if an sin should be remembered late, this also must be repented of and confessed and so forth. Some went to communion only once a year. They found out that they could not enumerate every sin which they had committed every day of the year. The priest would tell them that they must confess their unconfessed sins whenever they remembered them, if this absolution was to be of benefit to them. Meanwhile they were commended to the grace of God. This meant that their absolution actually was not yet in force. It would be in force whenever they made up what they were still in arrears regarding their confession. To be commended to the grace of God meant, for instance, that if the person were to die the next day, it would not be probable that he had gone to hell, but it could not be stated definitely whether he had gone to hell or into purgatory. Moreover, since no one could know how great the contrition ought to be in order to be sufficient before God, they gave this consolation. He who could not have contrition at least ought to have attrition, which I might call half a contrition, or the beginning of contrition. For they have themselves understood neither of these terms, nor do they understand them now as little as I. Such attrition was reckoned as contrition when a person came to confession. Luther means to say, what they meant by attrition I do not know, but with them it was a sufficient contrition. And when it happened that any one said that he could not have contrition, nor lament his sins, as might have occurred in illicit love or the desire for revenge and so forth, they asked whether he did not wish or desire to have contrition. When one would reply yes, for who save the devil himself would say no to such a question, they accepted this as contrition, and forgave him his sins on account of this good work of his. Here they cited the example of St. Bernard, and so forth. 
ask a Roman Catholic priest, or any true Catholic, if he is sincere, he will admit that this practice still prevails in the Roman Church. That persons admit in the confessional they would like to have contrition, but when they think of their fornication they feel that they would like to continue that. Likewise, they would like to inflict harm on their enemy. The papistic religion surely is a religion to make one shudder when its true inwardness is understood. Here we see how blind reason in matters pertaining to God gropes about, and according to its own imagination seeks consolation in its own works, and cannot think of Christ in faith. But if it be viewed in the light, this contrition is a manufactured and fictitious thought, derived from man's own powers, without faith and without knowledge of Christ. And in it the poor sinner, when he reflected upon his own lust and desire for revenge, would sometimes have laughed rather than wept, except such as either had been truly struck by the law, or had been vainly vexed by the devil with a sorrowful spirit. Otherwise such contrition was certainly mere hypocrisy, and did not mortify the lust for sin. For they had to grieve, while they would rather have continued to sin, if it had been free to them. The decrees of the Council of Trent prove that Luther has correctly depicted the papacy. When he wrote these words, he undoubtedly remembered his own life among the papists. When engaged in this penitential exercise, he certainly did not feel like laughing. He took it so seriously, and he was filled with dread to such an extent, that he sometimes swooned away in sheer terror during these penances. You know that at one time he locked himself into his cell for several days in order to do penance. When his convent brethren forced the door open, they found him unconscious. So great had been the anguish of his soul. They roused him with music. This is one reason why Luther esteemed music so highly. He had felt the powerful effect which music has on the minds of men. End of Lecture 23、Lecture 24 of the proper distinction between law and gospel by c f w walther translated by w h t dow this librivox recording is in the public domain twenty-fourth evening lecture april tenth eighteen eighty five about one hundred twenty years ago rationalism had become dominant in the so-called protestant church of germany it was at the time of the deepest ignominy and humiliation that the nation had ever passed through when defection from the gospel had become complete. The shallowest minds, the most brainless men, without any considerable learning, were regarded as great lights and far ahead of their age. For theologians to achieve some renown, all that was necessary was sufficient boldness, or rather audacity, to declare the mysterious doctrines of Christianity errors of former dark ages, which had been without enlightenment, and to treat the doctrine of God, virtue, and immortality as the real kernel of the Christian religion. During this awful time, matters finally came to such a pass that rationalistic preachers, to counteract the idea that they were superfluous in this world, and to prove their usefulness, would treat from the pulpits subjects like these, intelligent agriculture, profitableness of potato raising, tree planting, a necessity, importance of genuine sanitation, etc. Rationalistic books of sermons, in which subjects of this description are treated with grand pathos, will show you that I am not slandering the rationalists of that age. Some rationalists were ashamed of these typical products of the school of rationalism. In 1772 a book was published which bore the title Of the Usefulness of the Ministry, written for the consolation of my colleagues. The author was Joachim Spalding, a writer of some renown in his day. In his book, he states that subjects like those that I mentioned are indeed not proper subjects for pulpit efforts. He submits his own opinion to this effect. If sermons are to be useful, the preacher must never speak of the doctrines of the faith, first because they only serve to confuse people's minds. But he must present exclusively practical ethical lessons. It is not surprising, then, 
that in those days many souls whose hearts were agitated by the question, What must I do to be saved? quit our devastated church, and either sought refuge with the sect of the Moravians, or even turned to the spurious church of Rome. Praise and thanks be to God that those awful times are past. Let us hope forever. After the successful termination of the so-called wars of deliverance from that monster Napoleon, something like the breath of a new spiritual spring passed over Germany. Multitudes experienced the truly marvellous quickening from the deadly sleep in rationalistic unbelief, and among them were not a few ministers. Since then many preachers began to discard the vapid pagan morality of rationalism, and to preach Christ and faith in Him as the only way to salvation hereafter, and to true peace of heart in the present life. However, it is an undeniable fact that even well-intentioned preachers are mingling law and gospel, and thus inflict horrible injury on their hearers. May God, by His grace, preserve you from this danger when you come into your future congregation, with which you are one day to appear before the throne of God to give an account whether you have been a faithful watchman over the souls entrusted to you, and have broken to them the bread of life, or whether you have given them unwholesome, noxious food, which caused their souls to sicken or even to die. May the study of our thirteenth thesis help in equipping you for your future work. Thesis 13. In the ninth place, the word of God is not rightly divided. When one makes an appeal to believe, or at least help towards that end, instead of preaching faith into a person's heart by laying the gospel promises before him, this thesis does not score as an error the demand on the part of the pastor, be it ever so urgent, that his hearers believe the gospel. That demand has been made by all the prophets, all the apostles, yea, by the Lord Jesus himself. When demanding faith, we do not lay down a demand of the law, but issue the sweetest invitation, practically saying to our hearers, Come, for all things are now ready. Luke 14.17 when I invite a half-starved person to sit down to a well-furnished board, and to help himself to anything he likes, I do not expect him to tell me that he will take no orders from me. Even so, the demand to believe is to be understood not as an order of the law, but as an invitation of the gospel. The error against which this thesis is directed is this, that man can produce faith in himself. Such a demand would be an order of the law, and turn faith into a work of man. That would be plainly mingling law and gospel. A preacher must be able to preach a sermon on faith without ever using the term faith. It is not important that he din the word faith into the ears of his audience, but it is necessary for him to frame his address so as to arouse in every poor sinner the desire to lay the burden of his sins at the feet of Jesus Christ, and say to him, Thou art mine, and I am thine. Here is where Luther reveals his true greatness. He rarely appeals to his hearers to believe, but he preaches concerning the work of Christ, salvation by grace, and the riches of God's mercy in Jesus Christ, in such a manner that the hearers get the impression that all they have to do is to take what is being offered them and find a resting place in the lap of divine grace. That is the great act which you must seek to learn, to make your hearers reason that if what you preach is true, they are blessed men. All their anguish and unrest has been useless. They have been redeemed perfectly, reconciled with God, and are numbered with the saved, and those on whom God has made his gracious countenance to shine. The moment a person thinks these thoughts, he attains to faith. Suppose you are picturing to a horde of Indians, the Lord Jesus telling them that he is the Son of God who came down from heaven to redeem men from their sins, by taking the wrath of God upon himself, overcoming death, devil, and hell in their stead, and opening heaven to all men, and that every man can now be saved by merely accepting what our Lord Jesus Christ has brought to us. Suppose that you were suddenly struck down by the deadly bullet of a hostile Indian lying in ambush. It is possible that dying you would leave behind you a small congregation of Indians, though you may not even once have pronounced the word faith to them. For every one in that audience who did not wantonly and willfully resist divine grace would have to reason that he too has been redeemed. 
On the other hand, you may spend a lot of time telling men that they must believe if they wish to be saved, and your hearers may get the impression that something is required of them which they must do. They will begin to worry whether you will be able to do it, and when they have tried to do it, whether it is exactly the thing that is required of them. And thus you may have preached a great deal about faith without delivering a real sermon on faith. Any one who has come to understand that it is up to him to accept what is offered him, and actually accepts it, has faith. To be saved by faith means to acquiesce to God's plan of salvation by simply accepting it. I do not mean to say that you must not preach about faith. Our time particularly lacks a proper understanding of this matter. The best preachers imagine they have accomplished a great deal when they have rammed into the hearers the axiom, Faith alone saves. But by their preaching they have merely made their hearers sigh, Oh, that I had faith! Faith must be something very difficult, for I have not obtained it. These unfortunate hearers will go home from church with a sad heart. The word faith is echoing in their ears, but gives them no comfort. Even Luther complained that many in his day were preaching about faith without showing their hearers what faith really signifies and how to attain it. A preacher of this sort may labor for years and preach to a dead congregation. That explains why people talk in uncertain strains about their salvation. You can tell that they are driven to and fro with doubts and become awfully frightened and distressed when they are told that they are at death's door. Whose fault is it? The preacher's, because he preached wrong about faith. To say that faith is required for salvation is not saying that man can produce faith himself. Scripture requires of man everything. Every commandment is a demand crying, Do this and thou shalt live. Scripture demands that we purify our hearts. James 4, 8. We are told, Awake, thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. Ephesians 5.14. The mere issuing of such demands does not prove that man can comply with them. An old and true maxim runs thus, A debito ad possa non valet consequentia. No valid conclusion can be drawn from an obligation to the ability to meet it. When a creditor demands payment, that does not prove that the debtor can pay. In ordinary daily life, a creditor, knowing his debtor's insolvency, may demand payment of a debt merely because he has observed that the debtor is a shiftless person, and, moreover, full of vanity and conceit. The creditor's object in making the demand is to get the debtor to quit his proud demeanor and to humble him. God deals with man the same way. By serving notice on me that I owe him obedience to all his commandments, God leads me to realize that even though I put forth my utmost endeavor, I cannot meet my obligations. Having humbled me, he then approaches me with his gospel. This humbling of the natural heart is what is lacking in modern preaching. When a person says to a preacher, Oh, but I cannot believe, he is told, Oh, yes, you can. You must only have the earnest desire to believe. You can get rid of your sins. All you need to do is to strive against them. That is an abominable way of speech. Alas, the synergists have put poison in the gospel, denied the Lord Christ, and made his grace to be of none effect. Let me submit a few statements which reveal the synergism of Melanchthon. Modern theologians ought to be interested in these statements. Some who know them declare these very statements the good part in Melanchthon's teaching. Orthodox Lutherans, however, decline to accept them. Leonard Hutter, the well-known Orthodox theologian, wrote a book entitled Concordia Concourse. It is a history of the formula of concord, showing what occasioned the writing of each article in this confession of our church. From it we see, among other things, that Melanchthon's teaching was the cause why Article Two was inserted in the formula of concord. As evidence, Hutter cites false statements that are found in Melanchthon's writings. I am presenting these statements in order to show that it is not only we Missourians who, with our rigorous minds, are scenting synergism everywhere. Melanchthon taught, 1. There is and must be a reason in men why some are predestinated unto salvation 
while others are reprobated and damned. This statement Hutter pronounces synergistic. Compare with this statement the publications of our opponents in the predestinarian controversy, and you will find that they are saying the same thing as Melanchthon, thereby proving that they are crass synergists, for such Melanchthon was. The wrong part in Melanchthon's statement is not the assertion that there must be a cause in man why he is reprobated and damned, but that there must be a cause in some men why they are predestinated unto salvation. There is no such cause in any person. All the saints in heaven will proclaim with heartfelt thanks that they have contributed nothing towards bringing themselves into heaven, that they have not been a cause of their own salvation, that there was sufficient cause in them why they should be in hell, but none why they should be in heaven. Again, Melanchthon says, 2. Since the promises of grace are universal, and there cannot be contradictory wills in God, there must necessarily be some cause in us that accounts for the salvation of some, and of the reprobation of others. In other words, there must be in each a different kind of action. The different kind of action is not the cause why any person finds himself in heaven. True, grace is universal. The reason why some are reprobated is that they willfully resist grace. Here reason enters in with the claim that, accordingly, there must be a cause in others why they are saved, and this must be because they did not resist grace. But we are at this point confronted with an inscrutable mystery and any one who is unwilling to acknowledge this mystery is abandoning the Christian religion, the central teaching of which is that God has revealed to man a way of salvation which no man's reason could have discovered, nor is able to comprehend. When this plan of God for our salvation is presented to us, we are forced to exclaim with the Apostle Paul, O oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out! For who hath known the mind of the Lord? Or who hath been his counsellor? Or who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again? For of him, and through him, and to him are all things. To whom be glory for ever. Romans 11, 33-36 Again, Melanchthon says, 3. The cause lies in men, why some give their assent to the promises of grace, while others do not. This is crass synergism. For Melanchthon refers to a real cause, to what is termed a causating or impelling cause, causa causans. How can his assertion stand over against the truth that we are all by nature dead in sins, and that we become new creatures in regeneration? Lastly, Melanchthon states, 4. Three causes concur in a person's conversion. The Word of God, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father and the Son send to quicken our hearts, and the will of man, which gives assent to the Word of God and does not resist. Man's faith comes under the same ruling as his contrition. I may sit down in a corner and indulge in melancholy thoughts in order to coax contrition out of myself, but I fail. If I am sincere, I am forced to admit my inability. While I imagine that my heart has been softened, and I am repenting of my sin, suddenly I feel in me a craving for the very sin of which I have repented. If genuine contrition is to be produced in me, the thunders of the law must roll over my head, and the lightnings of Sinai must strike my heart. The same holds good with regard to faith. I cannot produce it myself. Let me submit one more citation, which Hutter has not quoted, but which is cognate to our subject. It is taken from Melanchthon's Lotzi, Chapters in Theology, of the year 1552. On page 101, Melanchthon writes, You say you are unable to obey the voice of the gospel, to listen to the Son of God, and to accept him as your mediator? This question Melanchthon answers, Of course you can. An awful answer this. When a parishioner comes to you complaining of his inability to believe, you must tell him that you are not surprised at his statement, for no man can. He would be a marvel if he could. And you must instruct him to do nothing but listen to the word of God, 
and God will give him faith. Furthermore, you may admonish him not to resist the divine grace, and not to extinguish the sparks which are beginning to glow in his heart. But your telling him these things does not give him the strength he needs. When the gospel enters his heart, like a blessed water of life from heaven, faith is kindled there. It is at first feeble, like a newborn babe, which sees, hears, tastes, moves, has a certain amount of strength, and can eat and drink. Not until this has taken place may you urge the person to cooperate with divine grace. We do not by any means reject cooperation on the part of man after his regeneration. We rather urge it upon him, lest he die again, and incur the danger of being lost forever. Melanchthon continues, Raise yourself up by the means of the gospel. Ask God to help you, and to let the Holy Spirit make the consolations of the gospel effective in you. You must understand that the grace of God proposes to convert us in this manner, namely, that having been quickened by his promise, we wrestle with ourselves, call upon him, and fight against our unbelief and other evil inclinations. Again, he says, free will in man is the ability to prepare oneself for grace, facultus se applicandi ad gratium. This is the notorious statement which is usually cited to prove that Melanchthon was a genuine synergist. The foregoing awful statements prove it indeed. Lastly, Melanchthon says, What I mean is this. Man hears the promise, makes an attempt to give his assent to it, and puts sins against his conscience aside. This is wrong. Before a person is able to put aside sins against his conscience, he must be converted. End of Lecture 24Lecture 25 of the Proper Distinction Between Law and Gospel by C. F. W. Walther Translated by W. H. T. Dow This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Twenty-fifth evening lecture, April 24th, 1885 Manifold are the difficult and arduous tasks of a minister of Jesus Christ. But the most difficult and arduous of all, beyond question, is the task of proclaiming the pure doctrine of the gospel of Christ, and at the same time exposing, refuting, and rejecting teachings that are contrary to the gospel. The minister who does this will discover by practical experience the truth of the old saying, Veritas odium parit, telling the truth makes enemies. If faithful Athanasius in his day had been content to proclaim his doctrine that Jesus Christ is true God, begotten of the Father in eternity, and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, if he had not at the same time vigorously attacked Arius and the Arians who denied this doctrine, he would undoubtedly have finished his life in honor and pleasant peace, for he was a highly gifted man. Had Luther followed the example of Staupitz, of quietly teaching the pure gospel to his brother monks, without at the same time attacking the abominations of the papacy with great earnestness, not a finger would have been raised against him. For even before Luther's day there had been monks who had come to understand the gospel and made no secret of their knowledge. But they did not come out in public to fight against the errors of the papacy. Accordingly, they were allowed to live in peace and quiet, as long as they held to the cardinal point in the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church, the Pope. Worldly men and all false Christians cannot but attack those who teach a faith and doctrine different from theirs, and to regard them as disturbers of the peace, as peace-hating, quarrelsome, and malicious men. These unfortunate people have no idea of the blindness which enshrouds them. They do not know how gladly the boldest champions of Christ would have kept pace with all men, how much they would have preferred to keep silent, how hard it was for their flesh and blood to come out in public and become targets for the hatred, enmity, vilification, scorn, and persecution of men. However, they could not but confess the truth, and at the same time oppose error. Their conscience constrained them to do this, because such conduct was required of them by the word of God. They remembered that Jesus Christ had said to his disciples, Not only ye are the light of the world, but also ye are the salt of the earth. That is, you are not only to proclaim the truth, but you are also to salt the world with its sins and errors, 
you are to sprinkle sharp salt on the world to stay its corruption. They remembered that Christ had distinctly said, Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. Matthew 10.34 Not as though the Lord took pleasure in peace-destroying wars. Not as though he had come into the world to start dissensions and discord among men. But he means to say, My doctrine is of such a nature, that if it is properly proclaimed, thetically and antithetically, peace among men cannot possibly be preserved. For as soon as my word is proclaimed, men will divide into two camps. Some will receive it with joy, others will be offended by it, and will begin to hate and persecute those who receive it. Moreover, preachers of the right character remember that the church is not a kingdom that can be built up in peace, for it is located within the domain of the devil, who is the prince of this world. Accordingly, the church has no choice but to be at war. It is ecclesia militans, the church militant, and will remain such until the blessed end. Wherever a church is seen to be not ecclesia militans, but ecclesia quiescens, a church at ease, that, you may rely on it, is a false church. Moreover, an honest preacher knows that he is also a pastor, that is, a shepherd. Of what use, however, is a shepherd who leads the sheep to good pasture grounds, but flees when he sees the wolf coming? The occasion that is to test his caliber is when he must go to meet the wolf that wants to devour the sheep. That means to fight for the kingdom of God. Lastly, an honest preacher knows that he is to be a regular sower of the seed. Of what use is it for him to sow good seed, and then to look on while another sows the tares of false doctrine among his wheat? Soon the tares will outstrip the wheat and choke it. Keep these facts stored up in your memory, my dear friends. If you wish to be faithful ministers of Christ, you cannot possibly become such without striving and fighting against false doctrines, a false gospel, a false belief. In the view of worldly men, your lot will not be particularly enviable. Even wise Sirach says, If thou comest to serve the Lord, prepare thy soul for temptation. He means to say, It is impossible for you to escape affliction if you wish to be a faithful servant of God. Any one who is without affliction may be ever so zealous in the discharge of the duties of his office. His zeal is nevertheless not of the right sort. Where there is genuine zeal, there not only planting, not only building is going on, but the workmen also have the sword girded about them, and they are going out to wage the wars of the Lord. Let this be your slogan. Here men's scorn and frown, yonder glory's crown. Here I'm hoping and believing, there I'm having and perceiving. For we reach our crown, through men's scorn and frown. Let this slogan be at the same time your comfort. For, as I said, your cause will be spurned as an evil one, unless you connive at any contrary view that may be expressed in opposition to your teaching. But your cause will shine with all the greater luster in heaven. On the last day God will say to you, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Matthew 25, 21. Then will come the times of your refreshing, when you will have quit this wicked world in the association of false Christians who have shamefully vilified your best endeavors, calling them the worst abominations. Then your Lord will say to you, Well done, you were right. You did not look for ease and comfort. You only strove faithfully to keep what was entrusted to you. But remember, in this connection, that errors are the more harmful the more they are concealed. It is therefore necessary that they be dragged into the light and fought. Of this duty we are reminded by our Thesis 14. In the tenth place, the word of God is not rightly divided when faith is required as a condition of justification and salvation, as if a person were righteous in the sight of God and saved, not only by faith, but also on account of his faith, for the sake of his faith, and in view of his faith. 
There are not a few people who imagine that a minister who constantly preaches that man is made righteous in the sight of God and saved by faith is manifestly a genuine evangelical preacher. For what else is to be required of him, when everybody knows that salvation by faith is the marrow and essence of the gospel and the entire word of God? That is true. The minister who preaches that doctrine is certainly a genuine evangelical preacher. But that fact is not established merely from his use of these words, man is made righteous in the sight of God and saved by faith alone, but from the proper sense that must be connected with these words. The preacher must mean by faith what Scripture means when it employs that term. But here is where many preachers are at fault. By faith they understand something different from what the prophets and apostles and our Lord and Saviour understood by faith. I pass by the rationalists, who used to preach that man is indeed saved by faith, but by faith in Jesus Christ they understand nothing else than the acceptance of the excellent moral teachings which Christ proclaimed. By accepting these moral teachings they held, a person becomes a true disciple of the Lord, and is made righteous and saved. Take up any rationalistic book of the radical type that was published in the age of rationalism, and you will see that such was the preaching. Of vulgar rationalism. Nor are the papists averse to saying that faith makes a person righteous in the sight of God and saves him. In an emergency they will even say that faith alone makes a person righteous and saves him. But by faith they understand fides formata, faith that is joined with love. Accordingly they manage to say many excellent things about faith, but by faith they always mean something different from what scripture teaches concerning faith. Moreover, in the postles and devotional writings of all modern theologians you may find the doctrine that man is made righteous in the sight of God and saved by faith. But by faith they understand nothing but what man himself achieves and produces. Their faith is a product of human energy and resolution. Such teaching, however, subverts the entire gospel. What God's word really means when it says that man is justified and saved by faith alone is nothing else than this. Man is not saved by his own acts, but solely by the doing and dying of his Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, the Redeemer of the whole world. Over against this teaching, modern theologians assert that in the salvation of man two kinds of activity must be noted. In the first place, there is something that God must do. His part is the most difficult, for he must accomplish the work of redeeming men. But in the second place, something is required that man must do. For it will not do to admit persons to heaven after they have been redeemed without further parley. Man must do something really great. He has to believe. This teaching overthrows the gospel completely. It is a pity that many beautiful sermons of modern theologians ultimately reveal the fact that they mean something entirely different from the plain and clear teaching of Scripture that man is saved not by what he himself does or achieves, but by what God does and achieves. Here, for instance, a statement from Luthart in his Compend of Theology, page 202. On the other hand, repentance and faith are required of man as that part which he is to render, metanoieta kai pestoieta, at every stage of the history of salvation. The requirement of repentance can be met immediately by the person who is called by grace, Psalm 95, 7, Hebrews 4, 7 and following, while faith is a free act of obedience which man renders. Note the term renders. It refers to the fulfillment of a duty for which a person expects a reward. But faith is not an achievement of man. If it were, it would meet a condition which God had proposed to man, as if God had said, I have done my share, now you must do yours. I do not ask much of you, but I do require that you repent and believe. Now, can you consider anything a present that is handed you on condition that you do something for it? No, it ceases to be a present when the donor stipulates one condition or another which the grantee must meet. Here in our country, many donations are not valid. Accordingly, to make a legally valid donation of something quite valuable, the donor will state 
that he has received one dollar for it. This is done in bills of sale, by which property worth millions of dollars is conveyed. It is a circumvention of the law, which plainly shows the essential difference between giving and selling. Believing the gospel would be, in truth, an immeasurably great and difficult task for us, if God were not to accomplish it in us. But suppose it were not so exceedingly great and difficult. Even if it were an easy condition that God had proposed to us for our salvation, our salvation would not be a gift. God would not have given us His Son, but merely offered Him to us with a certain stipulation. That has not been God's way. The Apostle Paul says, Being justified freely, Doreon, by His grace, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Romans 3.24 We are justified Doreon, that is, gratuitously, without anything, even the least thing, being required of us. Accordingly, we poor sinners praise God for the place of refuge He has prepared for us, where we can flee even when we have to come to Him as utterly lost, insolvent beggars, who have not the least ability to offer to God something that they have achieved. All that we can offer Him is our sins, nothing else. But for that very reason, Jesus regards us as His proper clients. We honor Him as our faithful Savior by making His gospel our refuge. But we deny Him if we come to Him offering Him something for what He gives us. In view of the statement of Peter, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Acts 4.12 you must regard it as an awful perversion of the gospel to treat the command to believe as a condition of man's justification and salvation. Suppose you say to a beggar who approaches you asking alms that you will give him something on one condition, and on his asking you what that condition is, you would tell him the condition is that he accept your gift. Would he not consider your condition a hoax, and say, laughing, why, most gladly I shall meet your condition, and the more you give, the greater will become my joy in taking it. True, if a person refuses to believe, nobody can help him, but he must not say that grace was offered with a condition attached to it which he could not meet. God attaches no condition to his grace when he proffers it to a sinner and asks him to accept it. It would be no gift if he were to attach a condition, just as little as it is a gift when I ask a tramp to work in my garden if he wants me to give him something to eat. Such a person I treat in accordance with Second Thessalonians 3.10, if any would not work, neither should he eat, and thus keep him from vagrancy. You see, then, what a perversion of the gospel it is to treat faith as a condition of salvation. Our recent predestinarian controversy shows how easy it is to err in this matter. Our adversaries stumble at our doctrine that God has not foreseen anything in the elect that could have prompted him to elect them, but that his election is one of unconstrained mercy. They are shocked, because in accordance with the formula of concord, we teach that there are only two causes of salvation, namely the mercy of God and the merit of Christ. They imagine that God is partial, saying he elects some and neglects others, reprobating them. This is an inference which they draw, and it is one for which they deserve no commendation. Instead of trying to save God from the charge of partiality by assuming a difference in the person whom he elects when compared with the others, they should consider that man is justified and saved by faith, not on account of faith. Our old theologians have said that people who charge God with being partial deserve to be whipped. The German theologians come out more boldly with their opinion, while our adversaries here in America are more wary. The latter adhere to the formula intuitu fidei of the old dogmaticians, and say that God elected men in view of their faith. They seek shelter behind the old dogmaticians, but their stratagem is futile, because they use the formula in a sense different from that in which the old dogmaticians employed it. Our adversaries state plainly that God has decreed to elect certain men in view of their conduct, 
or they use similar terms. Turn and twist as much as they will, they declare that something which man does is the cause of his salvation. If John Gerhard and Agadius Hunius were to rise from the dead and see that our adversaries in the present controversy on predestination appeal to them as their authorities, they would be amazed for it can be plainly shown that they have rejected and abominated the doctrine of our adversaries. John Gerhardt, in his Chapters in Theology, writes, Locus de Evangelii, paragraph 26, We hold that the law differs from the gospel in the third place as regards the promises. Those of the law are conditioned, for they stipulate perfect obedience and demand perfect obedience as the condition of their realization. Leviticus 18.5 Ye shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man do, he shall live in them. But the promises of the gospel are gratuitous, and are offered as gifts, donativa. Accordingly, the gospel is called the word of God's grace, and Romans 4.16 states, Therefore it, righteousness, is of faith, that it might be by grace. This citation shows the reason why this thesis was embodied in the present series. A person teaching that faith is a condition which the gospel stipulates makes the promises of the gospel conditioned promises like those of the law, and removes the distinction between the law and the gospel. The law promises no good thing except on condition that a person comply perfectly with its demands, while the gospel promises everything unconditionally as a free gift. In short, the promises of grace demand nothing of man. When the Lord says, Believe, he does not utter a demand, but issues an urgent invitation to man to take, to apprehend, to appropriate what he is giving, without asking anything in return for it. The gift must, of course, be accepted. Non-acceptance forfeits the gift, but not because there was a condition attached to it. Again, Gerhard says, Faith is not placed in opposition to grace, even as the beggar's act of accepting the gift is not placed in opposition to the free bounty of the giver. A beggar would be insane if he were to say to the donor, What, I am still to do the accepting? And would be told to be gone with his silliness. Gerhard continues, The term if is either etiological or syllogistic. That is, it signifies either a cause or a consequence. In the preaching of the law, the statement, If you do this, you shall live, the term is etiological. It signifies the cause or reason, for obedience is the reason why eternal life is given to those who keep the law. But in evangelical promises, the term if is syllogistic. It signifies a consequence, for it relates to the mode of application which God has appointed for these promises, and that is faith alone. If faith is called an achievement of man, the demand for it makes faith a condition that man must meet by his own effort. That is the reason why the aforementioned error of Luthart is so great. It vitiates his entire theology. Adam Osiander, in his Collegium Theologicum, Tome 5, 140, writes, Faith does not justify in so far as it is obedience in compliance with a command. For thus viewed it is an action, a work, and something required by law. But only in so far as it receives, and is attached to justification after the manner of a passive instrument. This citation shows again that our thesis belongs in this series on the distinction between the law and the gospel. If faith is obedience, it is a work of the law, and the Apostle Paul was altogether wrong when he declared that a person is justified without the deeds of the law by faith alone. However, it is not he that was wrong, but the modern theologians. Faith is merely a passive instrument, like a hand into which one places a dollar. The person receives the dollar, provided he does not withdraw his hand. Beyond that, he does not have anything to do. The donor is doing the essential part by putting the gift into the hand, not the other party by holding out the hand. Let a beggar approach a miser and see what his holding out of the hand to him will help him. The miser may set his dogs upon him if he annoys him too much.
To cite Gerhard once more, he writes, Locus de Justificatione, paragraph 179. It is one thing to be justified on account of faith, and another to be justified by faith. In the former view, faith is the meritorious. In the latter, the instrumental cause. There must be an organ by which I come into the possession and enjoyment of what someone offers me. We are not justified on account of faith as a merit, but by faith, which lays hold of the merit of Christ. It is not my own merit that saves me, but the merit of Christ. However, as regards the simile that has been adduced, the old axiom must be noted, omne simile est dissimile. In every simile there is some element of dissimilarity. Otherwise it would not be a simile, but an identity. When I hold out my hand, I make a motion. This point must not be pressed in the case of man's faith. For it is God who prompts the holding out of the hand, after he has prepared a sinner for the gospel by means of the law. Of course, God cannot prompt the person who continues, and is determined to continue in his sinful life, and makes a mockery of God's word. John O'Learis, who completed that splendid treatise of Karpsov, Isagoge in Libros Symbolicos, Introduction to the Symbolical Books, says, page 1361, In relation to salvation, faith is not our work, but it belongs to the order of salvation which God has laid down, and for this reason it is not by any means a condition in the proper sense of the term, depending on man, but it is a blessing from our Father in heaven, or a requisite which is furnished to a person who merely suffers it to be furnished to him, or an instrument which lays hold of salvation. It is in no way an active cause that proceeds from man and has an influence, after the manner of a cause properly so called, in bringing about a person's salvation. Remember this well. In a certain sense it might be said that faith is man's work, because it is not God that believes, but man. However, this is liable to be misunderstood, and therefore we should not speak thus. Faith is not an achievement of ours, but is wrought in us by God, without our contributing anything towards that end. The old dogmaticians build up their dogmatic treatises by the causal method, considering everything from the viewpoint of a cause. It was a dangerous method. When they came to the element of faith, they were perplexed about what kind of cause to call it, and hit upon the term causa instrumentalis, instrumental or organic cause. Now, you may run through the whole Bible, and you will not find a single passage which states that man is justified on account of his faith. Wherever the relation of faith to justification is spoken of, terms are used which declare faith a means, not a cause. That is evidence sufficient to show what the Bible doctrine on this point is. You will either have to put the Bible aside and choose a different calling, or, if you must enter the ministry because God constrains you, this is what you will have to teach concerning faith in strict accordance with God's word. The excellent Württemberg theologian Heerbrandt wrote a compend of theology that was even translated into Greek and sent to the patriarch of Constantinople. He says, Faith is not a condition, nor is it, properly speaking, required as a condition, because justification is not promised and offered on account of the worth or meritoriousness of faith, or in so far as faith is a work. For faith, too, is imperfect. However, it is a mode of receiving the blessing offered men through and on account of Christ. Now, it would be silly to call faith a condition, nevertheless. For, says Heerbrand, the hand is not called the condition, but the organ and instrument for receiving alms. To conclude, Kalov, in his Biblia Illustrata, commenting on Romans 5.10, says, We have not been redeemed and reconciled, nor have our sins been atoned for under a condition, but we have been absolutely redeemed in the most perfect and complete manner, as far as merit and efficacy of the act are concerned. Although, as regards the actual enjoyment and appropriation of salvation, faith is necessary, which is nothing else than the appropriation of the atonement, satisfaction, and reconciliation of Christ. For, in the judgment of God, 
if one died for all, it is the same as if all had died. Second Corinthians 5.14 This is a golden text, which shines with the radiance of the sun, even in the luminous scriptures. Since the death which Christ died for all is a death for the purpose of reconciliation, it is the same as if all had suffered death for this purpose. It follows, then, that without entertaining the least doubt, I can say with perfect assurance, I am redeemed, I am reconciled, salvation has been acquired for me. End of Lecture 25Lecture 26 of the Proper Distinction Between Law and Gospel by C. F. W. Walter Translated by W. H. T. Dow This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Twenty-sixth Evening Lecture, May 1, 1885 In order to be a true Christian, genuine faith is an indispensable requisite. However, in order to be a true minister, genuine faith is not sufficient. But there must be, in addition to faith, the ability to express in proper terms the things that must be believed. Accordingly, the holy apostle Paul enjoins upon his assistant Timothy with great earnestness this duty, Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me, in faith and love which is in Jesus Christ. 2 Timothy 1.13 It is indeed indispensable for a minister to have genuine faith in his heart, and to guard well this mystery of faith in his heart. However, it is equally indispensable that he present the true faith in sound words, as the Apostle expresses it, that is, in clear, plain, unmistakable, and adequate terms. This is a warning to be heeded particularly by those young theologians who were not reared in the sound words of faith as Timothy was, according to the report of Apostle Paul who did not from a child hear the true doctrine, but instead heard the teaching of rationalistic preachers, or of believing preachers of this modern type. Some erroneous expression that is fundamentally wrong may have stuck in their memory, and they will probably make use of it in their sermons to the great injury of their hearers. You know that rationalistic preachers refer to repentance and conversion by calling it amending or reforming one's life to sanctification by calling it walking in the path of virtue, to the anger of God by calling it the serious purpose of God, to the predestination of God by calling it man's fate, to the gospel by calling it the teaching of Jesus. Anyone who has heard these phrases since his childhood days may easily adopt this dangerous rationalistic terminology in his sermons even if he does not do it because he harbors a wrong belief. However, even believing theologians of the modern type are frequently too timid to use technical terms that are fully warranted by biblical and ecclesiastical usage, because they are afraid that these terms might prove offensive to their audience. They are averse to speaking of hereditary sin in their sermons, or of the wrath of God against sinners, of the blindness of natural man, of spiritual death, in which all men are merged by nature. They do not like to speak of the devil going about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, because that would make them unpopular with their hearers. They are disinclined to speak of the everlasting fire of hell, of eternal torment and damnation. They prefer to speak of these matters to their hearers in terms that do not seem so strange faulty and offensive to them, employing phrases that are more in harmony with the religious sentiment of an enlightened people. Now, there is no doubt that these men wish to convert people by using such false terms. They believe that they can convert men by concealing things from them, or by presenting matters in a manner that is pleasing to men as they are by nature. They are like sorry physicians, who do not like to prescribe a bitter medicine to delicate patients or, if they do prescribe it, they add so much sugar to it that the patient does not taste the bitter medicine, with the result that the effect is spoiled. Accordingly, preachers who do not clearly and plainly proclaim the gospel, which is offensive to the world, are not faithful in the discharge of their ministry, and inflict great injury on men's souls. 
Instead of advancing Christians in the knowledge of the pure doctrine, they allow them to grope in the dark, nurse false imaginations in them, and speed them on their false and dangerous path. The history of the Church shows how dangerous it is when theologians, otherwise reputed as orthodox, use wrong terms, which can easily be misunderstood. As a result, the most abominable heretics, to cover up their errors with a halo of sanctity, have appealed to phrases which men admittedly orthodox have used. These heretics have deprecated being denounced for the use of terms which were accepted without question from men regarded as orthodox. True, the faulty expressions which orthodox teachers use in a right sense are used by these heretics to hide their error. Nevertheless, those who first used these expressions and believed that they were using them in the right sense are not altogether without blame. In the manner aforestated, Arius, Nestorius, all the scholastics, and so forth, appealed to men whose orthodoxy was acknowledged, and thus created the impression that they were continuing to teach the doctrine of the old church, and that their opponents must be false teachers. Bear this in mind, my dear friends, and consider that as ministers of the gospel it is your duty not only to believe as the church believes, but also to speak in harmony with the Christian church. Accordingly, before you commit your sermons to memory, and deliver them to your congregations, you must subject your manuscript to a severe critique, to ascertain not only whether your sermons are according to the analogy of faith, but also whether you have throughout chosen proper terms, lest against your own intention you destroy where you want to build up. This is of the utmost importance. That is the reason why our church, from the very beginning, declared that it requires its preachers not to depart an inch from its confessions, not to turn aside from the doctrines laid down in them, non tantum in rebus, set etiam in fresibus, that is, both as regards the matter offered in their sermons, and the manner of their teaching. This is indeed a great task, requiring hard study. However, in three years you can accomplish a great deal. At the close of your theological triennium, those of you who have faithfully applied themselves will know, some more, some less, not only what the true doctrine is, but also how it must be presented. The task will be somewhat more difficult to those of you in particular who have had to listen to perverse teachers nearly throughout their youth. They will reveal in their sermons that they have not been brought up in the sound words of faith. Proper terms must be employed. For the Apostle Paul beseeches the entire congregation at Corinth to speak the same thing. 1 Corinthians 1.10 They are not to use divergent terms when expounding the same doctrine. The Apostle adds another important remark, that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Teaching the same doctrine is of no avail if it is not done in the same mind and in the same judgment. The United Unierte Church affords a pertinent illustration. Its teachers may speak as we do, but they do not connect the same sense and meaning with the words that we do. These two things, then, are required of you, the same doctrine in the same terms, and the same mind and judgment. In our fifteenth thesis, we are taking up a study of an instance which shows the injury that may be wrought by a faulty expression. Thesis 15. In the eleventh place, the word of God is not rightly divided when the gospel is turned into a preaching of repentance. To understand these words correctly, you will have to bear in mind that the term gospel has a usage similar to that of the term repentance. In the Holy Scriptures, the term repentance is used in a wide and in a narrow sense. In the wide sense, it signifies conversion viewed in its entirety, embracing knowledge of sin, contrition, and faith. This meaning occurs in Acts 2.38, where we read, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, and so forth. The apostle does not say, Repent and believe. Accordingly, he refers to conversion in its entirety, inclusive of faith. Nor could he have said, Be contrite and then be baptized. He must have conceived of contrition as joined with faith. 
What he means to say is this, If you acknowledge your sins, and believe in the gospel which I have just preached to you, then be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. The term repentance is used in a narrow sense to signify the knowledge of sin, and heartfelt sorrow and contrition. In Mark 1.15 we read, Repent ye, and believe the gospel. In this statement, John the Baptist evidently did not include faith in repentance, otherwise his statement would be tautological. In Acts 20.21, 20, Paul relates that he had been testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Since faith is named separately in this text, the term repentance cannot embrace knowledge of sin, contrition, and faith. Likewise, the Lord says concerning the Jews, that despite the preaching of John the Baptist, they repented not afterward that they might believe him. Matthew 21, 32. Luther translates, Tatet ihr danach nicht buße, das ihr ihm danach auch gelobt hättet. By repentance, he refers to the effects of the law, and means to say that since they had not become alarmed over their sins, it had not been possible for them to believe, for there will not be faith in a heart that has not first been terrified. There is a similar usage as regards the term gospel. Sometimes it is used in a wide, then again in a narrow meaning. The narrow meaning is its proper sense. In its wide meaning it is used merely by way of synecdoche, signifying anything that Jesus preached, including even his very poignant preaching of the law, as, for instance, the Sermon on the Mount, and his reproving of wicked men. Besides, the term gospel is used in contradistinction to the Old Testament, which often signifies only the teaching of the law. Romans 2.16 we read, In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel. Here the apostle cannot refer to the gospel in the narrow sense, for that has nothing to do with the judgment, since Scripture declares, He that believeth on him is not condemned, shall not come into condemnation. John 3, 18, 5, 24. By gospel in this text, Paul understands the doctrine which he had proclaimed, and which was composed of both law and gospel. The term gospel is unquestionably used in the narrow sense in Romans 1.16. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to every one that believeth. It is called first a gospel of Jesus Christ, next a gospel that saves all who believe it. No such demand is made upon us by the law, which requires that we keep it. Accordingly, the apostle is here speaking of God's gift to the world and of faith. Hence, of the gospel in the narrow sense, to the exclusion of the law. Another pertinent text is Ephesians 6.15, which speaks of the gospel of peace. Since the law does not bring peace, but only unrest, the apostle in this text is speaking of the gospel in the narrow sense, that is, of the glad tidings that Jesus Christ is come into the world to save sinners. Our Lutheran confessions follow the Bible in using the term gospel now in the wide, now in the narrow sense. That explains the statement which occurs in them, namely, the gospel preaches repentance. You will have to note this fact in order to understand our thesis correctly. The commingling of law and gospel takes place when the gospel of Christ, that is, the gospel in the narrow sense, is turned into a preaching of repentance. In the Apology, Article 12, Paragraph 29, we read, for the sum of the gospel is comprehended in these two parts. First, it tells us to amend our lives, thus denouncing every one as a sinner. In the second place, it offers forgiveness of sin, everlasting life, salvation, every blessing, and the Holy Spirit through Christ, by whom we are born again. It is quite evident that in this passage Melanchthon is using the term gospel in the wide sense. Luther does the same in ever so many places throughout his writings, whenever he speaks of the Gospels reproving men. But when he teaches what the Gospel really is, he speaks of nothing but consolation, mercy, forgiveness of sins, in short, of what the Gospel in the narrow sense proclaims. 
Lest you think that Melanchthon, who is not always absolutely to be trusted, used a faulty diction even in our confessions, let me submit another citation from the Apology, Article 12, paragraphs 53 and 54. Accordingly, the entire scriptures urge these two doctrines. The one is the law, which reveals our misery and reproves sin. The other doctrine is the gospel. For the promise of God, when he offers grace through Christ, the promise of grace is repeated again and again throughout the scriptures ever since the days of Adam. For at first the promise of grace, or the first gospel, was given to Adam in these words, I will put enmity, and so forth. Afterwards, promises concerning the same Christ were made to Abraham and the patriarchs. Later, it was preached by the prophets. And lastly, the same promise was preached among the Jews by Christ himself when he had come into the world. And finally, it was spread among the Gentiles through the world by the gospel. For by faith in the gospel, all patriarchs and all the saints since the beginning of the world have been made righteous in the sight of God, not on account of their contrition or sorrow or any other work. From this statement, you can see that when Melanchthon, a few pages previous, says, First, the gospel says, Amend your lives. He uses the term gospel in the wider sense, referring to the tidings of grace together with the preaching of the law and vice versa. But in the last quoted passage, he speaks of both parts as contrasted with one another, naming the two doctrines into which the entire scripture is divided. It is not only extremely dangerous, but actually harmful to the souls of men for a minister to preach in such a manner as to lead men to believe that he regards the gospel in its narrow and proper sense as a preaching of the law and of the anger of God against sinners, calling them to repentance. Not to be cautious about the terms he uses is a great and serious fault, even in a preacher whose personal faith may be correct. Accordingly, the Lutheran Church has, from the beginning, watched a speaker closely who was wont to say, The gospel is a preaching of repentance, to see whether he was speaking of the gospel in the wide, or the gospel in the narrow sense. When Melanchthon published the altered Augsburg Confession, he was looked upon with suspicion because of the new exposition he gave in this matter. He was immediately taken to task by Flacius, who never took false teaching lightly. Melanchthon receded from his position, and admitted that he had indeed used inadequate, in fact wrong, terms. This was satisfactory to Flacius, who did not wish to quarrel about terms, since heresy is not so much in the terms one uses as in the manner which one teaches, although the terms are not to be treated as an indifferent matter. When using terms that do not correctly express a certain thought, we are not heretics, but careless speakers. Accordingly, Flacius did not rush at Melanchthon, exclaiming, For God's sake, look what you have done! The first to teach entirely false doctrine on this point was John Agricola, the antinomian fanatic. He was an untrustworthy, utterly careless person who misused the gospel. He was conceited to a high degree, but he was a learned man. During an illness which everyone thought would prove fatal, he remarked facetiously, You cannot kill weeds. He started out to gather prestige for himself when Luther began to preach stern law sermons to secure sinners. He imagined that Luther had fallen away from his own teaching of the blessed gospel, which he had proclaimed at a time when he had an entirely different audience, namely, people who had been utterly crushed by the law. He thought the time had come for him to show that he was the reformer. He published anonymously eighteen Propositiones inter fratres sparsas, theses spread among brethren. They are found in the St. Louis edition of Luther's works, volume 20, page 1624 and following. Thesis 18 reads, For the gospel of Christ teaches the wrath of God from heaven, and at the same time the righteousness that is valid in the sight of God. Romans 1.17 for it is a preaching unto repentance, attached to God's promise, which reason does not grasp by nature, but only by a divine revelation. Romans 1.17 The Apostle starts a new section of his treatise. After announcing the subject of his epistle, he takes up the law, and in the second half of the first, in the entire second, and in the first half of the third chapter, 
urges its claim. This part of his teaching he begins with the word, the wrath of God from heaven, and so forth. He declares that everybody carries in his own bosom the judge that condemns him, and feels and observes everywhere the judgments of the holy and righteous God. After preaching the law, the apostle takes up the gospel. Now Agricola interprets the apostle's words as signifying that the wrath of God is manifested in the gospel, taking gospel in the strict sense of the term. He indulges in foolish talk when he calls the gospel a preaching unto repentance, attached to God's promise, which reason does not grasp by nature, but only by a divine revelation. He declares that it cannot be understood, yet he undertakes to preach it to people who have as yet not been crushed. That is self-contradictory, but that is what heretics always are. Afterwards, the Philippists, the followers of Melanchthon, took up Agricola's teaching. Good Melanchthon could not keep his fanatical followers from declaring Agricola's teaching exactly orthodox, instead of saying, as Melanchthon had done, that he had used inadequate terms, which did not express his real meaning. The worst of these fanatics was Caspar Cruciger the Younger. His father had been an excellent theologian, and Luther had at one time desired him to become his successor. But this son of old Cruciger did not turn out well. He wrote a treatise on justification in 1570, in which he said, In this office of the gospel, God wants to terrify men by the preaching of repentance, which reveals both all the sins that are set forth in the law, and this saddest of all sins which is really shown up in the gospel, namely the failure to know the Son of God and the contempt of Him. Disputation de justificationis. Cruciger contrasts the gospel with the law, and claims that the law does not show us the worst sins, but that this is done by the gospel. Some thought that Agricola was not altogether wrong, because the law has nothing to say about the faith which justifies a sinner, hence the sin of unbelief which must be revealed in the gospel. This, however, is only apparently so. The gospel is the preaching of consolation. Though we must conclude that contempt of the gospel is the most horrible sin, still it is not the gospel that teaches it, but it is an inference drawn from the gospel. Certainly I can, by inverting it, turn the most comforting doctrine into a comfortless one. No, it is the law that reproves unbelief. Where? In the first commandment, which signifies that we are to fear, love, and trust in God above all things. Unbelief, no matter in what relation it is viewed, is forbidden in the first commandment. When I commit the sin of unbelief, I sin because I break the law, which requires me to trust in God and believe His word. The gospel did not come into the world to reveal the sin of unbelief. This sin had been previously revealed by the law. This point you will have to bear in mind, or you cannot prevail against antinomians. Agricola's error had also been espoused by Petzl, who wrote a treatise against Vigand, in which he said, the gospel, in the strict sense, contains the sternest threatening and reproves sin, namely the sin of unbelief, of refusing to know the Son, of despising the anger of God, and finally of despair. Adversus Vigiandum. It is gross nonsense when he says in this connection that the law has not a word to say that despair is sin. Are we not to love and trust God? That excludes despair. Hence, despair must be the most abominable and horrible sin. The gospel does say, Believe, and you shall be saved. From this the inference can be drawn, If I do not believe, I shall not be saved. But this is because the law requires me to believe. You must rivet this fact on your mind, so as not to be deluded by the claim of antinomians, which is a most horrible case of commingling law and gospel to which you must never lend your ears. When preaching the gospel, you must not present it with a black cloud hovering over it, but proclaim free grace and unconditioned consolation. When we are in the agony of death, we must have a sound cable of which we can take hold. We must know that what we grasp is not the law. The antinomians who opposed Luther may have been well-intentioned men, but they were Pharisees. 
in their pitiful blindness they imagined that they were helping the world by their teaching while they deprived the world of its only means of rescue paul krell's treatise against vigon in 1571 may also be noted in this connection he says since the greatest and chief sin is revealed reproved and condemned only by the gospel it is strictly speaking the gospel alone which is really and truly the preaching that calls for repentance or conversion in the true and proper sense disputation adversus johann vigandum 1571 let us hear now what our confessions say about the matter which had become involved in many obscurities by the formula of concord harmony was to be restored also in this point of doctrine it says in the epitome article five paragraphs six seven and eleven if the law and the gospel likewise also moses himself as a teacher of the law and christ as a preacher of the gospel are contrasted with one another we believe teach and confess that the gospel is not a preaching of repentance or reproof but properly nothing else than a preaching of consolation and a joyful message which does not reprove or terrify but comforts consciences against the terrors of the law points alone to the merit of christ and raises them up again by the lovely preaching of the grace and favor of god obtained through christ's merit as to the revelation of sin because the veil of moses hangs before the eyes of all men as long as they hear the bare preaching of the law and nothing concerning christ and therefore do not learn from the law to perceive their sins aright but either become presumptuous hypocrites who swell with the opinion of their own righteousness like the pharisees or despair like judas christ takes the law into his hands and explains it spiritually matthew five twenty one and following romans seven fourteen and thus the wrath of god is revealed from heaven against all sinners romans one eighteen how great it is by this means they are directed to the law and then first learn from it to know aright their sins a knowledge which moses never could have forced out of them accordingly we reject and regard as incorrect and injurious the dogma that the gospel is properly a preaching of repentance or reproof and not alone a preaching of grace for thereby the gospel is again converted into a doctrine of the law the merit of christ and holy scripture are obscured christians robbed of true consolation and the door is opened again to the errors and superstitions of the papacy in view of the fact that scripture does not always employ the term gospel in the same sense the antinomians had ascribed to the gospel in the strict sense something that could be ascribed to the gospel only in the wide sense we must bear in mind that there is also a gospel which does not reprove sin but affords the only comfort to sinners when reading the scriptures we must be able to tell whether the term gospel in a certain passage is intended in the wide or in the strict sense and we must be particularly careful to find the passages where it is used in the latter meaning the same teaching that has been rejected by the formula of concord was embodied in the interim the compromise effected between the evangelicals and the romanists and in the decrees of the council of trent next friday we shall try to ascertain in which passages of scripture the term gospel is clearly used in the strict sense this matter is quite important especially for young preachers if they are to learn how to express their thoughts correctly End of lecture 26lecture 27 of the proper distinction between law and gospel by c f w walter translated by w h t dow this librivox recording is in the public domain 27th evening lecture may 8 1885 all mankind you know is distributed among three estates appointed and ordained by god himself the estate of teachers of producers and defenders the lehrstand Mehrstand und Verstand, as the Germans call them. In view of the statement of David in Psalm 11, verse 3, his work is honorable and glorious, none of these God-ordained estates is to be esteemed lightly, for in each one of these estates a person can pursue his way to heaven, please God and God's children, 
and serve God and his fellow man. What more do we need? In the estate of teachers, we have those who teach in the church and in the schools. In the estate of producers, we have peasants, artisans, artists, and scholars. In the estate of defenders, we have governors, state officers, jurists, and soldiers. True, the estate of teacher has in general been little respected, especially in ages gone by. And as far as the teachers of the word of God are concerned, they are of all men the most despised, and even hated by the world. Nevertheless, their estate and office is the most glorious of all, for the following reasons. 1. The work of their office centers about man's spiritual welfare, his immortal soul. 2. They employ the most salutary means and instrument in their work, namely, the word of the living God. 3. They aim at the most salutary and glorious end, namely, to make man truly happy in the present life and to lead him to the life of eternal bliss. 4. They are most wholesomely engaged in an occupation which entirely satisfies their spirits and advances their own selves in the way of salvation. 5. Their labor yields the most precious result, namely, the salvation of man. 6. Their labors have the most glorious promise of the cooperation of the Lord, so that they are never entirely futile and in vain. 7. Their labors have the promise of a gracious reward, which consists in a glory in the world to come that is unutterably great, exceeding abundantly above all that they ever could have asked and prayed for in this life. If men would stop to consider these points, they would come crowding into the sacred office of the ministry and that of teachers of religion, as they are crowding into great state offices which yield them honor and great emoluments. Parents would deem it a higher honor and special grace of God if they could have their sons trained for this sacred office. Young theologians would feel constrained every day to go down on their knees and praise and magnify God's holy name for having done such great things for them, predestinating them from eternity to this exalted and sacred office. Yea, I am forced to say that if the holy angels, who had been confirmed in eternal bliss, were capable of envy, they would, even in their state of celestial glory, unquestionably envy every teacher of the gospel. For all that is recorded concerning them in holy scriptures does not equal the greatness of the office of teachers and preachers, in which men become helpers in the task of bringing fallen creatures back to their Creator. Without doubt, these rescued people will forever and ever thank those by whose ministry they were saved from perdition and brought into life everlasting. However, this reflection upon the estate of preachers and teachers of the Word of God must make them ever more faithful in the performance of their office. They must strive to present the doctrine which they preach in a pure and unadulterated form, and teach it in such manner that their hearers will learn to know on the one hand their own misery, and on the other hand the goodness of God, become believers, be kept in the faith, and finally come to those blessed abodes where they shall see God and praise and magnify Him forever and ever. We have seen that the principal task of a preacher is rightly to divide the word of truth. He must not be like a carpenter who is trimming a block and does not mind where the chips fall, but he must be like a goldsmith who is working with a precious metal and is careful to pick up even the minutest particle that drops from his work table. May God grant you his Holy Spirit abundantly and make you faithful guardians over the immense treasures which will be entrusted to you when you enter the ministry. May you truly provide for the precious souls which God puts in your care, in order that it may be said of you when you have finished your labors, their works do follow them. Then you will never feel sorry, neither during these years of study nor later in the ministry, that you have had to submit to penurious conditions. You will praise God when you shall see that from pure grace He is making you to shine as the brightness of the firmament and as the stars forever and ever. We have examined the principal proofs for the fifteenth thesis and have repelled some of the objections that are raised against it. I wish to call attention to two additional objections. In the first place, it is objected that Scripture itself calls the gospel a law, and that hence the gospel may be called a preaching unto repentance, because the law serves the purpose of leading men to repentance, 
Romans 3.27 is cited, where we read, Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. According to the Apostle's own terminology, the objectors say that the gospel too is a law. This is drawing a faulty inference from the Apostle's words. The Apostle in this passage employs the figure antanaclasis. He uses the same word which his opponent has used, however, in a different meaning to refute the opponent. To illustrate, when the Jews from a self-righteous motive asked Christ, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? John 6.28 He answered, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. Verse 29 they had misunderstood the term work of god which the lord had used imagining that he was referring to works which man must do to please god christ retains the term but employs it in an entirely different meaning he means to say works do not save a person but doing no works for the purpose of achieving some merit relying solely on christ the redeemer and his grace that is what saves Hence, a person is made righteous in the sight of God by what he receives from God. This figure of speech is used also in ordinary daily life. When a son, who has been slovenly in his work, comes to his father and impudently asks for his wages, the father will say, Indeed, I shall give you your wages with a rod. The simplest people make use of this figure of speech. In a similar manner, death is called the wages of sin. Now death is not really a premium that God has put on sin. Again, the Lord, we are told in Matthew 24, 51, will appoint to the evil servant his portion with the hypocrites, where there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Hence, it cannot be established from Romans 3.27 that the gospel is a preaching unto repentance. Only a person who is not conversant with rhetoric will cite this passage for proof. Among the requirements for a proper understanding of Holy Scripture are the rules of rhetoric, for Scripture is quite rhetorical and full of tropes. Quenstedt says, Properly speaking, and in contrast with the law, the gospel is not a doctrine that enjoins upon men inherent righteousness, of which faith regarded as a work is either a part or a disposition for it but it proclaims the gracious forgiveness of sin and the righteousness that is valid in the sight of god as something that is to be accepted by faith as the receiving organ for this reason the gospel is called the ministration of righteousness second corinthians three nine another objection is raised on the basis of romans ten sixteen they have not all obeyed the gospel it is argued that since it is really the law which enjoins obedience the gospel is not merely a message of joy but an improved law however it is an utter perversion of this text to try to prove from it that the gospel in the strict sense is a preaching unto repentance we are to obey the will of god not only as expressed in the law but also his gracious will but the latter is not a will of the law by his gracious will, God offers and gives us all things. If we accept what he gives, we are said to obey him. It is an act of kindness on God's part to call it obedience. And indeed, when we do obey him thus, we are also fulfilling the first commandment, for faith is commanded in the law, not in the gospel. The law is called glad tidings, but glad tidings cannot be anything that imposes a task on me which I am to perform. Only those tidings are good tidings, which tell me to put away all fear, because God is gracious by advancing to meet me. Gerhard writes, The accusation of unbelief belongs to the law, as illuminated by the light of the gospel. Luther takes cognizance of this fact when he says that the work of believing in Christ and the contrary sin of unbelief are related to the first commandment, locus de evangelii, Paragraph 111. We have previously noted that Luther speaks of faith as a return to the first commandment. To accept the grace of God as soon as it is offered to me, to take comfort in it, to thank God for it, and not to be so insolent as to try to achieve by one's own effort what the Father in heaven is offering by grace, 
That is the sublimest way of fulfilling the first commandment. Hear the testimony from Luther's Preface to the New Testament, St. Louis edition 14, pages 85 through 90. As the Old Testament is a book in which have been recorded the law and commandments of God, together with the history both of those who kept them and those who did not keep them, so the New Testament is a book in which have been recorded the gospel and the promises of God, together with the history of those who believed them and those who did not believe them. For the term gospel is a Greek term. Its German meaning is a goodly message, glad tidings, good news, a good report of which men speak and sing in cheerful strains. As, for instance, when David had conquered the great Goliath, a good report, or the good news, circulated among the Jewish people that their worst enemy was slain, and that they had been delivered and restored to happiness and peace. So the gospel of God and the New Testament are glad tidings and report, which were spread throughout the world by the apostles, concerning one who was a true David, fighting against sin, death, and the devil, and conquering them, and by his victory redeeming, justifying, quickening, saving, and restoring to peace with God all those who were in bondage under sin, tormented by death, and overcome by the devil, and causing them to sing, thank, and praise God, and rejoice forever, provided they firmly believe it, and remain steadfast in this faith. This report and comforting message, these divine evangelical glad tidings, are also called a New Testament, because, as in a testament by which a dying person disposes of his goods, and orders them to be distributed among his appointed heirs after his death, Christ, prior to his death, has given command and directions to proclaim this gospel throughout the world after his death, therewith bestowing upon believers, as their possession, all his goods, to wit, his life, by which he has swallowed up death, his righteousness, by which he has wiped out sin, and his salvation, by which he has defeated eternal damnation. Now a poor human being that is dead in sins and consigned to hell cannot be told anything more precious than this blessed, lovely message concerning Christ. If he believes that it is true, he must rejoice in his heart of hearts and be glad. The gospel, then, is nothing else than preaching concerning Christ, the Son of God and David's Son, true God and man, who by his death and resurrection has overcome sin, death, and hell for all those who believe in him. Accordingly, the gospel may be set forth in a brief or in a long statement by various writers. An extensive account is given by the four evangelists, who recount many works and words of Christ. A brief account is given, for instance, by Peter and Paul, who do not describe the activities of Christ, but indicate briefly how he, by his death and resurrection, has conquered death and hell for those who believe in him. See, then, that you do not make Christ a new Moses, or his gospel a book of law or instruction, as has been done heretofore in some prefaces that have been written to the New Testament, also by St. Jerome. For the gospel properly so called does not require our works for making us godly and saving us. Yea, it abominates our works. On the contrary, it demands that we believe in Christ, namely, that he has conquered sin, death, and hell for us, and makes us godly, quickens us, and saves us, not by our works, but by his works, and his suffering and dying, so that we may appropriate his death and victory as if we had achieved it ourselves. The many commandments and instructions, however, and the expositions of the law which Christ in the gospel and also St. Peter and Paul have given, are to be received like all other works and blessings of Christ. Knowing the works and history of Christ is not yet knowing the true gospel, for that does not embrace the knowledge that he has conquered sin, death, and the devil. Even so, knowing the doctrine and commandments recorded in the New Testament is not yet knowing the gospel. But this is the gospel. When you hear the voice which tells you that Christ is your own with his life, teaching, works, his dying, his rising from death, and everything that he is, has, does, and is able to do. Accordingly, we see that he is not compelling men, but invites them with kind words, 
saying, Blessed are the poor, and so forth. The apostles use terms like these, I exhort, I beseech, I pray you, all of which shows that the gospel is not a law book, but, properly speaking, a sermon concerning the blessings of Christ, given us to have as our own if we believe. Moses, however, in his writings, drives, compels, threatens, beats, and chastises men in a horrible fashion, for he is a writer and enforcer of the law. That is the reason why no law is given to believers to make them righteous in the sight of God, as St. Paul says, 1 Timothy 1, nine. For the believer is made righteous, is quickened, and is saved by Christ. Nothing is required of him but that he manifest his faith by his works. Indeed, when there is faith, it cannot be restrained. It manifests itself. It breaks forth in good works. It confesses and teaches the gospel publicly and risks its life in so doing. All that a believer does during his life is made to tend to the advantage of his fellow man and their aid. Not only that his fellow man may obtain the grace of the gospel, but also that he follows the example of Christ and sacrifice his life, possessions, and honor for others as Christ has done for him. That is what Christ means when, in the end of his life, he gave his apostles no other commandment than this, that they love one another, telling them that thereby men would see who were his disciples and sincere believers. For faith, unless it breaks forth in works of love, is not genuine, and in such persons the gospel has not yet taken root, nor have they come to know Christ aright. Here we have Luther's introduction to the New Testament. It is quite brief, but of much greater value than that of modern scholars, the majority of whom have made it their aim to tear down the foundation of faith by making the Bible unreliable. Note the salient points in the citation from Luther. Luther admits that when the term gospel is used in a synecdochical sense, it may, in certain passages, reprove men's sins. But it is a remarkable fact that while the term law is frequently used so as to include the gospel, the term gospel is never used in the place of the law. Nor will you find in all the scriptures a passage in which the term law can be substituted for the gospel in the strict sense. What Luther says in definition of the gospel in the strict sense should make you extremely careful not to mingle any elements of the law into your statements regarding the gospel. You must proclaim the law forcefully. Your pulpit must reverberate with its thunder and lightning. But the moment you begin to speak of the gospel, the law must be hushed. Moses set up a barrier around Mount Sinai, but Christ and the apostles placed no barrier around Golgotha. Here everybody is accorded free access. The person approaching the God of the law must be righteous. The person approaching the reconciling God on Golgotha may come just as he is. Yea, he is welcome for the very reason that he is a sinner, if he will but come. According to Luther's description of the gospel as the last will and testament of Christ, the gospel is not a doctrine teaching us how we are to make ourselves worthy in the sight of God, but what we are to receive from God. Luther occasionally uses this expression, that objectively every person is already righteous in the sight of God because of the living and dying of Christ in his stead. When God justifies an individual by offering him the gospel, and the individual refuses to accept it, he is indeed not justified, but is and remains a condemned sinner. To such a person the chief torment of hell will be the fact that he knows, I was redeemed, I was reconciled to God, I was righteous, but because I would not believe it, I am now in this place of torment. The joyful message which you are to bring to your people is this, you are redeemed, you are reconciled to God, you have been made righteous, you are a blessed people. Salvation has been acquired also for you. Do but believe it. Of what use would it be if someone were to offer you millions, holding them out to you, and you would not deem it worth while to extend your hand and take them? You would still remain beggars until your dying day. Untold numbers of men remain in their state of condemnation in spite of the perfect redemption of Christ proclaimed to them and offered them in the gospel. 
It is indeed correctly said that the mere regarding of the gospel as a truthful record is not justifying faith. But Luther means that a person believes that what the gospel says concerns him. He who does not consider himself redeemed does not believe that the gospel is true. The gospel is God's message to every individual throughout the world, telling him, You have been received into grace by God. God is no longer angry with you. His Son has wiped out all your sins. The only thing you need to do is accept the message. Adopt this as a principle for your activity in your congregation. Always to proclaim this glad message in your pulpit, so that your congregation will rejoice at having a pastor who is a true evangelist. Do not follow your reason, which will tell you that by proclaiming the gospel to them you will make your hearers secure. It is not so. On the contrary, when the grace and glory of the gospel are truly held out to men, this rouses them, makes them joyful and therefore willing to do good works, and, as it were, kindles a heavenly fire in their hearts. This effect is inevitable. Anyone coming in contact with fire is made to glow. A person who comes in contact with the fire of divine love is made to glow with love to God and his fellow man. It goes without saying that the gospel must be continually preached, lest the hearers become surfeited, so that the gospel does not benefit them. You may be assured that the Lutheran Church is distinct from all others by the fact that it preaches a perfect redemption, and hence does not represent faith as a work, but merely as the receiving hand by which the sinner accepts the gifts of God. Furthermore, that it invites all sinners who are alarmed over their sins, no matter how abominable their conduct may have been, to come, for all things are ready for them. The reason why our church has also the true doctrine of the sacraments is that it teaches the true doctrine of salvation by grace alone. Luther says the gospel is not a law book, not even a book of instruction, but a message of joy. Men cannot rejoice over it too soon, and their joy, whenever it enters their hearts, is a heavenly, divine joy. If a person constantly complains that he cannot see in what way he is to be benefited by the gospel, and if the preaching of the gospel leaves his heart empty, he has no one to blame but himself and his refusal to believe. As to Jerome, who next to Origen was the greatest linguist of the early centuries of the Christian church, Luther was very much loath to read his writings because there was precious little of the gospel in them. When David had slain Goliath, all that the children of Israel had to do was to make use of their liberty. After the defeat of their leader, the enemies had fled. Christ has conquered our enemies and done everything to set us entirely free. We have no more to do than the Israelites when David returned victorious from his conflict. They were no longer to be afraid of a defeated host. We are, likewise, no longer to be afraid of the law, sin, death, the devil, and eternal perdition. All these were our enemies, and they have been put to flight. To continue fearing them is a reproach to Christ which incites God to anger. If I believe God to be angry with me, I certainly have an angry God. If I believe him to be kind to me, I have a kind God, and need not vex my mind with doubts whether, after all, he may not be angry with me. Whenever Luther spoke of the gospel as preaching repentance and the wrath of God, he was far from referring to the gospel in the strict sense. The citation which you have heard shows you how he speaks whenever he refers to the gospel in the strict and proper sense. He wrote that preface in a time of his first love, in 1522, and reiterated and augmented it in 1527. His whole discourse is glowing with such ardent love that a poor sinner on hearing this testimony feels like leaping for joy. True, a slave of sin who is wallowing in his filth does not relish this soul food. He is like the well-known beast that prefers acorns to anything else. In Lutheran congregations, the gospel, these truly precious tidings, must be preached, and the entire congregation must be pervaded by the gospel spirit. If that is the case, 
The people are not continually put in terror by the law, but are made glad by the gospel. When we preach the law, it is not to make men saints, but sinners. When Luther speaks of the manifestation of faith by works, we must bear in mind that works are not necessary per se. In God's estimate they are not necessary at all for our salvation, but they are necessary on men's account, in order that they may see a Christian exercising his faith by means of them, may praise the Father which is in heaven, and accept him as their God. We should test our own faith by these remarks of Luther. Faith cannot be shut in. It is like a sea that can be tapped. It rushes irresistibly through any proper opening that is made for it. A believer is ready to serve everybody, whenever he can. He cannot but profess the gospel before men, even though he foresees that he will reap nothing but ridicule and scorn for it. Yea, he is ready also to give his life for the gospel. He knows that if he refuses to do these things, he will have to forsake Christ and that if he denies Christ, the light of faith will be extinguished in him. Accordingly, he confesses Christ not merely because Christ has said, Whosoever shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven, Matthew 10.32, but because he cannot do otherwise. Let us now take up the Bible passages which refer to the gospel in the strict sense, and learn by what marks we may know them. There are five marks. One, whenever the gospel is contrasted with the law, it is quite certain that the term gospel does not refer to the gospel in the wide, but in the narrow sense. Ephesians 2, 14-17, we read, He is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having established in his flesh the enmity even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace by the gospel unto you which were afar off, and to them which were nigh. According to this text, the preaching of the law, which does not bring peace, precedes and is followed by the gospel, which brings peace. 2. Whenever the gospel is presented as the peculiar teaching of Christ, or as the doctrine that proclaims Christ, it cannot refer to the law at the same time. For we read John 1.17, The law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ did not first publish the law, but he purged the law from the false interpretations of the Pharisees, because the proper knowledge of the law is necessary before a person is able to accept the gospel. Luke 4, 18-19, the Lord says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. In this text, the Lord Jesus sets forth his mission to the world. The real object of his preaching is Christ, the Savior of the world. He concluded the foregoing statement by saying, verse 21, This day is the scripture fulfilled in your ears. He had not spoken to his audience a word concerning the law, but had only referred to the doctrine that is offered to the poor, the sick, those of a bruised heart, and those in bondage of sin and the devil. Acts 17.18 we read, Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him. And some said, What will this babbler say othersome? He seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods, because he preached unto them the gospel concerning Jesus and the resurrection. The doctrine which has Jesus for its subject is the gospel in the strict sense. Under this head belong also the following passages. 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4 Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, 
by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Romans 16, 25-26 now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel, and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest, and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandments of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. Galatians 1, 6-7 I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. 3. Whenever poor sinners are named as the subject to whom the gospel is addressed, you may be certain that the reference is to the gospel in the strict sense. Matthew 11.5 the poor have the gospel preached to them. Luke 4.18 The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. 4. Whenever forgiveness of sins, righteousness, and salvation by grace are named as effects of the gospel, the reference is to the gospel in the strict sense. Romans 1.16 I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation, to every one that believeth. Ephesians 1.13 In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. 5. When faith is named as the correlate of the gospel, the reference is to the gospel in the strict sense. Mark 1.15 Repent ye and believe the gospel. Mark 16.15-16 Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Also the passage cited last certainly refers to the gospel in the strict sense. The remarks of the Lord about unbelievers who shall be damned are not indeed a part of the gospel, but law. The Lord adds these remarks in order to let those who reject the gospel know that by their unbelief they are doing that which will hurl them into perdition. End of Lecture 27Twenty-eighth Evening Lecture, May 15, 1885 Preparing to write a sermon which he is to deliver from his pulpit, a minister should approach this task every time with fear and trembling, that is, with a reverent concern that he preach nothing contrary to the word of God. He must most carefully examine everything that he has written down to see whether it is in harmony with the word of God and the experience of Christians. He should weigh everything that he is to speak in public in the scales of the sanctuary for weighing gold, to see whether it agrees with the writings of the apostles and prophets. A preacher, after writing a few paragraphs, may be impressed with the beauty and power of what he has written, and think that he has succeeded well in his effort, yet he must not allow that impression to delude him, but he ought carefully once more to go over the very passages which seem so beautiful to him, to see whether they contain anything that is false or that has been expressed in such a manner as to be liable to be misunderstood and to arouse false conceptions to his hearers. As soon as he notices something of this kind, he must be stern, yea, cruel against himself, and draw a heavy black line through the beautiful periods, even if he has bestowed much time and labor upon them. Those periods represent labor lost, because they were merely the product of his genius, not of a clear knowledge drawn from the word of God. Indeed, a preacher may discover with considerable alarm that an entire part of his sermon, or even the entire sermon, has turned out altogether wrong. In a case like that, he must not say that he cannot afford to have spent so much labor in vain. 
If the product has turned out wrong, it must be cashiered. There are no two ways about this. If he has no time to write a new sermon, he had better speak rather extempore than deliver what he has laboriously composed. If a minister who is otherwise conscientious has had the misfortune of putting something into his manuscript that is wrong, and even saying it from the pulpit, he must, if he notices his mistake while preaching, immediately correct himself, and tell his hearers that he really did not mean to say what they had just heard from him. If he notices his mistake later, and the matter is of considerable importance, he must make the correction later, lest his hearers be led utterly astray. Yea, he may not only have to correct his wrong statement, but solemnly to revoke it. That will not lower him in the esteem of his listeners. On the contrary, his conscientiousness, striving for accuracy, will rather impress them favorably. He must not rely on the ability of his hearers to give the correct interpretation to incorrect statements of his, but must speak so as not to be misunderstood in what he says. For this reason the Apostle addresses this warning to all preachers. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? 1 Corinthians 5, 6. Compare Galatians 5, 9. False teaching is a leaven, yea, we might say, a poison, that will penetrate every artery and kill a person. It is a fact experienced every day that a little poison produces awful effects. It may prove fatal to a person, while a whole piece of arsenic may be swallowed without injury because it becomes enwrapped in saliva. Unspeakably great damage can be caused by one false sentence spoken in a sermon. For instance, the preacher may administer an unwarranted reproof that is taken up by godly, conscientious Christians who are full of concern about their soul and are working out their salvation with fear and trembling. When such sincere Christians observe in themselves something that the preacher has marked as a fault, and as something by which men may forfeit divine grace, they may become uncertain of their state of grace, and imagine that they dare not believe that they will be saved. In a case like this, the preacher must not think that by talking on the same topic in a different strain on some future Sunday he will have furnished the needed corrective. For the greater the confidence which his hearers have in his orthodoxy, his genuine Christianity, and his great experience, the greater will be their difficulty in plucking out of their hearts the arrow which he has shot into them by his unwarranted rebuke. Again, on an occasion when he should have administered a rebuke, he may have offered false comfort to the delight of all false Christians who disregard all the rest of his sermon, and lay hold of only that part which permits them to regard themselves as good Christians when they are anything but that. Is it not an awful condition for a carnally secure person to get into and remain in his blindness until the final summons consigns him to eternal perdition? Mistakes like these may happen even to sincere pastors. In a moment of inattention, he is not on his guard and does not pray while he is writing his sermon. God may permit him to rely on his own strength in order to make him see the sorry results which he has achieved without prayer. Imagine the anguish of a minister, who has to blame himself when he sees some parishioner of his walking in a wrong path. Every one of your sermons must be the product of heartfelt prayer. When you sit down to the task of writing your sermon and feel that you are distracted, cold, and dead, you must not think, that cannot be helped, I must fill this page. No, lay your pen aside, call earnestly upon your Father in heaven to lift you out of your miserable state of mind, to give you a fervent heart, to overcome everything in you that is not godly, to let the breath of His Holy Spirit enter your heart, and you will be able to do more than merely write down words of comfort, whose import you do not at all feel, and which leave your own heart cheerless. You will not indulge in the futile thought that all is well with regard to your sermon, since you are only repeating what is in the Bible. Your most serious purpose while preparing your sermon will be to find a way of making a goodly haul with the gospel net. Ministers are at fault in this respect more than we imagine. Some of them waste much time during the week, being occupied not with godless affairs to be sure, yet not with the one thing needful. Sunday comes, and standing in their pulpits they are unprepared to give their people the best that is in them. 
their hearers get the impression that they merely recite something because they have to, without being concerned about whether their hearers are helped by what they offer them. That is awful. The time you spend in the pulpit is most valuable. It may determine the well-being, here and hereafter, of many thousands of people. Pity the preacher who does not redeem that time by offering his hearers the very best that he is able to give. He will, unless he is in tribulation, cheerfully resolve to preach this or that truth because he is convinced that his hearers will, by the testimony of the Holy Spirit, be impressed if they do not harden themselves against it. I said, unless he is in tribulation. For what can a preacher accomplish if he has no confidence in what he preaches? In times of tribulation a faithful preacher is tempted to tear up the sermon he has written. By painful experiences like these God means to humble him. But the normal condition of a preacher, after struggling and wrestling with God during the preparation of his sermon, is one of confidence. He is certain that he has a sermon to offer which will bring souls to Christ as surely as the right bait and good angling of a skilled fisherman will catch fish. If a preacher talks without plan or purpose, he need not wonder that he does not achieve his aim, for he has none. Out with ministers and students, preparing for the ministry who go to work in a slovenly and careless manner, jotting down and reciting anything that comes into their mind, flows into their pen, and somehow leaps from their lips. That, as a rule, is what happens when the preacher extemporizes. Here I have in mind not only such as have plagiarized their entire sermon, but also those who have not adequately meditated upon the subject they intend to present to their hearers. Some preachers cannot speak with any degree of self-assurance if they have not meditated their sermon. After thorough meditation, their flow of words is much better. There is a difference, too, between good judgment and genius. I am even inclined to say that a preacher must gradually become independent of his manuscript, and thus give the Holy Spirit a chance to lay hold of him and suggest thoughts and words to him which had not come to him before. The Apostle Paul writes, 2 Timothy 2.15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The matter of paramount importance in a sermon, then, is rightly to divide the law and the gospel. Thesis 16. In the twelfth place, the word of God is not rightly divided when the preacher tries to make people believe that they are truly converted as soon as they have become rid of certain vices and engage in certain works of piety and virtuous practices. The great importance of this thesis becomes apparent when you reflect that a worse commingling of law and gospel than that which is censured in this thesis is not possible. Woe to the minister who, by his manner of preaching, leads his hearers to imagine that they are good Christians if they have ceased robbing and stealing, and that by and by they will get rid of any weakness still remaining in them. They turn the gospel into law, because they represent conversion as a work of man, while genuine conversion which produces a living faith in a person is affected only by the gospel. This grossest form of commingling law and gospel is the most grievous fault of rationalists. The essence of their religion is to teach men that they become different beings by putting away their vices and leading a virtuous life, while the word of God teaches us that we must become different men first, and then we shall put away our particular sins and begin to exercise ourselves in good works. The doctrine which proposes to make men godly by their own works is the doctrine of pagans, reformed Jews, and Turks. It proposes to empty a great river of iniquity by continually dipping up pails of water from it and expecting to reach the bottom some time. If a river of iniquity is to be dried up, the evil source from which it springs must first be stopped up, and then pure water can be led into it. Rationalists love to cite the well-known saying, Genuine repentance is to quit doing what you have been doing. The saying can be used in a right sense, and has been so used by our forefathers. They meant to say, You people who boast of having the right faith while you lead wicked lives, hush your prating about faith. Quitting what you have been doing, that is genuine repentance. The meaning which rationalists connect with this saying is this. Do not worry. What God requires of a true Christian is that he quit doing what he has been doing. That is genuine repentance. 
That is the abominable teaching of moralists. The Christian religion gives us the correct teaching in one word, metanoieta, which means change your mind, or, as Luther translates correctly, repent. If he had rendered this word etymologically, in accordance with its derivation, he would have amazed his readers. With this word the Lord confronts the sinner, telling him that, first of all, a change of his innermost self must take place. What he requires is a new mind, a new heart, a new spirit, not quitting vice and doing good works. By making this the primary requisite for being a Christian, he puts the axe to the root of the evil tree. Rationalism and Romanism prune the noxious tree, but for every branch which they cut off, new branches sprout forth, all of them still noxious. A tree of this kind must be grafted. Sound branches must be inserted into it if it is to bear different fruit. In proof of what I have said, let me submit a few Bible texts. John 3.3. 3. We read, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus had approached the Lord with the statement, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. He expects, of course, that the Lord will be pleased with such a statement from a Pharisee, and will say to him, That is excellent, continue as you have begun. But not a word of this. Jesus slams the door of heaven shut in Nicodemus's face, and practically says to him, I see you wish to curry favor with me by flattery. But if you are still in your old mind, you cannot enter heaven. You will have to become a different being. You will have to be born again. Now Nicodemus reveals his mind by exclaiming, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? But the Lord repeats his previous statement and enlarges upon it. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. The Lord meant to say, All that you undertake to do while still in your carnal nature is sin. You must become spiritual before genuine spiritual fruits will begin to show themselves in your life. Matthew 12.33 we read, Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and its fruit corrupt, for the tree is known by its fruits. Plant a good tree and it will bear good fruit. Plant a corrupt tree and it will bear corrupt fruit. This means, unless a person is completely changed, unless he has become a new creature, has been born anew with a new mind, all his doings will be corrupt fruit, for by nature every man is a corrupt tree. Matthew 15.13, our Lord says, Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted will be rooted up. Those works only which God has wrought are good. Any work which a person has produced by the power of his reason and natural will is a plant that will have to be rooted up. God will not recognize it but demand that it be removed out of his sight as a sin and an abomination, because it has sprung from a corrupt heart, a heart that cares nothing for God. It is polluted water flowing from a stinking fountain. True Christians know full well, and need not be told that this is so. No matter what they do, even if it be ever so beautiful a performance, they are aware that it was not right, since they did not do it from love of God and their fellow men, but in a mechanical fashion, or because they wish to show off their Christianity. A Christian is quick to discern whether any work of his has been planted by God or by Adam. Any person still unable to discern this may know that he has not yet experienced metanoia, a change of heart, and that the Holy Spirit is not yet in him. The moment the Holy Spirit has entered into him, he cannot do a thing because he wishes to comply with the demand of the law. But the Spirit will promptly inform him that the deed is worthless. He may give someone a thousand dollars, and the Spirit will urge him immediately to examine himself whether or not he was prompted toward his generous act of love 
by God or his fellow man. If not, he will be told that his deed is worthless in the sight of God, nothing but sham, and that the blessing of God does not rest upon it. Jeremiah writes, chapter 3, verse 4, Thus saith the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, Break up your fallow ground, and sow not among thorns. A remarkable declaration. We know its meaning well enough. Sowing wheat into ungrubbed land, soil still covered with brushwood, will not yield a harvest worth while. We must first clear the ground, remove all scrub growth, cut down the trees, or at least thin the forest sufficiently to give the sprouting seed the necessary air. That is a picturesque description of conversion. A person must first be given a new heart in conversion, and into this new heart the seed of every good work may then be sown. 1 Corinthians 13.3, the Apostle says, Though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profits me nothing. This remarkable passage has a peculiar bearing on our thesis. What is all important are not the works themselves, but the love from which they proceed. I may be so abjectly poor that I am not able to do anything, and yet, in God's estimate, I may abound in good works if, while I am suffering poverty according to the will of God, love awakens in me the desire to do good unto all men. God takes the will for the deed. All depends on our inward love, not on our external works. Before his conversion, Paul was, as touching the law, without reproach. Nobody could prefer a charge against him. Still, he declared all his old righteousness to be done. This does not apply to his really good works, for concerning them, he says that he will receive a great reward of mercy for them. Romans 14.23, Paul says, Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. This momentous statement corroborates the declaration of the Apostle quoted above that even surrendering one's body to the flames is worthless if the act does not spring from love, hence from faith. For love does not enter a person's heart except through faith. How blind, then, must the preacher be who proposes to make men godly by urging them to do good works? A person must first become godly before he can perform good works. Even believing pastors may, without being aware of it, slip into a horrible commingling of law and gospel, not so much in their sermons as in their private ministrations, and in the exercise of church discipline. Many pastors and congregations make mistakes in applying church discipline. They may be dealing with a drunkard who readily professes sorrow over his sins, as these people usually do. An inexperienced minister is easily deceived by such a profession. The drunkard may be suspended from church membership and placed under surveillance for three months. Presently, some brother brings the good news that the drunkard has kept himself sober all that time, and the minister decides that the drunkard is now converted. Well, in reality, he is still quite a godless person. Beware of being deceived thus. The same may happen when a habitually profane person who has been admonished by the congregation quits cursing for a while. Or take the case of a person who is negligent in church attendance, who therefore certainly is not a Christian. After he has been brought before the congregation, he may come to church for several successive Sundays. But does this outward act alone make him a Christian? By no means. Any godless person is able to do what such a one is doing. The aforementioned persons must be made to realize that no Christian acts like them. If he does, he cannot possibly be in a state of grace but it requires labor on the part of the minister till these persons are reborn by the word of God. If he is unwilling to perform this labor, he neglects the souls of such persons. Or take the case of tardy communicants who will come to the sacrament once again after the minister has reproved them. If he is satisfied with that, he is guilty of commingling law and gospel. Or take the sin of avarice. A congregation may be so stingy as to refuse to take up a collection. It may fail to pay the pastor his salary. In that case, the pastor must not resolve to preach to his people a sharp sermon in order to open their purses. Opening purses by means of the law is no achievement at all. 
he must preach in a manner that will rouse them out of their spiritual sleep and death. If he does not do that, he falls under the censure of our sixteenth thesis. On John 3.3, 3, which I just cited, Luther comments as follows, St. Louis edition, 7, page 1854. Our doctrine, then, denounces all works as worthless and futile if the person doing them has not been born again. Mark you, this is not pietism, as some orthodox preachers falsely termed it, but Christianism. For this reason we consider this the principal part of the instruction which people must be given regarding the new birth. They must first be told that they are spiritually dead, and that any good that may be in their way of living, their monastic order, their fasting, and any other practice, will not help them a whit to obtain forgiveness of sins, until they are born again and made new creatures. Remember, if you do not tell your people this truth, if you do not wield this trusty weapon in your ministry, you will gather about you a congregation of none but legalistic Pharisees. Let us now hear what this new birth must be like. We base our teaching concerning it on the fact that Christ twice affirms it by oath, saying, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, and so forth. He means to say, you must not imagine, Nicodemus, that you will be saved because you are an honest, pious man. True, we are to lead an honest, decent, and peaceable life in this world. If we fail to live thus, Master Hans the hangman will come along with his sword and noose and will enforce the commandments which you have broken by putting you where you can no longer break them, thus teaching you that if you will not obey you will have to suffer. But your good works are worthless when you begin to put this estimate on them, that they are to earn heaven for you. For these works, this godly conduct, gain for you merely a proper living here in time, and keep you out of the executioner's hand and from the gallows, or from being expelled from your house and home, and being separated from your wife and children. Thus, the fact that you are an honorable citizen of Jerusalem secures you life, honor, and distinction in this city. But if you wish to get to heaven, and into the church and kingdom of Christ, you must understand that you will have to become a new man. You must consider yourself an unborn infant who is not only unable to do a single good work, but has not even attained to life and being as yet. That is what Christians preach. The Christian doctrine teaches us that we must first become different people, that is, we must be born again. How is this done? By the Holy Spirit and by the water of baptism. After I have been born again, and have been made godly and God-fearing, I begin a new life, and what I do now in my regenerate state is good. If Adam had remained in the state of innocence in which he had been created, he could have spent his whole life doing anything he pleased, fishing for trout, catching robins, or planting trees. All his doings would have been good and holy works, and there would have been no sin in them. Eve would have nursed and tended her babies, and her works, too, would have been altogether precious and good. For her person had been created good, upright, pure, and holy, and hence all her works, her eating and drinking, and everything would have been right and good. But now that man has strayed into sin and fallen from his first estate, nothing that he does is good. He sins in all that he does, even when he prays, for he does everything as a sinner. Whatever he does is wrong, even when he fasts and prays, leads the strict life of a Carthusian, puts on a monk's garb and goes barefoot. All these things are sin because the person is evil, not having been born again, and nothing that such a person does avails him before God. Accordingly, Christ tells Nicodemus practically this, I am come to preach a different doctrine about the way how to become good. You must be born again. This doctrine has been written into the Scripture aforetime, but you do not read it. Or if you read it, you do not understand it. To wit, that in order to do good works, a person must be born again. For sinners, being corrupt themselves, cannot but beget more sinners. Matthew 7, the Lord says, If the tree is corrupt, it does not bear good fruit. Thistles do not bear figs, nor thorns 
grapes. Luther insists that in a regenerate person everything that he does is God's work. Even when he treats himself to a hearty meal, eats or sleeps, he is doing a good work. Not only when he engages in hard labor. A servant of the law may slave and slave, but all his activities are a martyrdom that is preparing him for perdition. A Christian has the right mind in all he does. Therefore all his actions are God-pleasing. From a pure fountain nothing but good, sweet water can flow. Luther's reference to the monastic life in this connection means that when a monk became a believer, all his doings, also his wearing of a friar's cloak, became good, because he was then acting from a right motive, being convinced that God wished him to serve in his calling. Also the Old Testament is full of this teaching, that men must obtain a new heart and a new spirit, that their hearts must be circumcised before they can be acceptable to God. The gist of all this teaching is that Christ wants to make us godly from the root upward. Let me give you another testimony of Luther from his sermon on the liberty of a Christian man, of the year 1520. This is the treatise which Luther dedicated to the Pope. He undertook to enlighten the Pope and told him the truth in an amazing fashion. Luther, you know, was not afraid of men, not even of the devil. During his exile at the Wartburg, he was one day startled by a terrible racket, as if a hundred thousand barrels were being hurled downstairs. He exclaimed, What is the matter? But checked himself immediately, saying, Ah, it's you, devil. If I had known that, I should not even have stepped out of my room. Any other person would have been seized with a deadly fright in the thought that he was being harassed by the devil, but Luther treated the devil with contempt knowing that he is a haughty spirit to whom nothing is more intolerable than contempt. Luther writes, St. Louis edition 19, page 1003 and following, Good and pious works never produce a good and pious person, but a good and pious person produces good and pious works. In every instance the person must first be good and pious before he can do any good work. Good works follow and proceed from a pious and good person. As Christ says, Matthew 7.18, A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Now it is evident that fruits do not bear the tree, nor does the tree grow on the fruit, but the reverse. Trees bear fruits, and fruits grow on trees. As there must be trees before there can be fruits, and as the fruits do not make the tree either good or corrupt, but the tree produces the fruits, even so man must first be either good or corrupt, before he does good or corrupt works. His works do not make him either good or corrupt, but he does either good or corrupt works. We observe this in all the crafts. A good or a bad house does not make a good or a bad carpenter but a good or bad carpenter builds a good or bad house no work produces a master corresponding to it but as the master so his work man's works come under the same rule according as a man is either a believer or an unbeliever his works are either good or evil not vice versa so that he would be godly and a believer according to his works since works do not make men believers they do not make him godly either but faith, which makes men godly, likewise produces good works. These are matters which are readily understood by us now. But before Luther could sing a song like this, he had to pass through many severe conflicts. It is surprising that as early as 1520 he was able to picture the relation of works to faith as he does in the passage which I have cited. End of Lecture 28「Lecture 29 of the Proper Distinction Between Law and Gospel」by C. F. W. Walter, translated by W. H. T. Dow. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Twenty-ninth Evening Lecture, May 29, 1885 Without question, the words which in Revelation 3, 15, and 16 Christ addressed to the bishop of the church at Laodicea 
are of a memorable and awful import. He said, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. We see from these words that in the infallible judgment of God it is worse to be a lukewarm than a cold minister. It is worse to be a lazy and indifferent minister, who serves in his office because it is the profession in which he is making his living, than to be manifestly ungodly. For when a minister, though not teaching or living in a plainly unchristian manner, is so sleepy, so void of all earnestness and zeal for the kingdom of God and the salvation of souls, the inevitable effect is that the poor souls of his parish become infected by him, and finally the entire congregation is lulled into spiritual sleep. On the other hand, when a minister leads a manifestly ungodly life and teaches ungodly doctrine, the good souls in his congregation do not follow, but turn away from him with loathing. Now, although greater damage is inflicted on the church by the lukewarmness of a minister than by his manifest ungodliness, Still, both kinds of ministers will at the end of the world receive the same sentence. Both the lukewarm and the cold minister will be addressed with those awful words, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Matthew 7.23 A faithful servant of Jesus Christ, however, will one day hear himself addressed in these words of inexpressibly glad import. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Matthew twenty five twenty one. A faithful minister must not only avoid being lukewarm or cold, he must be warm. His heart must glow with love of his Saviour Jesus, and of the congregation which his Saviour has entrusted to his care, so that he may be able to say with Paul and all the apostles, Whether we be beside ourselves, it is to God. Second Corinthians 5.13 this is a strange dictum. Paul says that a minister must manifest greater earnestness and zeal than the majority of his members in his congregation may like or approve. The apostle does not mean to say that in his ministry at Corinth he displayed zeal without knowledge, Romans 10.2, but that he was more zealous than the Corinthians desired. Every sincere preacher and minister of Jesus Christ shows himself full of zeal and earnest determination though he may not reap any better reward from his congregation than unpopularity, hatred, and enmity. A sincere minister will go through such experiences rather than gain any one for himself by hushing the truth, veiling it, or grinding down its sharp points. It is an undeniable fact, then, my friends, that a minister, in particular a really zealous minister, has to take his ministry seriously, or he commits grievous sin. However, he can commit a grievous sin also when his presentation of Christianity and the demands which he makes upon Christians are in excess of what the Word of God declares. With this reflection we have arrived at our seventeenth thesis. Thesis 17. In the thirteenth place, the Word of God is not rightly divided when a description is given of faith, both as regards its strength and the consciousness and productiveness of it, that does not fit all believers at all times. Young ministers who are still without great experience frequently make this mistake. They desire to make an impression on their people and rouse them out of their natural security. They imagine that, in order to prevent hypocrites from regarding themselves as Christians, they cannot raise the demands which they make upon those who are Christians too high. However, here is a point where the minister must be careful not to go beyond the word of God, or, by reason of his zeal, he will inflict awful harm on the souls of his hearers. Alas, Christians are in many respects quite different from the descriptions, bona fide descriptions at that, which are given of them in sermons. The minister wants to rouse his people and warn them against self-deception. However, that cannot be his ultimate aim. His ultimate aim must be to lead his hearers to the assurance that they have forgiveness of sins with God, the hope of the future blessed life, and confidence to meet death cheerfully. Any one who does not make these things his ultimate aim is not an evangelical minister. For this reason he must be careful, for God's sake, not to say, Any one who does this or that is not a Christian. 
unless he is quite sure of his ground. Frequently, a Christian may act in a very unchristian manner. Romans 7.18 Paul says, I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. It is plain that in this passage the Apostle describes a Christian. How a person becomes a Christian he has described before. Next, he proceeded to show how a Christian ought to walk and to please God. In the section of his epistle from which the above passage is taken, he begins to discuss the doctrine of spiritual tribulations in which Christians frequently are merged, in order to comfort them. He describes a Christian as a double being. The true Christian, he says, always desires what is good, but frequently he does not accomplish it. Now then, if a preacher describes a Christian in such a manner as to deny that unless he accomplishes all that is good, he does not really will what is good, the description is unbiblical. To will what is good is the main trait of a Christian. Frequently he does not progress beyond the good will to do something. Before he is aware of it, he has gone astray. The sin within him has come forth, and he is ashamed of himself. But for that reason he has not by any means fallen from grace. Romans 7.14, Paul says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. He means to say, Who would not gladly be rid of sin? As for me, I am like a slave sold to a master. I cannot get away from him. I am always being tyrannized by him. That is the condition of a Christian. He feels like a slave, with this difference, however, that he does not obey his master gladly, as a Christian slave must obey. He renders obedience with the utmost reluctance. Accordingly, the apostle cries in verse 24, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Remember this, partly for your own comfort, partly for the task of comforting the members of your future congregation. The prevailing spiritual malady of our time is lack of assurance on the part of Christians. This is because they are not given any reliable teaching. Now when a real Christian is shown what a miserable sinner he is, he clings to Christ all the more firmly, and spurns the whispering of the devil, who tells him that he has fallen from grace and has lost God. Philippians 3.12, Paul says, Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which I also am apprehended of Christ Jesus. In this life we follow after, but we do not apprehend. It may seem to a Christian that there are times when he was holier and could overcome sin better. That may actually have been the case and his present condition may be due to a spiritual retrogression. But the correct explanation of this present state may also be this, that he sees much more plainly now what a frail being he is. A young Christian may imagine that his heart at that particular moment is altogether pure, that he has forsaken the world and has heaven in his heart, but he is not aware of the ravenous beasts that lie in wait for him. When the sweet meats of his spiritual childhood cease and tribulations arise for him, he imagines that he can no longer fight against sin as he used to do. The truth is, however, that he is being attacked much more violently than before, and is more keenly aware of his sinful cravings. Galatians 5.17, the Apostle writes, The flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to another so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. According to this text, a minister has no right to denounce a person as an unchristian because he is not doing all that he should, as long as the person maintains that he does not will his imperfections. If he commits sin from weakness or in rashness, he can still be a Christian. St. James writes, chapter 3, verse 2, For in many things we offend all, if any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. He means to say that there is no such thing as a perfect man. And, by the use of the pronoun we, he includes himself, all the apostles and all the saints in this estimate. 
a Christian sins not only in thoughts, desires, gestures, and words, but also in his actions, which makes it evident to all the world that he is still a poor, weak man. Hebrews 12, 1, we read, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight, and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. According to this text, a Christian is always putting away sin, which besets him continually. He cannot get it out of his heart, and it makes him so very sluggish. His conduct would be quite different. He would walk cheerfully with his God like a hero, if he did not have to lug his carnal mind with him. Isaiah 64, 6, we read, We are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. The prophet does not say, All righteousnesses of the natural man are as filthy rags, but all our righteousnesses. Hence, in God's eyes, the life of a true Christian cannot look very beautiful. If God would not spread the cloak of Christ's righteousness over us, we should have to be eternally damned and lost, spite of the fact that we have become true Christians. A text that requires no comment is Job 14.4. Who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? Not one. Psalm 32.6 we read, For this shall every one that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found. Immediately before this text, the psalmist speaks of the forgiveness of sin. He says that it is just the genuinely godly people who need to pray every day for the forgiveness of sin. But why spend so much time searching the scriptures for proof texts? Our Savior taught all Christians to offer up this daily petition in the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our trespasses. Every day, then, puts a new burden of guilt on our heart and conscience. Now, to represent a Christian as he is not, namely perfect, one need not be a Methodist to do that, or to enunciate marks of a true Christian which are not found in all Christians, means to misrepresent a Christian, and will do infinite harm. For from such characterizations, Christians with a very live conscience will draw the conclusion that they are no Christians. The remarks of the minister, they say, have opened their eyes to their former delusion, this impression may become so firmly lodged in their hearts that nobody will be able to remove it. They torment themselves till their dying days with efforts to keep from falling into this or that sin, and still they commit it again and again. Therefore the minister must furnish Christians the proper remedy when they sin, namely this, promptly to rise from their fall, provided their sin is not intentional. For an intentional sin would indeed drive the Holy Spirit from them. But a Christian learns by experience to sense danger, and when he has sinned, he feels himself urged promptly to seek his Father in heaven, confess his sin, and ask to be forgiven for Jesus' sake. He also feels inwardly assured that he has been forgiven, and even if he has no such feeling, he will say with the poet, O oh, my faith shall e'er enfold him, till I come where I behold him, till my bridegroom calls for me. Some preachers describe the Christians as having nothing but pleasant feelings. Frequently I have observed this feature in your sermons. You will say, Indeed, an unchristian is a miserable being. While serving the world in sin, he is pursued by furies. Now, that is not true. Many unchristians live without any qualms of conscience. On the other hand, you will say, A Christian, oh, what a happy being he is! He is free from all anxiety, free from doubt, and so forth. All this is not so. Thousands upon thousands of Christians are, on the contrary, filled with anguish and despondency, and are continually fighting with themselves and crying, O oh, wretched man that I am! In your sermons you like to treat subjects like these, the blessed state of a Christian, and the like. Well, do not forget that the blessedness of Christians does not consist in pleasant feelings but in their assurance that, in spite of the bitterest feelings imaginable, they are accepted with God, and in their dying hour will be received into heaven. That is indeed a great blessedness.
you can easily make a mistake here without being aware of it. You must resolve never to utter anything that is contradictory to the experience of Christians. You must search your own minds and imagine yourselves sitting among your hearers and listening to your own sermon. Suppose you were listening to another preacher. How would his question, whether you are a Christian, alarm you, if the true state of a Christian were made contingent upon pleasant feelings, and you would have to admit that you know of no such pleasant feelings? Now, is it not an awful experience for a pastor to write a sermon in condemnation of himself, to feel that he would be deadly frightened if someone were to preach to him what he purposes to preach to others? It is, indeed, proper that in your sermons you depict the happy moments which occasionally come to Christians when they are given a foretaste of their future bliss. But you must tell your hearers at the same time that these are merely passing moments in the lives of Christians, sun rays, which once in a while find their way into their hearts. If the description of such moments of bliss is given in a proper manner, it produces neither anguish and grief, nor doubt regarding one's being in the faith, but a heartfelt longing for an experience such as the preacher is describing. Especially such Christians as have fought their fight faithfully would feel that way. They lay prostrate in their spiritual distress, and imagine that they were rejected by God, and, lo, then their heavenly Father was pleased to pour such celestial joy into their hearts that in their ecstasy they believe there were no longer on earth but in heaven. Furthermore, you must bear in mind that a Christian retains his natural temperament even after his conversion. A person with an irritable temper keeps that disposition, and it may frequently get the better of him. You must not say, then, that when a person becomes a Christian he is turned from a bear into a lamb in the sense that he is willing to take scolding and scorn from everybody and is always ready to forgive his fellow man. On the contrary, a Christian often has great trouble in keeping down his temper, and frequently he cannot control it, and nobody can quiet him. He is completely in the power of his temperament. We must not think that if this person were to die that night he would go to perdition. While a Christian who is critically inclined indulges that thought about his brother, that brother may be on his knees in his closet, pleading with God for forgiveness and for strength to subdue his wrathful temper. He may meet the Christian who has judged him so uncharitably the next morning, and sincerely ask to be forgiven for his lack of self-control. Frequently the Christian is pictured as patient as Job. The preacher will say, You may take everything away from a Christian, and he will cheerfully say, The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Job 121. And the preacher may think that his remarks have been quite biblical. Job did indeed say those words, but not all Christians say them. It is not consistent with truth to set up such a claim in a sermon. Many a Christian grows impatient in trouble. His impatience may become violent, even over trifling matters. When he spiritually comes to again, as it were, he is ashamed of himself. It cannot be said to be a criterion of a Christian that he never commits a gross sin. That does happen occasionally, but whenever this is the case, the Christian surrenders unconditionally to the word of God, even though he may not do so immediately. He may at first be so blinded by the devil that he believes he's right. Finally, however, God's word convinces him that he was wrong, and then he humbly asks forgiveness while a hypocrite persists as long as he can in the claim that he has done right. Many preachers picture the Christian as a person who does not fear death. This is a serious misrepresentation, because the great majority of Christians are afraid to die. If a Christian does not fear death and declares that he is ready to die at any time, God has bestowed a special grace upon him. Some have expressed this sentiment before their physician told them that they would not live another night, but after that they were seized with a terrible fear. Do not, for God's sake, draw a false picture of a Christian. But whenever you have drawn the picture of a Christian, see whether you can recognize yourself in that picture. Even pride in a very pronounced form can crop out in a Christian, and that is one of the worst vices, because it is a transgression of the first commandment. By nature we are all proud, only one is more and strongly inclined to that sin than another. Persons of a choleric temperament, possessing what is called a strong will and great energy, 
as a rule, have a great deal of self-confidence, and expect others to show them reverential regard, a result of abominable pride. This sin sometimes crops out even in true Christians. Observe the disciples of the Lord quarreling with one another about who was the greatest among them. If this incident had not been recorded in the Bible, we could hardly believe that the apostles quarreled like children about their superiority, and that the mother of Zebedee's sons requested that one of them be placed at the right and the other at the left hand of the Lord. From the account in Luke we gather that the disciples were ill at ease during this quarrel because they knew that their conduct was shameful and when the Lord rebuked them, they felt so deeply ashamed that they would have liked to hide themselves. Again, it is wholly incorrect and false to picture the Christian as being always fervent in prayer, and as if praying were his most cherished occupation. It is not so. It takes much struggling on the part of the Christian to make him fit for prayer, fervent in it and confident that he will really obtain from God what he is praying for. That is the reason why the Lord's Prayer, which is recited so often, has been called the greatest martyr on earth. Christians are no exception to the rule. True, if a person as a rule merely babbles the Lord's Prayer without knowing what he is saying, he is certainly not a Christian. A Christian who becomes aware of his lack of attention during prayer feels deeply humiliated, and promptly starts the Lord's Prayer over again. Though there are times when the Christian's flesh and blood are forced into the background, and they feel as if they were dissolving in happiness, as if they were in heaven and conversing with God, they nevertheless retain their natural flesh and blood. Christians are even tempted with a desire to grow rich. Merchants in particular are in great danger of turning misers. If they were not warned and admonished, they would be dragged into perdition as if caught in a snare and would be lost forever. In judging any person, it is of decisive importance to know whether he loves the word of God and his Saviour, or whether he is hardened and leads a shameful life. There are people who want to make a show of great sanctity by avoiding conversation, raising their eyes piously to heaven, citing scripture continually, and reading their Bible in leisurely hours, preferably in retirement, in order to impress people with their exemplary Christianity. By this show the heavenly prophets succeeded in deceiving good Melanchthon. We must not think that only those are true Christians who make a display of godliness. I do not assert that every one of these people is an unchristian, but I am sure that such as are wholly given to the aforementioned practices are miserable hypocrites. Read the Gospels and note how the disciples conversed with the Lord, and how they acted in His presence. They expressed their minds plainly, even John, the beloved disciple. Christ did not for that reason denounce them as unconverted, but treated them as converted people who, however, still carried a pretty vigorous portion of the old Adam with them. You may in your sermons refer to actions of strong or exceptionally faithful Christians. It will not harm your hearers to think that they have not yet attained to such a degree of faithfulness. It will rather prove an incentive to them to make better progress in their Christianity. When new members are to be received into the congregation, and you have to talk to them, you must not regard them as godless, unconverted people if they do not immediately engage in a religious conversation with you. There are people who cling to their Savior but are unable to talk much about their faith, although on other topics they may be ready talkers. Others, again, may not have much experience as regards spiritual affairs, and for this reason may not be able to say much. In conclusion, let me submit a citation from Luther's church postal. He says, St. Louis edition, 12, page 911 and following, That explains why St. Paul admonishes his Christians to such an extent as to make it appear as though he were overdoing it. For in all his epistles he is so determined about inculcating these matters upon them as if they were so stupid and ignorant, so inattentive and forgetful, that of themselves they did not know them, and would not know them, but only on being told and urged to do them. He knows that although Christians have made a beginning of faith, and are at the stage where they are to show forth the fruits of their faith, still they have not done so, nor have they finished their task. Accordingly, it will not do to think and say that it is sufficient to preach the doctrine to them, 
and that where the spirit and faith are at work the fruits of faith and good works will follow of themselves for though the spirit is present and as christ says operates in believers and makes them willing still the flesh on the other hand is also present and the flesh is always weak and tardy moreover the devil never rests but tries by tribulations and temptations to cause the christian to slip and fall because of the weakness of his flesh and so forth for this reason we must not treat our hearers as if they were in no need of being admonished and urged by god's word to lead a godly life beware of negligence and laziness in discharging this duty for the flesh is slothful enough to obey the spirit as paul says galatians five seventeen the flesh lusteth against the spirit so that you cannot do the things that ye would therefore god must act like a good and diligent manager of an estate or magistrate who has a lazy servant or slothful officials under him although in other respects they are not unfaithful or wicked such a one must not think that when he has issued one or two orders the task that he wants done is accomplished he must be continually after his workmen and urge them to do their work likewise we have not yet reached the point where our flesh and blood would be active and leap forward with sheer joy and delight to do good works and obey god such as our spirit desires and our faith demands on the contrary with all our incessant urging and prodding we can scarcely get them to move what would happen if we were to quit our admonitions and our urging and assume as many secure spirits do that everybody knows well enough what he has to do having heard his duties recited to him so many times and having even taught them to others and so forth i believe that if preaching and admonition were to cease for a year we should become worse than the worst heathen end of lecture twenty nine lecture thirty of the proper distinction between law and gospel by c f w walter translated by w h t dow this librivox recording is in the public domain thirtieth evening lecture june fifth eighteen eighty five many young men whom god has endowed with splendid gifts gifts especially suited for the office of the ministry and who even have a certain inclination toward that office nevertheless do not like to become ministers they think that in this office they would have to sacrifice their life's happiness and their freedom however this is a great self-delusion any one who wishes to be saved must be ready if christ so desires to sacrifice his life's happiness and surrender his freedom for his sake not only a minister but every christian must choose the narrow path which leads to heaven if he wants to get to heaven he must forsake the world fight against his flesh and crucify it and work out his salvation with fear and trembling if he does not want to perish eternally accordingly a young man does not gain any or only a small advantage for his lustful flesh by refusing to become a minister every christian must be a spiritual priest even if he is not a minister if he does not wish to thrust the grace of god from him it is indeed true that a person who wishes to become a minister must first be a sincere christian that is the conditio sine qua non the indispensable requisite for becoming a minister the apostle paul concludes his enumeration of the qualities required for a bishop or what amounts to the same a minister with these words holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience second timothy three nine this shows that a minister must have a purified conscience cleansed not only by the blood of christ unto the forgiveness of sins but also by the sanctification of the spirit a minister must have come to the momentous decision that he will not live for himself but for him who died and rose again for his sake at his ordination when he is separated from the world for service in the sanctuary a minister must have bidden farewell to the world and become irrevocably divorced from it he must have reached the conviction with the pious poet that thus expressed my heart now make thy choice on him stake thy reliance or thou'lt not come to rest renounce the world and all that does thy flesh enthrall with jesus take thy stand and thus the matter end blessed are you my dear friends if you make the poet's words with jesus take thy stand and thus the matter end 
the sighing of your heart. Not until you do this will you end the matter. Accordingly, it is a real and a great misfortune when a congregation obtains an orthodox but unconverted minister, who, though he has grasped the pure doctrine quite well with his intellect and memory, does not believe what he preaches. Such a minister, having the pure doctrine, will, as a rule, lead his congregation to good pastures in his pulpit work, but he will be a sorry watchman and curate of souls, and a still sorrier example to his flock. His congregation will not at all behold in him the portrait of a Christian who has renounced himself and the world. If it is to his advantage, he will indeed adhere to the pure doctrine, and even fight bravely to maintain it. But if a situation arises that brings him into contempt, or yields him ingratitude as a result for his zeal, if he has to suffer dishonor and persecution for the sake of the pure doctrine, he will speedily fall away from it, and it will be apparent that his Christianity sprang from a corrupt root, and that his congregation has obtained a cheat. For in times of tribulations, when wolves and foxes try to break in to the flock, it is of paramount importance that the shepherd take a firm stand, and be ready to give his life, to shed his blood for the truth and for his flock. An unconverted person would consider it ridiculous to sacrifice a pleasant living in a nice position with a snug income for what he considers a subtle point of doctrine, because he has never yet had a perception of the right connections of the parts of the saving doctrine. When the question is not about doctrines objectively or speculatively considered, but about teachings, which in a purely practical view belong to the true knowledge and experience of the heart, an orthodox minister of this type will talk like a blind man about color. At times he will have an exaggerated view of genuine Christianity. At other times he will entertain an unduly inferior view of it. We have seen at our last meeting how law and gospel can be confounded by an exaggerated view of Christianity. Tonight we shall hear how a minister can place genuine Christianity on a lower level than its essential quality requires. Thesis 18. In the fourteenth place, the word of God is not rightly divided when the universal corruption of mankind is described in such a manner as to create the impression that even true believers are still under the spell of ruling sins, and are sinning purposely. You will observe that I am speaking of the claim that the universal corruption of mankind embraces living in dominant and willful sins on the part of believers. No one who is conversant with the pure doctrine will make the unqualified assertion that a Christian can be a fornicator and an adulterer. Such a thought would not enter the mind of a true teacher of the Word of God. But a preacher trying to give a very drastic description of the universal corruption of mankind is easily tempted to deviate from the pure doctrine. I am speaking of mistakes that are frequently made by zealous ministers and also by theological students. In their first sermons, submitted for review, they quite frequently say that all mankind lives in this or that sin, mentioning manifest sins unto death, as though Christians also were living in sins of that kind. What damage can be done when people are made to hear that we human beings are living in every abomination, shame, and vice, without the qualifying statement, as we are by nature, or as long as a person is still in the state of natural depravity, and is unregenerate. With these qualifiers, of course, you cannot overdraw the horrible qualities of man's natural condition. However, when addressing a Christian congregation, you will have to be very careful to speak as if also all Christians were living in shame and vice. It was a harmful and dangerous attempt on the part of the pietists to divide mankind into so many classes that nobody was able to tell in which class he belonged. But this must not keep us from pointing out in our sermons the two great classes into which mankind is really divided, namely, believers and unbelievers, godly and ungodly, converted and unconverted, regenerate and unregenerate persons. This classification is current throughout the Scriptures. Christ always preached, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Mark 16.16 16. I am not come to call the sinners, but righteous to repentance. Matthew 9.13 
God maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. Matthew 5.45 In each one of these texts, Christ recognizes only two classes of human beings. Matthew 13.38, he speaks of the children of the kingdom and the children of the wicked one, of wheat and tares. This thorough division, this out-out, either or, must appear in every sermon of a sincere preacher. This is what your hearers must learn, namely, that they are either spiritually dead or spiritually alive, either converted or unconverted, either under the wrath of God or in a state of grace, either Christians or unchristians, either asleep in sin or quickened unto a new life in God, subjects in either the devil's or God's kingdom. It is a damnable heresy to speak of Hades, as modern theologians do, where man will have another chance to be converted. Incalculable harm is done by this doctrine. May God keep you from embracing it. Make plain to your hearers in all your sermons that there are but two goals at the end of this life, heaven and hell. There will be only two sentences pronounced on men, either unto damnation or unto eternal life. Accordingly, there are only two classes of men in the present life. Those of the one class are headed direct for hell, those of the other straight for heaven. For Christ says distinctly, Wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Matthew seven thirteen through 14 there are but two gates, two roads, and two terminals. To confound the two classes of men that are concerned in these two ways is an abominable mingling of law and gospel. The law produces reprobate sinners, the gospel free and blessed men. Although the matter is as clear as daylight, still, since it is so easy, when one pictures what abominable sinners we are who need the Saviour, to fall into error in spite of our good intention. Let us hear a few Bible texts on this subject. When you speak of abominable sinners, you must not refer to Christians, in whom we find on the one hand weaknesses, which are covered with the righteousness of Christ, and on the other hand good deeds, which God does through them, and which are pleasing to Him. Every Christian may apply to himself the declaration of God, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Matthew 3.17 Romans 6.14 We read, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. What the Apostle actually says in this text is that sin shall not be able to dominate Christians. It is absolutely impossible that a person who is in a state of grace should be ruled by sin. A pilgrim traveling on a lonely road when attacked by a highwayman, escapes from him at the first opportunity. He does not want to be overcome and slain. Christians are pilgrims through this world on their way to heaven. The devil, like a highway robber, assaults them, and they go down before him because of their weakness, not because they meant to go down. To a true Christian his fall is forgiven because he turns to God in daily repentance with tears or at least heartfelt signs for pardon. If a person allows sin to rule him, this is a sure sign that he is not a Christian, but a hypocrite, no matter how pious he pretends to be. 1 Corinthians 6, 7-11, we read, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But ye are washed, ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus, and by the Spirit of our God. No one, then, who falls into the aforementioned sins and fails to repent of them, shall inherit the kingdom of God. The Christian's repentance shows itself in this, that he desires to commit these sins no more. 
whoever commits these sins intentionally has by that token a proof that he is not a Christian but a reprobate, who is moved not by the Spirit of God but by the hellish Spirit. Second Peter 2, 20-22, the Apostle writes, For if, after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than, after they have known it, to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. With this important passage we confront the Calvinists in particular, who say that a person who has once obtained faith can never lose it. The Apostle Peter is here speaking of persons who had been children of God, had had a living knowledge of the Lord Jesus, and had been in a state of divine grace. How, then, can any one be so bold as to assert that a person who had been truly converted stays converted even when, like Peter and David, he falls into some particular sin? Romans eight thirteen and 14, we are told, If ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. The Apostle does not say, Never mind your sinning, God will keep you in His grace and bring you around again. But he says, If you live after the flesh, you shall die. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are sons of God. That means, per contra, that those who are not led by the Spirit of God, but by their flesh, are not children of God, but servants of Satan. Galatians 5, 19-21, Paul writes, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, sedition, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in times past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Stop and consider this passage. In view of this text, is it not shocking in men who want to pass for Christian theologians, to say that men can be in a state of grace while living in abominable sins such as are named in this text? This text locks the kingdom of God against them, and announces to them the judgment of God. Ephesians 5, 5-6, five through six, the same apostle writes, For this ye know, that no whoremonger, no unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. The Apostle's warning, Let no man deceive you, means, Do not listen to those who tell you the contrary. Unbelievers will be damned for the reason that they live in sins like the above. Consider, then, that if you were to live in the same sins, you would share their fate in perdition. This Paul asks the Ephesians to ponder. I wish to call your attention to the fact that passages like those which I quoted are found in the Pericopes. They should prove valuable to you when you use them for a lively presentation of the doctrine now under consideration. I am always pained when I attend church and find that these splendid texts are not used for the sermon. You ought to form the resolution that when the particular time for a pericope containing these texts arrives, you will expound them to your hearers, and tell them that as God lives they will be damned if they live in this or that sin. If you only tell them that Christians remain sinners until they die, you will frequently be misunderstood. Some will lull themselves to sleep with the reflection that they are poor and frail human beings, but that they have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. However, a lip faith. Let me urge upon you in general to take a survey of the pericopes on which you are going to preach, and to note beforehand 
particular passages that suggest subjects to you on which you feel you ought to preach. If you wait till Wednesday or Thursday with looking up the pericope for the upcoming Sunday, and after a superficial reading decide on some topic which will yield you eight pages of manuscript, sufficient for a talk of forty-five minutes, you act like an abominable hireling. A faithful pastor begins on Sunday evening to consider the subject of his sermon for the coming Sunday, and determines fully to redeem the precious minutes during which he will face his congregation. The only thing that will keep him from following this practice is a visit he has to make or receive on Sunday evening. He delights in storming now this, now that stronghold of the devil. True, he will not achieve the overthrow of every one of these strongholds, but it must be his earnest intention to do so. Otherwise many will continue in their spiritual misery under sin, and he will have himself to blame for it. If you do what divine grace enables you to do, the Saviour will not put you to shame on account of your deficiencies, but will graciously reward you in the end with the crown of glory. To strengthen the conviction which I am trying to produce in you, let me cite a testimony from the small called Articles, Part 3, Article 4, Paragraphs 42 through 43. On the other hand, if certain sectarists were to arise, some of whom are perhaps already extant, and in the time of the insurrection of the peasants came under my own observation, holding that all those who had once received the Spirit or the forgiveness of sins, or had become believers, even though they should afterwards sin, would still remain in the faith, and such sin would not harm them, and hence crying thus, Do whatever you please, if you believe it all amounts to nothing, faith blots out all sins, and so forth. They say besides, that if any one sins after he has received faith and the Spirit, he never truly had the Spirit of faith. I have had before me seen and heard many such insane men, and I fear that in some such a devil is still remaining. It is accordingly necessary to know and teach that when holy men, still having and feeling original sin, also daily repenting of and striving with it, happen to fall into manifest sins, mortal sins which everybody recognizes as such, as David into adultery, murder, and blasphemy, that then faith and the Holy Spirit has departed from them. For the Holy Ghost does not permit sin to have dominion, to gain the upper hand, so as to be accomplished, but represses and restrains it, so that it must not do what it wishes. But if it does what it wishes, the Holy Ghost and faith are certainly not present. For St. John says, First Epistle 3, 9, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, and he cannot sin. And yet it is also the truth, when the same St. John says, First Epistle 1, 8, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Now, lest you think that we are vainly arguing about self-evident matters, and to prove that the Calvinists have received into their doctrinal system the error rejected in our thesis, I wish to cite from the decrees of the Synod of Dort the following statement. God, who is rich in mercy, according to his immutable purpose of election, does not wholly remove the Holy Spirit from his own, even when they sin grievously, nor does he permit them to fall entirely out of the grace of adoption as children of God and out of the state of justification. Now, any one who falls into a mortal sin slips back entirely into the state of sin. According to the confession of the reform, then, Peter, David, and others were justified sinners while they committed mortal sins, remained in a state of grace as children of God, and retained the Holy Spirit. This we reject, while we indeed assert that the elect cannot until their death remain in a reprobate state, otherwise they could not be elect. End of Lecture 30Lecture 31 of The Proper Distinction Between Law and Gospel by C. F. W. Walter Translated by W. H. T. Dow This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 31st Evening Lecture, June 12, 1885 The fact that sin exists 
and the question how it originated are two of the greatest problems with which the mind of man is wrestling. Even the more serious philosophers of pagan antiquity were occupied with this highly important and grave subject. Being ignorant of the fact that God at the beginning created man perfectly good according to his image, and that man soon after, having been misled by the devil, fell from his first estate, they naturally could not discover the awful character of sin and its origin. As a rule, they did not proceed farther in their reasoning than to say that sin is an innate weakness and frailty of man. Others, like Zoroaster, Manes, and many of the Gnostics, wishing to push their inquiry further, asserted a twofold primeval principle, or primeval essence, one good, the other evil. They claimed that what is good in man was derived from the good, what is evil in him from the evil principle. But after all is told, they did not perceive the terrible abomination that sin is. It is a pity that even in the midst of Christendom there are people without number, both baptized and unbaptized, who do not know what sin is. Some, like the rationalists, claim that man is naturally good, and becomes evil and sinful only through evil examples, wrong education, and sensual enticements which he has not the strength to resist steadfastly. Others, like the pantheists, atheists, and materialists, claim that sinning is in no way worse than eating when you are hungry, or drinking when you are thirsty. It is merely satisfying a natural craving. The majority of them go still further, claiming that sin has been the indispensably necessary means by which man has developed his self-consciousness. The notorious philosopher Hegel says right out that without the fall into sin, paradise would have been nothing but a zoological garden. So necessary he considers sin. He is unable to conceive that sin might be injurious. On the contrary, he treats it as the transition from the state of barbarism to that of self-conscious thinking. This blindness concerning sin is the chief cause of the almost universal rejection of the gospel in our time. People who fail to recognize the horrible nature of sin will decline to accept the sacrificial death of the Son of God for the reconciliation and redemption of this world of sinners, for they consider it utterly unnecessary, and hence regard the story of the gospel as a miserable fable. It is therefore one of the most important requisites of a true evangelical minister that he know how to depict for his hearers the true nature of sin in terms that are as plain and distinct as they are terrible, drastic, and impressive. For without a real knowledge of what an awful thing sin is, man cannot understand and accept the gospel. As long as he is not alarmed over sin as his greatest enemy, and the most awful abomination indwelling in him, he will not come to Christ. Still less, of course, can there be a proper distinction between the law and the gospel without a true and adequate knowledge of sin. This leads us to our next thesis. Thesis 19. In the fifteenth place the word of God is not rightly divided when the preacher speaks of certain sins as if they were not of a damnable but of a venial nature. Unless you ponder the highly important matter now before us well, you will lack much of the clear vision that you ought to have for the proper discharge of the ministerial office. We have already seen that a distinction must be made between mortal and venial sins. A person failing to make this distinction does not rightly divide law and gospel. But the distinction between those two kinds of sin must be made with great care. It must be clearly shown that the distinction is made for the purpose of providing that certain sins expel the Holy Ghost from the believer. When the Holy Spirit is driven out, faith too is ejected. For no one can come to faith, nor retain it without the Holy Ghost. Sins which expel the Holy Ghost and bring on spiritual death are called mortal sins. Anyone who has been a Christian will readily perceive when the Holy Spirit has departed from him by his inability to offer up childlike prayers to God and to resist sin stoutly and bravely as he used to do. He will feel as if he had become chained to sin like a slave. It is a good thing if he has at least this knowledge of his condition, for thus he may be brought back to God. But while this condition endures, he is not in communion with God. Venial sins are termed such as a Christian commits without forfeiting the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. 
they are sins of weakness or rashness. Frequently they are called the daily sins of Christians. While inculcating this distinction upon our hearers, we must be scrupulously careful not to create the notion in them that venial sins are sins about which a person need not be greatly concerned, and for which he does not have to ask forgiveness. A preacher who leads his hearers to entertain this view becomes the cause of their perdition. He makes them carnally secure, and drives the fear of God from their hearts. That is not the true evangelical way of preaching about these sins, nor is it in general a true evangelical notion that only he is a real evangelical preacher who does not preach the law a great deal. Both the law and the gospel must be preached, the one in its sternness, the other in its sweetness. A preacher who does not preach both does not deserve the name of an evangelical minister, but is a false leader and is sowing the gospel as if he were casting wheat into the ocean, where no crop can be raised. It happens only too often that preachers, when speaking on the distinction between venial and mortal sins, create the impression that to Christians venial sins are matters over which they need not worry. Since all are sinners, and no one ever gets rid of sin entirely, there is no reason why one should feel disturbed because of these sins. A talk of that kind is really awful and ungodly. Matthew 5, 18-19, the Lord says, Verily I say unto you, Till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments, and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. This is one of the most awful sayings found in Scripture. The Lord does not say, He shall be the least, but He shall be called the least. The least means the most reprobate, or one whom God does not acknowledge as His own. That will be the sentence passed on Him in the kingdom of God and Christ. Therefore you should, with trembling, approach the task of preaching both the gospel and the law. Do not speak of one jot of the law, of one of the so-called least commandments, as of something about which a Christian need not be greatly concerned. The connection in which the Lord uttered these words is worthy of note. In the words preceding them, he states that he has come to fulfill the law. Now, inasmuch as the Lord had to fulfill every law and every commandment in our stead, it is shocking in any man, poor, sinful worm that he is, to want to dispense with a single law of God and to treat it in a manner of no importance. Those who entertain notions of this kind are no Christians. If any man has manufactured for himself some secret comfort for this notion, he has miserably belied and cheated himself. Also in this matter, a true Christian manifests himself as a person who fears to commit a single sin. The Lord also speaks of a person who shall teach men so. It is bad enough when a person, for his own part, disregards some law and leads a careless life. But it is much worse when he preaches his lax views and leads men to perdition by his preaching. He will have to render an account to God of his preaching, and on that day he may not excuse himself by claiming that it was only trifling matters which he had represented as so unimportant that no one need grieve over them. A Christian grieves even over trifles, but unchristians imagine that they can escape by iniquities. Psalm 56, 7. Luther, what evil we do is already forgiven. That is the slogan of the wicked, just as it is the easy-going way of unconverted people to speak of their iniquities thus. Well, I can easily make amends, and grass will soon grow over it. No grass will ever grow over anything for which forgiveness has not been asked of God. Matthew 12.36, Christ says, I say to you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. By a concrete example, we are shown in this text how abominable it is to speak of sins which are in themselves venial, and are automatically remitted by God because he does not regard them as great evil. 
those who speak thus represent god the holy and righteous as a feeble old man like eli who saw his son's sin and merely said nay my sons for samuel two twenty four thinking that therewith he had done his full duty true god is love but he is also holiness and righteousness to the person who rises up against him god becomes a terrible fire and his fiery wrath pursues the sinner into the lowest hell let men of the world ridicule and scorn this teaching they will have to pay dearly for their laughter like the people of sodom genesis nineteen any evil word for which a sinner is tried on judgment day is sufficient for his condemnation now is there a christian who can say at the end of the day on which he has spoken much that he has not uttered a single idle word few christians will be able to say that even for an idle word christians must ask god's pardon with a contrite heart and promise to guard their lips better in the future if god were not to forgive their idle words these alone would damn them there is no sin venial in itself but there are such sins as will not hinder a person from still believing in jesus christ with all his heart james two ten we read whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point he is guilty of all let us assume that scripture contained a thousand commandments in reality there are more than a thousand because those that have been recorded state only general principles for which we are to find the applications now according to this text if a person had kept nine hundred and ninety-nine out of the thousand commandments he would be guilty of the whole law that applies to every one of the so-called venial sins unless a christian clearly understands this fact he ceases to be a christian what constitutes a person a christian is this believing knowledge that he is in the first place a miserable accursed sinner who would be lost for ever if christ had not died for him and that in the second place jesus christ true god begotten of the father in eternity and also true man born of the virgin mary has redeemed him a lost and condemned creature purchased and won him from all sins from death and from the power of the devil a christian must regard himself as a lost and condemned sinner or all his talk about faith is vain and worthless galatians three ten paul writes for as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse for it is written cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them the curse recorded in this clear passage will descend on every one that does not continue to do all things that are written in the book of the law hence there can be no sin that is venial by its nature sins are venial only for christ's sake first john one seven we read the blood of jesus christ his son cleanseth us from all sin the apostle says from all sin not from all mortal sins all grievous sins all gross sins hence the blood of jesus christ the son of god must have been required also for cancelling the so-called venial sins that being so venial sins in themselves must also be mortal sins sin is something awful because it is onomia lawlessness it is rebellion against the holy omnipotent god our supreme heavenly lawgiver when a sinner adds wilfulness to his act he tears down the manifesto which a king has had posted in public and tramples upon it in an unlimited monarchy the punishment for such a crime is death we may not have torn down the law of god publicly but we are daily acting contrary to it for this we are to express our heartfelt regret a true christian is not like a brazen criminal who carries his head high he is not hard-hearted but contrite if he is reminded of any word that god has spoken he accepts it immediately with due humility anybody may utter a warning or a rebuke to a christian and it will be accepted occasionally he may resist for a moment and as luther puts it allow the devil to ride him but unless he is beside himself and for a while does not see that his conduct is unchristian and ungodly he soon feels a fire burning in him and it will not take long before he begs god and men for forgiveness 
without a broken spirit, a person may talk ever so much about the Christian faith. It is all worthless, as he is in the power of sin. Let us then continue to believe that sin, no matter what its character may be, is never venial in itself. For anything that has been done contrary to the law, the law has to condemn the doer. The cognate text is Matthew 5, 21-22. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council, but whoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hell-fire. Is there a Christian who need not blame himself for having been angry at his brother, even though it was not for a long time? It was done in weakness. Nevertheless, he has committed a sin of which he has to be ashamed. When Christ says he is in danger of the judgment, he treats anger and murder alike. The term raka signifies that anger in the heart breaks forth in angry words and gestures. It reaches its worst stage when the angry person cries, Thou fool! The law promptly consigns such an angry person to hellfire. All these texts prove that the so-called venial sins are not venial in themselves, in their nature but damnable mortal sins. Only of the believer it is written, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8.1 But a believer is the very person who regards sin as a very serious matter. Lest you imagine that no one could possibly preach this false doctrine concerning venial sins, let me cite what the papists teach in the Roman Catechism. Chapter 2, Section 5, Question 46 All mortal sins must be told to the priest. For venial sins, which do not separate us from divine grace, and into which we fall rather frequently, may be properly confessed for a person's ease of mind. But they may also be withheld from the priest with impunity, and may be atoned for in many different ways. Mortal sins, however, must be rehearsed one by one for it is their nature to inflict a more grievous wound on the soul than those sins which men are in the habit of committing freely and publicly. Here you have the anti-Christian doctrine that no absolution is required for venial sins. It is naively expressed, but it reveals an abysmal iniquity and draws down upon the papists the sentence of the Lord, He shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 5.19 over against this teaching, Cromeyer writes, There is no sin that in its nature is venial. We must steer a middle course between the Roman Scylla and the Calvinistic Charybdis. Among venial sins, the Romanists number sinful desires that do not materialize in acts. However, shameful libertines may not carry into action the abominable fantasies in which they delight while lying in their beds. They may shrink from executing them because of the notoriety that would follow, but they must be told that they are living in mortal sins. Trifles, such as stealing a pin, are treated by Romanists as venial sins. I remember that my parents impressed on us children that we must not even steal a pin. It is well if parents train their children to a scrupulous fear of the least wrongdoing because it would be regarded as a serious matter by their father, and might arouse his anger. Let me cite a statement of Socius in his commentary on the Gospel of St. John, page 448. It seems to be certain that in persons who otherwise confess the faith of Christ with his heart, one sinful act cannot have the effect of consigning him to eternal death. When we are told concerning sins unto death, the reference cannot be to a single sin, but to habitual sinning. According to Socinian teaching, we need not ask God's forgiveness for an occasional sinful slip. Sin, according to this view, does not exclude a person from the kingdom of God unless it becomes a vicious habit. Let me submit a few testimonies from the writings of Luther. I shall cite first a passage from his Exposition of the Theses discussed at Leipzig, St. Louis edition, 18, 833 and following. 
The second thesis which Luther maintained reads, To deny that a person sins even in his good deeds, that venial sins are such not by their nature, but solely by the mercy of God, or that sin remains in an infant also after baptism, means to trample Paul and Christ underfoot. Luther comments on this thesis as follows. Accordingly, it is another grievous error of the theologians, that they manifest hardly any concern about venial sins, and prate that a venial sin does not offend God, at least only to a pardonable degree. If venial sins are such trifling sins, why is it that even the righteous are scarcely saved? Why can the righteous not endure the judgment of God and be declared righteous? Why are we urged with such earnestness, and in no trifling or figurative sense, to pray, Forgive us our trespasses, Thy will be done, Thy kingdom come, hallowed be Thy name? Is it not manifest that these miserable theologians first extinguish the fear of God in men, and then make soft pillows for people's arms and heads, as Ezekiel says, chapter 13, 18, dispense them from this prayer and quench the spirit? Fight of all they may say, it is not a trifling matter to depart from the law and will of God a hairbreadth, nor is the mercy of God which pardons venial sins a trifling matter. These people then treat the law and the will and the mercy of God as something ineffectual, and the result is that the prayer of the righteous is not fervent, nor is their gratitude kindled. Let us beware of this pharisaical leaven. Again, Luther writes in his exposition of the theses concerning indulgences against Tetzel in the year 1518. In his comment on Thesis 76, St. Louis edition, 18260, Here I should have expiated on venial sins, which is lightly regarded nowadays as if it were not a sin at all, to the great harm of many people, I fear, who are securely snoring away in their sins, and are not aware that they are committing gross sins. I confess that during all my reading of the scholastic teachers I have never understood what a venial sin is, nor how great it is. I do not know whether they understand these things themselves. I want to state briefly. Any person who is not in constant fear of being full of mortal sins, and does not act accordingly, will scarcely be saved. For Scripture says, Psalm 143, verse 2, Enter not into judgment with thy servant. Not only venial sins, as they are nowadays called by everybody, but even good works cannot bear the scrutiny of God's judgment, but are in need of pardoning mercy. For the psalmist does not say, Enter not into judgment with thine enemy, but with thy servant, and thy child that is serving thee. This fear ought to teach us to sigh for the mercy of God and to trust in it. Where this fear is lacking, we trust not so much in the mercy of God as in our own conscience, and in the fact that we are not conscious of having committed any gross sins. Such people will meet with a fearful judgment. Evangelical preaching means that sin must be magnified. The minister must pronounce a severe judgment on sin, for he is to proclaim the judgment of God. Also venial sins you must not regard lightly. You must remember that you sin so much every day that God would have to cast you into hell, but that he will not do it because you believe in Christ. Always remind yourself that if God were to deal with you according to his justice, you would be going to hell, not on a pleasant couch. You are to be in such fear and behave in such a way as if you were full of deadly trespasses. It is awful to hear one say nonchalantly, now my conscience is at ease. It is certainly a pitiful condition for a person to be in, namely, to have an unconcerned conscience, while the word of God pronounces condemnation upon him. Danhauer, in his Hodosophia, page 195, uttered an important axiomatic truth by saying, Sin is as great as he who is offended by it. Since God is offended by sin, there is in sin an immeasurable wickedness and an immeasurable guilt. Finally, Christian experience also proves that in its nature no sin is venial. Any true Christian will tell you this to be his experience, 
that as soon as he had sinned, he felt an unrest which continued until he had asked God for forgiveness. In every true Christian, the conscience promptly rings an alarm. A Christian merchant becomes restless over five cents in his receipts that do not belong to him. A Christian is reproved by his conscience for wrongdoing when he has treated a brother discourteously or in loveless fashion. For the slightest offense which he has given by his sinful conduct, he apologizes, and he has no rest until he has done so. Is not that remarkable? It shows that venial sins, too, are something evil, a fire that may be kindled for our perdition. Small sins become great when they are regarded as small. End of Lecture 31、Lecture、32 Second Evening Lecture, June 19th, 1885 My Dear Friends, During the last quarter of the eighteenth century, rationalism rushed in upon the so-called Protestant Church with the force of a springtide. In the lecture halls of universities it was held up as a new and great light to young theologians, who afterwards preached it to the common people as true Christianity, Christianity purified. Thus rationalism gradually became the dominant type of religion. The inevitable consequence was that the conviction that it is not a matter of indifference whether a person is a Lutheran or a Reformed or a Catholic vanished completely. The small remnant of sincere Christians who still believed and confessed with their mouths that the Holy Scriptures are the Word of God, that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God, that man is justified before God by faith in Christ alone, these few Christians extended to each other the right hand of brotherly fellowship like persons saved from a great shipwreck. Who, having seen most of their fellow passengers go down to a watery grave, now embrace each other with tears of joy, though they had been perfect strangers before. In this state of affairs, the thought had to arise in all hearts that the time had come for putting an end to the abominable church quarrels, that is what doctrinal controversies were called, and to let down the bars that divided the churches from one another. Especially the confessions, it was held, must be removed. Because, like toll gates along the highway, they hindered progress, and to sum up, a great universal union of the churches, at least of the Protestant churches, must at last be instituted. But lo, what happened? In the year 1817, when this plan was to be executed, Klaus Harms, in whom there was still some Lutheran blood flowing, wrote ninety five theses against rationalism and the union of churches. Which he intended as a counterpart to the ninety five theses of Luther. In these theses, he said to the advocates of church union, You purpose to make the poor handmaid, the Lutheran church, rich by a marriage. Do not perform the act over Luther's grave. Life will come into his bones, and then woe to you. This glorious prediction was fulfilled. When the union of churches was actually put into effect in Prussia, Multitudes of Lutherans suddenly awoke from their spiritual sleep, remembered that they belonged to the Lutheran Church, and declared that they would never forsake the faith of their fathers. In fact, they chose to see themselves evicted from their homes, imprisoned and expatriated, rather than consent to a union of truth with error, of the word of God with man's word, of the true church with a false church. Those were glorious days in the dark period about the middle of the nineteenth century. It is a pity that from the glorious conflict of those trying times there did not emerge the old, pure, genuine Lutheran Church. The reason was that the very men who had wished to hold that fast which they had, that no man take their crown, Revelation 3.11, did not possess a clear and pure knowledge of the truth. And so it happened that they went from one extreme to the other, from rationalism and religions. And ecclesiastical indifferentism to particularism and a hierarchical tendency that was anti Lutheran. The men, namely, those who in those days led others in their determined opposition to the union of churches and strenuously insisted on being Lutherans, proceeded to prove their claim by asserting that the true visible Lutheran Church is the church mentioned in the third article of the Creed, 
in these words, I believe in a holy Christian church, the communion of saints. They held that the Lutheran church is the church par excellence, cot exochene, the church in the most exalted and proper sense, the ecclesia extra quam nola est salus, the church outside of which there is no salvation, possibly with this limitation, except that God in a miraculous and extraordinary manner may save a person also outside of this church and lead him to eternal life. It was a pathetic and fatal error, which placed these men in direct contradiction to the Holy Scriptures, and moreover overthrew the cardinal doctrine of Christianity, the doctrine that a poor sinner is made righteous in the sight of God for Christ's sake, by faith alone. This error plainly involved the most detestable confusion and commingling of law and gospel. This error is still in vogue in the separate Lutheran Church of Prussia. Thesis 20. In the sixteenth place, the word of God is not rightly divided when a person's salvation is made to depend on his association with the visible Orthodox Church, and when salvation is denied to every person who errs in any article of faith. It seems strange indeed that after such a long time, during which rationalism and the greatest religious indifference were prevalent, men should have hit upon the doctrine that the visible Lutheran Church is the church cot exochene, outside of which there is no salvation. However, although this seems to be incomprehensible on first blush, it is easily explained by the prolific nature of error. The mother of the awful error which we are studying is the doctrine that the church is a visible institute which Christ has established on earth, differing in no way from a religious state. Its governing offices are indeed not in the hands of kings, emperors, generals, and burgomasters, but in their place there are superintendents, bishops, church councils, pastors, deacons, synods, and the like. That this view is erroneous, every one who is at least somewhat conversant with God's word knows. Does not the Saviour say, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it? Matthew 16, 18. This rock is Christ. No one is a member of the church except he who is built upon Christ. Being built upon Christ does not mean connecting oneself mechanically with the church, but putting one's confidence in Christ, and hoping to obtain righteousness and salvation from Him alone. Whoever fails to do this is not built on this rock, hence is not a member of the church of Jesus Christ. Paul says to the Ephesians, chapter 2, 19-22, Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints, and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building, fitly framed together, groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an inhabitation of God through the Spirit. No one is built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets who does not believingly cling to their word. Hence, no one is a member of the church who is without a living faith. The Saviour calls himself a bridegroom. Let no one who is not betrothed to Christ with the innermost affection of his heart claim to be a true Christian and a member of the church. As regards his relation to Christ, he is an alien. The church, however, is the bride of Christ. Again, Christ is called the head of the church. Hence, only he can be a member of the church into whom there flows from Christ the head, light, life, strength, and grace. Whoever is not in this spiritual connection with Christ has not Christ for his head. Whoever is his own ruler, and is not governed by Christ, does not belong to the church. In another place the apostle calls the church the body of Christ. This has prompted many, even of the most faithful Lutherans, to say that, since a body is visible, the church too must be visible. But that is an abominable piece of exegesis. The point of comparison, tertium comparationis, in the aforementioned phrase, is not the visibility of the church, but that instead of being composed of many dead instruments, it is a vital organism of members, in whom one faith and one energy of faith is pulsating. This proves beyond contradiction that the church is not visible, but invisible. 
only he is a member of the church who experiences the constant outflowing of energy from christ the head of the church again christ calls the church his flock hence no one is a member of the church who does not belong to the flock of christ is not one of his sheep pastured by him and obeying his voice the objection is raised that christ compares the church to a field in which wheat and tares are growing but the objection is owing to a wrong interpretation of the parable christ has given us the key that unlocks its meaning he does not say the field is my kingdom in that case the church would be a society composed of good and evil members but he says the field is the world matthew thirteen thirty eight the apology of the augsburg confession emphasizes this fact the saviour likens his church to a field in which tares grow together with the wheat to a net in which good and bad fishes are caught, to a marriage feast to which foolish virgins come with others, and to which, according to another parable, one gained entrance who is not dressed in the proper wedding garments. By means of all these parables, Christ does not mean to describe the essence of the church, but the outward form in which it appears in this world, and its lot among the men of this world. Although it is composed only of good sheep, only of regenerate persons still it never presents itself in the form of a congregation that is made up of none but true christians in its visible form the church can never purge itself of hypocrites and ungodly persons who find their way into it not until its consummation in the life eternal will the church appear triumphant entirely purified and without blemish separated from those who were not honestly and sincerely joined to it but only sought their own secular interests in an outward union with the church. While hypocrites and sham Christians profess Christ with their lips, their heart is far from him. They are serving their carnal lusts, and not the Lord alone. In Luke 14.26 the Lord says, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. In this passage Christ passes judgment on all who do not want to renounce what they have. But not until all are gathered before the judgment seat of Christ will these people become known as hypocrites. We may see people going to church, but we cannot see whether they belong to the church. It is impossible to declare regarding individuals that they are true members of the church. No man, but only God, knows whether they are. To the eyes of God alone the church is visible. To the eyes of men it is invisible the error which we are now discussing is the primary falsehood proton soidos of our time it is an awful error for those who are addicted to this error pretend to be good lutherans opposed to the papists and yet they have only changed weapons with the papists formerly the papists defended the false doctrine now under review now lutherans dare to set up the claim against them that the Lutherans, ay, the Lutherans, are the church outside of which there is no salvation. Lutherans of this stripe become an object of ridicule to the Papists. They take over the part formerly acted by the Pope and his rabble. The only inferences that can be drawn from this state of affairs would be either that the Pope's church is the true church, or that the true church had perished before Luther came. But Scripture says that the true church cannot perish. It shall continue until the end of time. Now, until the sixteenth century, there was no church denominated Lutheran. In fact, no church since the days of the apostles has had the pure doctrine as our fathers had it. Hence, either Scripture has lied, or the Roman church was the true church, and Luther's Reformation was rebellion. That is the vexing dilemma in which all those are placed who wish to maintain the false doctrine concerning the church sketched above. Its worst feature, however, is undeniably this. Making a person's salvation depend on this membership in and communion with the visible Orthodox Church means to overthrow the doctrine of justification by faith. True faith has been obtained by people before they join the Lutheran Church. It is a fatal mistake to think that Luther, before becoming a Lutheran, sit venia verbo, did not have the true faith. Though we esteem our church highly, may this abominable, fanatical notion be far from us, that our Lutheran church is the alone saving church. The true church extends throughout the world, 
and is found in all sects, for it is not an external organism with particular arrangements to which a person must adapt himself in order to become a member of the church. Any one who believes in Jesus Christ and is a member of his spiritual body is a member of the church. This church, moreover, is never divided. Although its members are separated from one another by space and time, the church is ever one. A false inference is drawn from the fact that Scripture speaks of external ecclesiastical communities, such as those at Rome, Corinth, Philippi, Thessalonica, in Galatia, and those in Asia Minor, to whom the Lord issued letters through St. John. All these visible communities are called churches. Hence it is claimed that the church is visible. Now Luther, in order to keep people from imagining that the Pope is the church, has translated ecclesia by congregation, which is a correct rendering. The inference drawn from the use of this term when applied to local churches is wrong, because the scriptures, as a rule, employ this term when referring to no local congregation, but to the church in the absolute sense, and that is an invisible community. The term is applied to local congregations because the invisible church is contained in them. In a similar manner we speak of a stack of wheat, although it is not all wheat, but a good deal of hay and straw is on the pile. Or we speak of a glass of wine, although water has been mixed with it. In such instances the object is denominated a potiore parte, from its principal content. Thus visible communities are called churches, because the invisible church is in them, because they contain a heavenly seed. False Christians and hypocrites are given the name of members of the congregation, when in reality they are not members. Since they confess the name of Jesus, we apply to them this title charitably, assuming that they believe what they confess. We cannot look into their hearts. We leave that to God. We do not judge them, except when they become manifest as ungodly persons. In that case we cease applying the title to them, but put them away from us, and call them heathen men and publicans. Now the Lutheran church, too, is a visible community, is called a church in a synecdochical sense. It is, therefore, an awful mistake to claim that men can be saved only in the Lutheran church. No one must be inclined to join the Lutheran church because he thinks that only in that way can he get into the church of God. There are still Christians in the Reformed church, among the Methodists, yea, among the Papists. We have this precious promise in Isaiah 55:11, My word shall not return unto me void. Wherever the word of God is proclaimed and confessed, or even recited during the service, the Lord is gathering a people for himself. The Roman Church, for instance, still confesses that Christ is the Son of God, and that he died on the cross to redeem the world. That is truth sufficient to bring a man to the knowledge of salvation. Whoever denies this fact is forced to deny also that there are Christians in some Lutheran communities in which errors have cropped up. But there are always some children of God in these communities, because they have the word of God, which is always bearing fruit in converting some souls to God. The false doctrine concerning the church which we are studying involves a fatal confounding of law and gospel. While the gospel requires faith in Jesus Christ, the law makes all sorts of demands upon men. Setting up a demand of some kind as necessary to salvation, in addition to faith, the acceptance of the gospel promises, means to commingle law and gospel. I belong to the Lutheran Church for the sole reason that I want to side with the truth. I quit the church to which I belong when I find that it harbors errors with which I do not wish to be contaminated. I do not wish to become a partaker of other men's sins, and by quitting a heretical community I confess the pure and unadulterated truth. For Christ says, Whosoever shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Matthew 10, 32-33 Again, Paul writes distinctly to Timothy, Be not thou ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner. 2 Timothy 1, 8 from the fact that men may be saved in all the sects, 
and that in all sectarian churches there are children of God, it by no means follows that one can remain in communion with a sect. Many people cannot comprehend this. They imagine it is an utterly unionistic principle to hold that a person can be saved in any of the sects. But it is true, and the reason is that we are saved by faith, which some members of sectarian churches may have. However, if I perceive the error of my heretical community and do not forsake it, I shall be lost, because though seeing the error, I would not abandon it. I can still remember the time when I became a believer. Then I also joined the Unionists. Some persons approached me with the intention of bringing me into the Lutheran Church, but I told them that I was a believer and did not choose to belong to a church that claimed to be the alone saving church. Afterwards I found some good writings which showed me that the Lutheran Church claims to be the only church that has the pure doctrine, but does not claim to be the alone saving church, and admits that men can be saved in the sects if they are not aware of their error. As soon as I learned this, I quit the Unionistic community and joined the Lutherans. I had long known that the Lutheran Church has the truth, but I refused to endorse the aforementioned papistic principle. Then I understood that one does not have to condemn anyone who is in error regarding some article of the creed, but only those who have seen their error and still want to abide in it. Let me show you that this is indeed the doctrine of our Church. In the preface to the Book of Concord, we read, As to the condemnations, censures, and rejections of godless doctrines, and especially of that which has arisen concerning the Lord's Supper, these indeed had to be expressly set forth in this our declaration and thorough explanation and decision of controverted articles, not only that all should guard against these condemned doctrines, but also for certain other reasons they could in no way have been passed by. Thus, as it is in no way our design and purpose to condemn those men who err from a certain simplicity of mind, but are not blasphemers against the truth of the heavenly doctrine, much less indeed entire churches, which are either under the Roman Empire of the German nation, or elsewhere. Nay, rather has it been our intention and disposition in this manner openly to censure and condemn only the fanatical opinions, and their obstinate and blasphemous teachers, which we judge should in no way be tolerated in our dominions, churches, and schools. Because these errors conflict with the express word of God, and that, too, in such a way that they cannot be reconciled with it. We have undertaken this also for this reason, namely, that all godly persons may be warned diligently to avoid them. For we have no doubt whatever that even in those churches which have hitherto not agreed with us in all things, many godly and by no means wicked men are found who follow their own simplicity and do not understand aright the matter itself but in no way approve of the blasphemies which are cast forth against the Holy Supper, as it is administered in our churches according to Christ's institution, and with the unanimous approval of all good men, is taught in accordance with the words of the Testament itself. We are also in great hope that if they would be taught aright concerning all these things, the Spirit of the Lord aiding them, they would agree with us and with our churches and schools to the infallible truth of God's word. And, assuredly, the duty is especially incumbent upon all the theologians and ministers of the church, that with such moderation as is becoming, they teach from the word of God also those who, either from a certain simplicity or ignorance, have erred from the truth concerning the danger to their salvation, and that they fortify them against corruptions, lest perhaps, while the blind are leaders of the blind, all might perish. You may cite this fine passage, if you meet with such as reproachingly say that the Lutheran Church claims to be the alone saving Church. True, the formula of Concord has condemned the doctrine of the Reformed, but this condemnation does not apply to those who err in the simplicity of their hearts, but only to obstinate false teachers and blasphemers. People who admit that Christ has said this or that, but refuse to believe, People who begin to utter shocking blasphemies against the true doctrine are not to be regarded as children of God. Yet there are others who have been reared from a child in a certain error, but are holding fast their Saviour. 
these are not wicked persons, though they may promptly turn away a Lutheran who approaches them. The preface continues, Wherefore, by this writing of ours we testify in the sight of Almighty God and the entire Church, that it has never been our purpose, by means of this godly formula for union, to create trouble or danger to the godly, who today are suffering persecution. For as we have already entered into the fellowship of grief with them, moved by Christian love, so we are shocked at the persecution and most grievous tyranny which is exercised with such severity against these poor men, and sincerely detest it. For in no way do we consent to the shedding of that innocent blood, which undoubtedly will be required with great severity from the persecutors, at the awful judgment of the Lord, and before the tribunal of Christ. And they will then certainly have to render a very strict account, and suffer fearful punishment. The Lutheran confessors here refer to a rumor that was being spread by the Calvinists, that the Lutherans in Germany would imitate the Romanists in France, and institute a St. Bartholomew's knight of their own. The Lutherans asseverate, assert, in this passage, that they are not planning to persecute anybody. The blood of the Huguenots will be only on Papists' hands. In general, the Lutherans condemn none but those who condemn themselves by resisting the known truth. From the preface which Luther wrote to the theses against indulgences which he had published previously, we can see what a grievous task it was for him to forge his way to the true knowledge. He writes, St. Louis edition, 14, page 452 and following, Of the manifold sufferings and trials through which I passed that first year and the year following, of the great humiliation that I had to undergo, and that was genuine and not feigned, for it reached the degree of despair, of all these things little is known to these self-confident spirits, who after me have attacked the majesty of the Pope with great bluster and audacity, Still, with all their skill, they would not have been able to harm a hair on the Pope's head if Christ had not previously inflicted a deep, irremediable wound on him through me, his puny and unworthy instrument. Nevertheless, they carry off the glory and the honor as if they had done it, to which honor they are welcome for all I care. But while they were looking on at my loneliness and jeopardy, I was not very cheerful, confident, and certain of my affair. For many things which I now know, God be praised, I did not know at that time. Verily I did not understand, nor did all the papists together understand, the character of an indulgence. It was revered merely off account of long-established usage and custom. My object in inviting men to a disputation concerning it was not to reject it, but really to find out its virtue from others, since I knew absolutely nothing about it myself since the dead and dumb masters, I mean the books of the theologians and jurists, could not give me sufficient information. I desire to seek counsel from the living, and to hear the church of God itself, asking such godly persons as might be enlightened by the Holy Spirit regarding this matter, to take pity on me, and not only on me, but on the entire Christian church, and give us a true and reliable account of indulgences. Many godly men were greatly pleased with my theses, and thought highly of them. But I found it impossible to regard and acknowledge them as members of the Church, endowed with the Holy Spirit. I only regarded the Pope, the Cardinals, Bishops, Theologians, Jurists, Monks, and Priests, and was waiting for the Spirit from them. So eagerly had I taken in their doctrine, or, I might say, devoured it and guzzled it, that I had been filled to bursting with it, and was not sure whether I was awake or sleeping. To this day the papists seek to keep the people with their church by telling them, You know that we are the true church. No matter what the church teaches, if you want to be a true disciple of Christ, you must hear the church. If the Pope decrees that he is infallible, or that Mary was conceived without sin, or that the saints must be adored, you must accept these dogmas. You may not consult your reason. The true church has set up these dogmas, and it cannot err. If you fall away from the Roman Catholic Church, you fall away from the true Church. This is the bait with which they hook the people. Luther continues, 
when i had disapproved all the arguments against me with scripture and thus overcome them i scarcely succeeded by the grace of god in overcoming with great anxiety trouble and labour this one final argument that i must hear the church for with all my heart i was much more in earnest and much more reverent in regarding the pope's church as the true church than these abominable and blasphemous perverters who are now opposing me boastfully with the pope's church if I had despised the Pope, as those despise him nowadays who are praising him highly with their lips, I should have been afraid to see the earth open and devour me, as it did Korah and his mob. Luther had already discovered the untenableness of nearly every papistic teaching except this one point, which, he says, troubled him greatly at the beginning, and kept him from becoming really assured of the truth and being cheerful the papists themselves cooked the soup which they had to eat later god's hour had come for revealing the antichrist may god keep you from becoming entangled with this false teaching concerning the church namely that the lutheran church is the true visible church of jesus christ in the sense that one can be saved only in this church the lutheran church is indeed the true visible church however only in this sense that it has the pure, unadulterated truth. As soon as you add the qualification alone saving to the Lutheran Church, you detract from the doctrine of justification by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, and confound law and gospel. May God keep you from this error for the sake of your own soul, and those that will be entrusted to your care. End of Lecture 32Lecture 33 of the Proper Distinction Between Law and Gospel by C. F. W. Walther Translated by W. H. T. Dow This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 33rd Evening Lecture, September 4th, 1885 It goes without saying, my friends, that the first and the indispensable requisite of a theologian is a complete, accurate, and clear knowledge of every single doctrine of the divine revelation. It is a self-contradiction to call any person a theologian who does not possess this knowledge. Theologians, you know, are to be curates of men's souls. A physician must know above all the remedies which nature furnishes for the healing of bodily ills. In like manner, the physician of souls, that is, the theologian, must have a good knowledge of the spiritual remedies which the word of God furnishes for the ills of the soul. These spiritual remedies, however, are nothing else than the doctrines which God has revealed for our salvation. However, while an accurate, complete, and clear knowledge of every single doctrine of God's revelation to man is indispensably necessary to a theologian, this does not by any means represent his entire need. There are chiefly two additional requisites which are no less needed by him, namely, in the first place, a good knowledge of the mutual relations of doctrines to one another which will enable him to make the proper application of each. In the second place, courage, love, and liking for his theological calling. A physician may know all sorts of medicaments which possess the natural virtue of healing, but by ignorantly mixing them in a wrong way he may neutralize their virtue, and instead of curing the physical ailment of his patient, hasten on his death. In like manner, a theologian who does not know which doctrines he may combine and which doctrines he must carefully keep separate, may easily harm more than help a soul. Lastly, a physician will properly discharge his onerous duties only when he is actuated by love and a liking for his special work, and is unconcerned about the filthy lucre which he may gain for his work. Even so, a theologian will be faithful in his calling only when he is filled with enthusiasm for it, and finds his chief reward in the help which God affords him for the saving of souls in the destruction of the kingdom of Satan, in the building up of the kingdom of God, and in the increasing number of those who are people in heaven. I have ever considered it my sacred duty, not only to present the pure doctrine in my dogmatic lectures according to the grace which God has given me, but I also deemed it necessary to find an hour at least once a week when I might gather the entire student body of our beloved Concordia about me, 
and show them the importance, the meaning, and the practical applications of the doctrines that are studied in dogmatics, and above all, cheer their hearts for their difficult calling. We call these Friday evening lectures, which form, as it were, the conclusion of the week's instruction, Luther Hours, chiefly because in these hours I let our beloved father, Luther, the God-appointed reformer and the common teacher of our church, speak to you. God has hitherto graciously blessed these lectures, for my beloved students have gladly attended these evening lectures, and many of them have solemnly assured me that they have been benefited by them, that they have not only gained a clearer knowledge of the Christian doctrine, but have also been made more certain of the forgiveness of their sins, of their adoption by God as His dear children, and of their future blessedness. I cherish the hope that God will help also the students who just entered our Concordia, and whom we welcome tonight, to have the same beneficial experiences. I shall pray God to grant me grace to speak to you as I should, and that what I say will be well received by you. Bear in mind, however, that if my prayer is to be heard, you will have to add your prayer to mine for a blessed experience of the truth. For you are not here for the purpose of acquiring knowledge of secular sciences, but for the purpose of being taught how to become familiar with a doctrine which, in the first place, will save you, and then save many others through your ministry. This requires very earnest application. You will have to put off your shoes of the earthly, carnal mind, and with Mary sit down at Jesus' feet to hear from Him what is the one thing needful. God grant this, and make me be a helper to you for all time. On the basis of twenty-five theses, we started last year to discuss the distinction between the law and the gospel. Five theses still remain to be discussed, and these are by no means unimportant. We must finish these before we take up another subject. I hope that our new entrants, although they will only hear a fragment of the present subject discussed, will nevertheless get some food for their spirit out of these lectures, some strengthening of their faith, and some inducement to withdraw from the world and leave the service of sin, and something that will attract them to Jesus. For if we who are here assembled are not true Christians, we are utter reprobates, on whom God cannot but look down in anger. For can there be a drearier prospect than not being a Christian, and yet drawing pay for the time which one serves as pastor of a congregation? I hope that you are all true Christians, that the blessed word of God has drawn you, and by its power has made a deep and lasting impression on you, and that some day when you leave this institution, you will go forth equipped not only to be a fine stock of theological knowledge, but also with a heart burning with zeal to proclaim the great things which the Lord has done for mankind. I hope that the students of last year will not consider it tedious if I read all the theses which have already been discussed, in order that our new friends may know what the discussion has been about, and how important the remaining theses are. The first twenty theses were read and briefly commented on. True faith, which does not grow spontaneously out of any person, is so firm that, though the heavens were to cave in, and hell were to open its maw, its possessor could defy them by his believing appeal to Jesus Christ, true God, who has redeemed him a lost and condemned creature with his precious blood, and secured him against the ravages of all the devils of hell. The faith of hypocrites, however, is like the snow of March which melts in the sun. Some imagine they are quite strict Lutherans when they assert that no one can be saved who is not a Lutheran, or who does not profess the Lutheran doctrine at least on his deathbed but this claim stamps them not as genuine Lutherans, but as apostates from Lutheranism. The Lutheran Church does not set up such a claim, but it does, indeed, instruct men how to be justified and saved by grace. There are persons living among the sects that love the truth, and may be better Christians than some Lutherans. Christ rules everywhere, even among his enemies. Thesis 21 in the seventeenth place, the word of God is not rightly divided when men are taught that the sacraments produce salutary effects ex opere operato, that is, by the mere outward performance of a sacramental act. 
the grave error which is scored by this thesis is held by the papists who teach men that they will derive some benefit by men who are still unbelievers provided they are not actually living in mortal sins that mere act is said to bring them god's favour or make god gracious to them they teach the same regarding the mass and the lord's supper namely that grace is obtained by the mere act of attending these rites this impious and abominable teaching contradicts point-blank the word of god in particular the gospel which teaches that a person is justified before god and saved by grace alone and that he cannot perform any good work until he has thus been justified romans three twenty eight paul writes therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law if i am justified if i obtain grace by my act of submitting to baptizing or by my act of going to communion i am justified by works and that altogether paltry works scarcely worth mentioning for that is what baptism and holy communion are when viewed as works that we perform it is a horrible doctrine wholly contradicting the bible that divine grace is obtained if a person at least makes external use of the sacraments the truth is that baptism and holy communion place any person under condemnation who does not approach them with faith in his heart they are means of grace only for the reason that a divine promise has been attached to an external symbol having water poured on me is of no benefit to me nor am i benefited by actually receiving the body and blood of the lord in the lord's supper yea i am rather harmed by going to communion without faith because i become guilty of the body and blood of the lord it is of paramount importance that i believe that i regard not the water in baptism but the promise which christ has attached to the water it is this promise that requires the water for only to it has the promise been attached the same applies to the holy supper it is impious to imagine that the act of approaching the lord's table doing something that the lord wants done is one more merit that he will have to credit to our account the lord says take eat this is my body which is given for you drink ye all of it this cup is the new testament in my blood which is shed for the remission of sins these words open up a heaven full of divine grace to the communicant and to these words he must direct his faith the mere act of eating the bread with the body of christ and the drinking the wine with the blood of christ produces no good effect in us grace does not operate in a chemical or in a mechanical manner but only by the word by virtue of god's saying continually thy sins are forgiven thee to this word i must cling by faith if i do that i can confidently meet god on the last day and if he were preparing to condemn me i could say to him thou canst not condemn me without making thyself a liar thou hast invited me to place my entire confidence in thy promise i have done that and therefore i cannot be condemned and i know that thou wilt not do it if god were to try the faith of his christians even on the last day all his saints would cry it is impossible that we should be consigned to perdition here is christ our surety and mediator thou wilt have to acknowledge o god the ransom which thy son has given as payment in full for our sin and guilt romans fourteen twenty three we read whatsoever is not of faith is sin how then can a person who uses the sacraments without faith become acceptable to god by that act or obtain god's grace by it since he is committing a sin by doing something that does not proceed from faith in this connection the statement too deserves to be pondered that is recorded concerning the working of god's word on the innermost powers of man hebrews four twelve for the word of god is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart false teachers admit that preaching unless it is received by faith does not benefit the hearers but rather increases their responsibility however they claim the situation is different as regards the sacraments since these have they say this great advantage over the preached word 
that God operates with his grace through them whenever men merely use them. That is an impious doctrine, because the sacraments are nothing else than the word of God attached to a symbol. Augustine beautifully calls them verbum visibili, the visible word. The word of God does not benefit a person who does not believe. Even so, an unbeliever is not benefited by going through the action of being baptized. When we urge men to believe in their baptism, the meaning is that they are to believe their Heavenly Father who has attached such a glorious promise to baptism. The idea that God is highly pleased when a person offers his head to have water sprinkled on it is an abominable misuse of the verbum visibili. As the word does not benefit a person who does not believe, even so the sacraments help only those who embrace them by faith. Therefore the charge of fanatics that Lutherans do not urge conversion is baseless. The charge rests on the assumption that Lutherans teach men to rely on the fact that they have been baptized and received Holy Communion. But that is not at all what we teach. This is our doctrine. There is a certain promise of God attached to baptism and the Lord's Supper, which is to be embraced without doubting. That can be done only by men who have become poor sinners. To say to a person, you must take comfort in your baptism, and you must turn to Jesus Christ, is identical. A person may imagine that he is a believer, but a brief affliction will suffice to dissipate that notion. Only the Holy Spirit can give a person true faith. End of Lecture 33Lecture 34 of The Proper Distinction Between Law and Gospel by C. F. W. Walther, translated by W. H. T. Dow. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 34th Evening Lecture, September 11, 1885. Nowadays, anyone who insists that pure doctrine is a very important matter is at once suspected of not having the right Christian spirit. The very term, pure doctrine, has been proscribed and outlawed. Even such modern theologians as wish to be numbered with the confessionalists, as a rule, speak of pure doctrine only in derisive terms, treating it as the shibboleth of dead-letter theology. If anyone goes to the extreme, as it is held to be, of fighting for the pure doctrine and opposing every false doctrine, he is set down as a heartless and unloving fanatic. What may be the reason? Unquestionably this, that modern theologians know full well that they have not that doctrine which in all ages has been called, and verily is, the pure doctrine. Furthermore, they even think that pure doctrine does not exist, is a known ends, except in a dream world, in the realm of ideals, in the Republic of Plato. The time in which we live is that to which the Apostle refers when he says of errorists, that they are ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. 2 Timothy 3.7 The spirit of our time is that of Pilate, to whom the Lord has testified that he was a king of truth in a kingdom of truth, and who sneeringly replied, What is truth? John 18.38 This unhappy man was most likely thinking in his heart, that since the greatest minds for thousands of years had vainly tried to find the answer to the question, what is truth, this poor beggar, this contemptible Nazarene Christ, made himself simply ridiculous with his claim that he was the king of truth, and would establish a kingdom of uncontrovertible and eternal truth. Contempt of the pure doctrine is contempt of the truth, for the pure doctrine is simply nothing else, absolutely nothing else, than the pure word of God. It is not, as some think, the doctrine adapted to the systems of dogmaticians that has been accepted by the Church. Accordingly, contempt of the pure doctrine is proof that we are living in an unspeakably lamentable era. For listen in what terms the Scriptures themselves speak of God's word and the pure doctrine. In the prophecies of Jeremiah we read chapter 23, verse 28, the prophet that hath a dream, let him tell a dream. And he that hath my word, let him speak my word faithfully. What is the chaff to the wheat? 
David addresses God himself in these words of Psalm 94, verse 20. Shall the throne of iniquity have a fellowship with thee, which frameth mischief by a law? By the term law, he refers in general to the word of God. What says our dear Lord Christ himself regarding this matter? In John eight thirty one through 32 he says, If ye continue in my word, then ye are my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Over against this, German theologians are not ashamed to say, Bah, we are seeking after the truth, but only a conceited, self-satisfied person will claim to have achieved it. Such talk shows to what depths we have sunk. Does not the Lord say distinctly, Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free? Jude, the faithful apostle, writes in his epistle, verse 3, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. The apostle is referring not to faith in a person's heart, but to faith objectively viewed, that is, to the pure doctrine. John, the beloved disciple, the spokesman of love, writes, Second Epistle 9-11, through 11, Whatsoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you, and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God speed. For he that biddeth him God speed is partaker of his evil deeds. The holy apostle Paul writes to Titus concerning the qualities of a Christian pastor. Chapter 1, 9-11 through 11. Holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouth must be stopped, who subvert whole households, teaching things which they ought not, for filthy lucre's sake. In his first epistle to Timothy, chapter 4, verse 16, he writes, Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them. Lastly, he writes to the Galatian congregation, after errorists had found their way into them, in chapter 5, 7 through 9. Ye did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. He means to say that a single false teaching vitiates the entire body of the Christian doctrine, even as a little poison dropped into pure water produces a deadly potion. Let us picture to ourselves as vividly as we can the situation that would have been created in the early church when errorists like Arius, Nestorius, and Pelagius arose. If men like Athanasius, Cyril, and Augustine had not earnestly opposed them. As far back as in the 4th and 5th centuries, the church would have lost the primary article of the Christian faith. The foundation would have been removed from beneath it, and it would have had to collapse. That was, indeed, impossible in view of the eternal counsel of God concerning the church. However, because of that very counsel, God had to raise up instruments, such as those teachers were, True, while they lived, they were hated and persecuted as malicious disturbers of Christendom. But for more than a thousand years their names have been beacon lights, as names of great witnesses to the saving truth, and in eternity they will shine as the brightness of the firmament, and as the stars for ever and ever. Daniel 12.3 Let no one, then, be deterred from giving his testimony in behalf of the truth by the charge that he has a false spirit. That charge emanates only from unbelief. Again, suppose Luther, after learning the truth, had indeed borne testimony for it to his immediate associates, but had not entered into conflict with the papacy because of the great abominations which it had introduced into the church. What would have happened? Christianity would have to remain under the sole tyranny of the Roman Antichrist, and we all should still be subjects of it. There is no question, then, but that both, yes, both these efforts are necessary. 
to defend the truth and to oppose every doctrinal error. To qualify you for both tasks is one of the aims of these Friday evening lectures. May God bestow his blessing on the discussion of this subject that is before us tonight. At our last meeting, we barely began to discuss the important contents of the twenty-first thesis, namely, that law and gospel are not properly divided, the one from the other, when it is claimed that by the mere performance of the act of being baptized and going to communion, salvation can be obtained. This is a most abominable way of confounding law and gospel. The gospel merely says, Believe, and thou shalt be saved, while the law issues the order, Do this, and thou shalt live. Now if the mere act of being baptized and partaking of Holy Communion brings grace to a person, the gospel manifestly has been turned into a law, because salvation then rests on a person's works. Moreover, the law has been turned into a gospel, because salvation is promised a person as a reward for his works. One would indeed think it to be utterly impossible for a Christian minister to teach that the sacraments produce salutary effects ex opere operato. Still, that is what happens again and again. This awful error is taught by the very men who wish to pass for genuinely strict Lutherans, every time they discuss the sacraments. When they have finished unfolding their doctrine of baptism, every hearer has received the unmistakable impression that in order to get to heaven it is merely necessary to submit to the act of being baptized. When they have finished their presentation of the doctrine of the Lord's Supper, the people are convinced that to obtain the forgiveness of sins, all that a person has to do is mount the altar steps and take communion, because God has attached His grace to this external action. A week ago I began to show you that this teaching is diametrically opposed to the doctrine of the gospel. This is proved by all passages which testify that the gospel requires nothing but faith, and makes faith the one essential. That being the case, no one dare say that this or that work will benefit a person. If the word that is preached will not benefit a person unless he believes it, neither will being baptized and taking communion benefit any one without faith. Telling a person that he shall be saved by faith means nothing else than that he shall be saved by grace. Most people express the matter thus. If you wish to be saved, you must perform this task and that, but you must not omit to believe. That is what God requires of you. Over against this notion, remember the precious text of Romans 4.16. Therefore it, righteousness, is of faith that it might be by grace. Any teaching that is set up contrary to the doctrine that man is not saved by his works, his running, or any effort of his own, but by grace alone, is an error that subverts the foundation of the Christian doctrine. You must believe means you must accept what is offered you. Our Father in heaven offers men forgiveness of sins, righteousness, life, and salvation. But of what benefit is a present that is not accepted. Accepting a present is not a work by which I earn the present, but it signifies laying hold of what is being offered. When I extend my hand with a gift in it to a beggar, I am not certain whether he is going to accept the gift, though I am in full earnest offering it to him. If he lets my gift fall to the ground, he naturally gets nothing. Let me offer you a few passages that treat in particular of the sacraments. Mark 16.16. 16. The Lord says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He does not say, He that is baptized and believeth, but the reverse. Faith is the primary necessity. Baptism is something to which faith holds. Moreover, the Lord continues, But he that believeth not shall be damned. This shows that even if a person could not have baptism administered to himself, he would be saved as long as he believed. Acts 8, 36-37 we read, And as they went on their way, they came to a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. 
The only thing that Philip required was faith, as if he had said to the eunuch, If you do not believe, being baptized will not benefit you at all. At our baptism it is not we that are performing a work, but God. Galatians 3, 26-27, Paul writes, For we are all the children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. This text shows that Christ is put on in baptism only if a person believes. The current interpretation is that any one that is baptized has put on Christ. However, that is not what the Apostle says, but as many of you, namely, of you who are the children of God by faith. Such people indeed put on Christ in baptism. An unbeliever who receives baptism does not put on Christ, but keeps on the spotted garment of his sinful flesh. At the institution of the Holy Supper, the Lord says, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Take and drink ye all of it. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the remission of sins. The Lord does not merely say, This is my body, but he adds, Which is given for you. He does not merely say, This is my blood, but he adds, Which is shed for you for the remission of sins. It is plain that, that he means to say, The point of chief importance is that you believe that this body was given for you, and that this blood was shed for the remission of your sins. That is what you must believe if you wish to derive the real blessing from this heavenly feast. By the additional remarks, Do this in remembrance of me, Christ means to say, Do it in faith. Surely he does not mean to say, Think of me when you partake of the body and blood. Do not forget me altogether. Whoever thinks that Christ merely admonished his disciples not to consign him to oblivion does not know the Saviour. The true remembrance of Christ consists in the believing reflection of the communicant. This body was given for me. This blood was shed for the remission of my sins. That gives me confidence to approach the altar. To this truth I shall cling by faith and esteem my Saviour's pledge very highly. For when God adds a visible pledge to his word, who is there that dares to doubt that his word is truth and his promise will certainly be fulfilled? Remember this for the good of your own soul and conscience. As often as you go to communion, have these words shine before your eyes, given for you, shed for you for the remission of sins. If you fail to do this, if you imagine that by going to communion you have once more done your duty, and that God will regard your performance, your going to communion is a damnable act that will land you in eternal perdition. To go to communion and eat the body of Christ and drink his blood with such a mind is an impudent action, but it is no impudence to hold fast to the word of his promise. Romans 4.11 we read, he, Abraham, received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had yet been uncircumcised. Here we are told that Abraham believed before he was circumcised. Circumcision was intended to be merely a seal to him of the righteousness which he had by faith. It is an act of great kindness on the part of God, knowing how slow we are to believe, even after we have become believers, to add external signs to his word, and to attach his promise to them. For the sacraments are connected with, and comprehended in, God's word. The lustrous star that shines out from the sacraments is the word. Our church is frequently charged with teaching that baptism procures for us, ex opera operato, adoption as children of God, and the Lord's Supper, ex opera operato, the forgiveness of sins. False teachers din this falsehood into people's ears, giving it out for Lutheran doctrine. If that were our doctrine, we should indeed not feel surprised if all true Christians were to shun us. It would be awful if we were to say first, man is not saved by works, and next, however, by these two paltry works men are to obtain forgiveness of sins. True, many Lutherans determine by the almanac whether it is time for them to go to communion again, because they imagine that going to communion is a work which a Christian must perform, and which he cannot afford to neglect. 
lest they approach the altar and eat and drink death and damnation to themselves. What is to urge a person to go to communion is the promise of grace which God has attached to the visible signs in the sacrament. If a person approaches the altar with faith in that promise, he will leave the table of the Lord with a blessing in his heart. It is a pity that many think and say, I have been brought up to consider it my duty to go to communion. If I perform this duty, then I am sure of my salvation. True, the Lutheran Church speaks of the sacraments in terms of such high esteem that fanatics become disgusted with it. The Lutheran Church holds to the word of the Lord, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. That is the reason why it condemns all false teachers, which say that baptism is merely a ceremony by which a person is received into the church. According to Lutheran teaching, baptism works forgiveness of sins, delivers from death and the devil, and gives eternal salvation to all who believe, as the words and promises of God declare. The Lutheran Church maintains that baptism is the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, that the water in baptism, as Peter says, saves us, and that those who have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. As regards the Lord's Supper, the Lutheran Church, resisting all attempts to mislead her into doubt, maintains the truth of the Lord's words when he says, This is my body which is given for you. This is my blood which is shed for you. The Lutheran Church regards the holy sacraments as the most sacred, gracious, and precious treasure on earth, and is firmly convinced that God is not a miserable master of ceremonies, who decries what rites we are to observe when receiving a person into our communion. Christianity is not a Masonic society. When God commands a sacramental act, He commands something upon which our salvation depends. However, at no time has the Lutheran Church asserted that men are saved by the mere external use of the sacraments. That is a teaching against which it has always raised its voice, which it has always combated and condemned. At this point modern theologians again reveal their papistic attitude, which is a strange thing to do for men who are more inclined to rationalism. They declare that baptism is regeneration, and from this false statement many form their wrong opinion of what the Lutheran Church teaches. Baptism, according to Lutheran teaching, is not regeneration, but affects it, produces it. It is a means of regeneration. However, in order to make you see quite plainly that the Lutheran Church has nothing to do with the teaching of ex opera operato effects of the sacrament, let me present a few testimonies from its confessions. In the small catechism of Luther, we read, How can water do such great things? Answer, It is not the water indeed that does them, but the word of God which is in and with the water, and faith which trusts such word of God in the water. When Peter says, 1 Peter 3.21, that the like figure whereunto, namely, the water in baptism typified by the water of the flood, also now saves us, he speaks by way of synecdoche. It is to the sacramental act of holy baptism that God has attached a great and glorious promise of grace. Again we read in the sixth chief part of the Catechism, How can bodily eating and drinking do such great things? Answer, It is not the eating and drinking indeed that does them, but the words which stand here, namely, given and shed for you for the remission of sins. Which words are, besides the bodily eating and drinking, as the chief thing in the sacrament? And he that believes these words has what they say and express, namely, the forgiveness of sins. Modern theologians, as a rule, interpret the phrase, the chief thing in the sacrament, to refer to the word of God which is recited in connection with the sacrament, and which they term, in dogmatic phraseology, forma sacrae cheni, that which gives the Lord's Supper its proper form. That is not at all what the Catechism means. It treats in this place of the effect of the sacrament, and declares that the chief thing, as regards the effect, is this, that the words stand there, given for you, shed for you. In the Augsburg Confession, Article 13, we read, of the use of the sacraments, they teach that the sacraments were ordained not only to be marks of profession among men, but rather to be signs and testimonies of the will of God toward us, instituted to awaken and confirm faith in those who use them. 
Wherefore we must so use the sacraments that faith be added to believe the promises which are offered and set forth through the sacraments. Our faith is to be awakened and confirmed by the sacraments. The mere preaching of the word is to strengthen the Christian's faith. But when he is told that, in addition to the word, God has instituted a special sacred act to which his promise has been attached, he must feel as if he were before the very gate of heaven. God wants to save us by his free grace. It is folly, therefore, to reason thus. What, am I to be saved by baptism, by offering my head to have water poured on it? Is that to save me? Indeed not. Man is not to do anything to save himself. We are not to wonder that God prescribes for us something of which every man's reason must tell him, that cannot possibly be the thing by which I am to merit salvation. Fanatics, however, persuaded the people that such is our doctrine, and that it is a remnant of papistic teaching that has not been sloughed off by the Lutheran Church. The mere mechanical action of being baptized, if it is not accompanied by faith, will earn for man nothing but perdition. The truth of the matter is this. God is so kind that he not only has his mercy preached to men, but in addition tells them to come to the sacrament, by which he seals to them the promise of grace, which they are only to believe. Likewise, a person who imagines that he obtains forgiveness of sins by the mere act of eating and drinking the Lord's Supper is under a delusion. The body of Christ does not produce effects in a physical manner, as modernists claim when they say that it implants in man the seed of immortality. That idea is nothing but a dream of speculative theology, of which not a word is said in Scripture. Lastly, we have in our confessions a plain condemnation of the teaching that the sacraments produce ex opera operato effects. In the Apology of the Augsburg Confession, Article 12, we read, if we call sacraments rites which have the command of God and to which the promise of grace has been added, it is easy to decide what are properly sacraments. For rites instituted by men will not in this way be sacraments properly so called. For it does not belong to human authority to promise grace. Therefore, signs instituted without God's command are not sure signs of grace, even though perhaps they instruct the rude children or the uncultivated or admonish as to something like a painted cross. Therefore baptism, the Lord's Supper, and absolution, which is the sacrament of repentance, are truly sacraments, for these rites have God's command, and the promise of grace, which is peculiar to the New Testament. For when we are baptized, when we eat the Lord's body, when we are absolved, our hearts must be firmly assured that God truly forgives us for Christ's sake. And God, at the same time, by the word and the right, moves hearts to believe and conceive faith, just as Paul says in Romans 10.17, faith comes by hearing. But just as the word enters the ear to strike our heart, so the right itself strikes the eye in order to move the heart. The effect of the word and the right is the same. As it has been well said by Augustine that a sacrament is a visible word, because the rite is received by the eyes, and is, as it were, a picture of the word, signifying the same thing as the word. Therefore the effect of both is the same. Anything offered us under the name of a sacrament, to which, however, a promise of grace has not been added, is not accepted by us as a sacrament. Moreover, just as Scripture does not teach, as the simplest Christian knows, that the mere outward act of hearing the word does not save anyone, just as little does it teach that the sacraments save thus. The mere symbol placed before men's eyes does not produce the salutary effect, but indicates what the word proclaims. We baptize with water, which signifies that baptism affects cleansing from sin, sanctification, regeneration, and renewal. What I am being told by means of preaching, I behold in the external element of baptism. The word and the sacrament produce the same effect in the heart. Modernists pictured the situation somewhat like this. For various ills, God has ordained various remedies. They regard the word indeed as a remedy, but they imagine that baptism must be there for a different purpose, namely for the purpose of regenerating us. Again, the Lord's Supper must be for still another purpose, 
namely, of uniting us with the body of Christ. Now all these are human imaginings, about which Scripture does not say a word. The word produces faith, brings us forgiveness of sins, and gives us the grace of God and salvation. Baptism does the same, so does the Lord's Supper. Now a seal is of no benefit by itself. If I were to give you ten sheets with my seal affixed to them, you could not do business with them. When the Apostle calls circumcision a seal, it indicates that all sacraments are seals. God puts his word in writing, on paper, and by means of the sacrament seals what is contained in his gracious promises. For this reason the Lord does not merely command us to baptize, but he says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. In the pulpit the word is audible, in the sacraments it is visible. Further on the Apology says, It is still more needful to understand how the sacraments are to be used. Here we condemn the whole crowd of scholastic doctors who teach that the sacraments confer grace ex opera operato, without a good disposition on the part of the one using them, provided we do not place a hindrance in the way. This is absolutely a Jewish opinion, to hold that we are justified by a ceremony without a good disposition of the heart, that is, without faith. And yet this impious and pernicious opinion is taught with great authority throughout the entire realm of the Pope. Paul contradicts this and denies, Romans 4, 9, that Abraham was justified by circumcision, but asserts that circumcision was a sign presented for exercising faith. Thus we teach that in the use of the sacraments faith ought to be added, which should believe these promises and receive the promised things there offered in the sacrament. And the reason is plain and thoroughly grounded. This is a certain and true use of the holy sacrament on which Christian hearts and consciences may risk their confidence. The promise is useless unless it is received by faith. But the sacraments are the signs and seals of the promises. Therefore, in the use of the sacraments, faith ought to be added, so that if any one use the Lord's Supper, he use it thus. Because this is a sacrament of the New Testament, as Christ clearly says, he ought for this very reason be confident that what is promised in the New Testament, namely, the free remission of sins, is offered him. And let him receive this by faith. Let him comfort his alarmed conscience, and know that these testimonies are not fallacious, but as sure as though, and still surer than, if God, by a new miracle, would declare from heaven that it was his will to grant forgiveness. But of what advantage would these miracles and promises be to an unbeliever? And here we speak of special faith, which believes the present promise, not only that which in general believes that God exists, but which believes that the remission of sins is offered. This use of the sacrament consoles godly and alarmed minds. Moreover, no one can express in words what abuses in the church this fanatical opinion concerning the opus operatum without a good disposition on the part of the one using the sacrament has produced. Hence, the infinite profanation of the masses. But of this we will speak below. Neither can a single letter be produced from the old writers, which in this matter favors the scholastics. Yea, Augustine says to the contrary, that faith in the sacrament, and not the sacrament, justifies. When the attention of would-be strict Lutherans is called to the foregoing statement, they regard it as Calvinistic. They claim that baptism is regeneration, and that the Lord's Supper produces mysterious but altogether gracious effects in us. Of course those who know this declaration of the Apology do not say, but they think, that it is Calvinistic. Contis knew the doctrine of the Lutheran Church well enough. When I was on a visit to Germany, he made me a present of his book, The Doctrine of the Lord's Supper. In this book he says, Upon the whole, the concept of a sacrament has not been fully developed in the Lutheran Church. The fundamental concepts of the word and faith have been attached to it in too immediate a fashion. He means to say that there is indeed a certain connection between the word and faith on the one hand and the sacraments on the other hand. But it is wrong for the Lutheran Church to connect them so closely, because the sacraments operate immediately, without the word and without faith. To the apology, a sacrament is merely a qualified word, verbum visibile, quasi pictura verbi seus segilum, 
a visible word, or, as it were, a picture of the word, or a seal, which, like the word, has the power to forgive sins only by faith. In the presence of the word, the specific blessing of salvation of each sacrament is obscured, just as its specific saving effect is obscured by faith. Understand, Connus the Lutheran is rebuking our dear Lutheran Church, because it really regards sacraments as identical to the word, the only difference being that the sacraments have a visible element added to them. He declares the faith of the Lutheran Church worthless, namely, that on the part of God nothing but the word, and on the part of man nothing but faith is necessary for salvation. He insists on a difference between the word and each sacrament as regards specific salvational blessings and specific salvational operations. A baptized person is regenerated and remains so till he dies. The end and aim of the Lord's Supper can be gathered only from its essence. In the Lord's Supper we partake of the glorified body of Christ, and therein and therewith of the Spirit and the life of Christ. This false doctrine of the modernists is also held by Dalich, who formerly occupied an excellent position as regards Lutheran teaching. In his treatise, Four Books Concerning the Church, 1847, he writes on page 33, Any one who is baptized and partakes of the Lord's Supper is a member of the body of Christ. The body of Christ is the sum total of those who, by one Spirit, are all baptized into one body, and have been made all to drink into one Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12.13 Whether it is Hengstenberg, who passes for, and until shortly before his death really was, the prototype of orthodox teachers, or Wistachenus, a free thinker, by virtue of the act of God, which faith does not produce nor unbelief can frustrate, they are both members of one and the same body. Whether a person is an evangelical or a Romanist, a Socinian or a Unitarian, by virtue of their baptism they are all one in Christ. Dalich, then, numbers even Unitarians with the visible Christian Church. On page 42, he says, speaking of unbelieving and wicked persons who have been baptized in infancy, they may be parts, even organs, of the visible church, but they are no members of the church, which is the body of Christ. Dalich, here quoting correctly, but in disagreement with the teaching of the Lutheran Church, proceeds, We cannot admit that this distinction is justified. A person once baptized is unalterably a member of Christ's body. If the body of Christ contains the ungodly as dead members, through whom his lifeblood does not circulate, then the body of Christ is partially a corpse. When a person has fallen from his faith and baptismal grace, we do not tell him to construct a new ship for himself in which to continue his voyage to heaven, but to return to his faith in baptism, which is a covenant that remains unshaken because God does not cancel the word of promise which he has pledged to the baptized. The renegade, who has come to the knowledge of his fall and is penitent, has nothing else to do than to cling to God's promise given to him at his baptism, and to rest assured that since by baptism he was made a child of God, and has now been quickened out of mortal sins, he can rest assured that he will not perish. End of Lecture 34Lecture 35 of the Proper Distinction Between Law and Gospel by C. F. W. Walther, translated by W. H. T. Dow. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 35th Evening Lecture, September 18, 1885 Jesus says regarding himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. John 14.6 Peter confirms this statement by his declaration before the Jewish Sanhedrin, saying, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Acts 4.12 Paul adds his testimony by telling his Corinthians, I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. 1 Corinthians 2.2 Verily, then, it is a great and awful sin not to draw any soul that has been entrusted to us for instruction to Jesus, 
and not to tell that soul again and again what a treasure it has in the Lord Jesus, its Saviour. To keep someone from believing in Christ is such an awful sin that words cannot express it. A preacher who restrains a soul from confidently laying hold of Christ, no matter whether he does it consciously or unconsciously, purposely or from blindness, through malice or as a result of a perverted zeal for the salvation of souls, deprives that soul, as far as he is concerned, of everlasting life. Instead of being a shepherd to that soul, he becomes a ravening wolf to it. Instead of being its physician, he becomes its murderer. Yea, instead of being an angel of God, he becomes a devil to that person. Alas, ever so many preachers have not realized until their dying day how many souls they have kept away from Christ by their unevangelical preaching, and by their own fault have caused the souls entrusted to them to die of spiritual starvation. The result was that these unhappy preachers, shortly before their death, have had a severe soul battle, to fight with self-accusations and despair, and not a few of them have departed this life without consolation, in anguish, misery, and despair. The worst offenders in this respect are the so-called rationalistic preachers, who with diabolical audacity mount Christian pulpits, and instead of preaching Christ the Saviour to all sinners, recite their miserable moral precepts for a virtuous life, and fill the ears of the people with their empty bombast. To these rationalistic mercenaries, whose God is their belly, Philippians 3.19, the terrible woe is addressed, even in our day, which the Lord denounced, saying, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. Matthew 23.13 What terror shall seize these preachers, who used to call themselves friends and adorers of Jesus Christ, when they must appear before his judgment seat, and hear him address them in words of flaming anger, I never knew you, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Matthew 7.23 However, equally grievous is the offence of papists in this respect. They, too, do not draw men to Christ, the Saviour and friend of sinners, but represent Christ as a more rigorous lawgiver even than Moses, because he has laid on men many more and much more rigorous commandments than Moses. A poor sinner coming to a priest in his anguish for advice is not directed to Christ, but to Mary, the so-called Mother of Mercy. They have taught men to be afraid of Christ, telling them that Mary must take them under her sheltering cloak, or they direct them to some tutelary saint. For this horrible sin of directing poor souls away from Christ they will have to suffer the wrath of God, which will consign them to the place where the smoke of their torment ascendeth up for ever and ever. Revelation 14.11 For failing to teach and proclaim Christ, telling men not to believe in Him, is as heinous an offense as blasphemously to brand Christ as a fanatic, as the unbelievers do. Well, it is easy to avoid this gross manner of keeping men away from Christ. I need not warn you against it, but it is difficult to avoid doing the same thing in a more refined manner. Innumerable preachers imagined and that they were preaching Christ and proclaiming His doctrine until their eyes were open, and they saw that they had concealed Christ from the eyes of poor sinners, and had directed men away from Him rather than to Him. This more refined way of keeping men away from Christ is discussed in our twenty-second thesis. Thesis 22 in the eighteenth place, the word of God is not rightly divided when a false distinction is made between a person's being awakened and his being converted. Moreover, when a person's inability to believe is mistaken for his not being permitted to believe. During the first half of the eighteenth century, those who were guilty before others of this serious confusion of law and gospel were the so-called pietists. To these belonged, among others, such theologians of Halle, as August Hermann Franke, Freithaupt, Anastasius Freilinghausen, Rambach, Joachim Lange, and those who had publicly adopted their views, like Bogotsky, Fresenius, and many others. These men were guilty of that more refined way of confounding law and gospel, namely of keeping men away from Christ. They did this by making a false distinction between spiritual awakening and conversion. For they declared that, as regards the way of obtaining salvation, all men must be divided into three classes. One, 
those still unconverted, two, those who have been awakened, three, those who have been converted. Admitting that these pietists were well-intentioned men, and by no means wished to depart from the right doctrine, still their classification was utterly wrong. They would have been right if, by people who have been awakened, they had understood such persons as occasionally receive a powerful impression the word of God, of the law, and of the gospel, but promptly stifle the impression, so that it is rendered ineffectual. For there are indeed men who can no longer continue to live in their carnal security, but must suppress their unrest until God smites them again with the hammer of his law, and then makes them taste the sweetness of the gospel. But the awakened persons to whom the pietists referred are no longer to be numbered with the unconverted. According to Scripture, we can assume only two classes, those who are converted and those who are not. True, there are people who, when contrasted with true Christians, could be called awakened if they are not measured by the pattern of Holy Scripture. A great number of instances of such people are found in the Scriptures. Herod Antipas was one of them. We are told that he heard John the Baptist gladly, because John preached many comforting sermons in which he pointed to the promised Messiah. He also asked John's advice occasionally and followed it. Nevertheless, he remained the Herod he had always been. By this king's order, John had to lose his head to please a miserable dancing girl. Another instance is that of Felix the governor. Paul preached to him with great zest concerning righteousness, temperance, chastity, and judgment to come. Paul's sermons struck home, and his own conscience convicted Felix of being reprobate. And if Paul preached the truth, which he did, Felix would be lost, fornicator, unjust judge, and adulterer that he was. But he stifled the conviction immediately, and dismissed Paul, saying, Go thy way for this time, when I have a convenient season I will call for thee. Acts 24.25 He never did call for him. He was unwilling to hear that reproving voice again. A similar instance is that of Festus. When Paul had thundered at him, preaching the law to him, and then had proclaimed the good tidings of the gospel, he cried, Paul, thou art beside thyself. Much learning doth make thee mad. Acts 26.24 In spite of the deep impression which the preaching of Paul had made on him, he declared Paul a fanatic. Another instance is that of Agrippa, who even said to Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Acts 26.28 what a powerful impression the Apostle's address must have made on the king to wrest this public profession from him, that it would not take much to make him one of the despised and maligned Christians. What was lacking to make him a Christian? Nothing else than this, that he would not cease his willful, stubborn resistance, and allow the Lord to overcome him. On the contrary, he tried to conquer the Lord, and remained in his unconverted state. People like these must not be numbered with the converted. But it is wrong to call them awakened. When Scripture speaks of awakening, it always means conversion. You must bear this in mind when reading writings of pietists which contain a great deal of good. You must divide men into only two classes. The following passages will show you that by awakening, Scripture means conversion. Ephesians 5.14 Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. This is evidently a call to genuine conversion and repentance. We are to awake from spiritual sleep, and arise from spiritual death. Anyone who is thus awakened is roused not from physical sleep, but from spiritual sleep. And being awake, he has become alive, which means nothing else than that he is a Christian. Ephesians 2, 4-6 through six, But God, who is rich in mercy... For his great love therewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ. According to this passage, being awakened and being quickened are identical. Any one who has been awakened is in a blessed state. He has been translated into a heavenly life the moment he was awakened by the Holy Spirit. Colossians 2.12 Buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, 
who hath raised him from the dead. The event described in this text took place through faith. Accordingly, no one can be awakened unless he has faith. That means he must be a Christian. However, pietists object that a person who has not experienced the genuine, thorough contrition in his heart is not yet converted, but merely awakened. By thorough contrition they mean a contrition like that of David, who spent whole nights crying and weeping in his bed, and walked almost bowed down with grief for days. Anyone who has not passed through these experiences, who has not yet been sealed with the Holy Spirit, is not quite assured of his state of grace and of salvation, is always wavering or shows himself uncharitable, lacking genuine patience and the proper willingness to serve his fellow men. Such a person, they claim, is certainly not a Christian, still unconverted and only awakened. This is an erroneous assumption. A person may have become a true Christian without experiencing the great and terrible anguish of David. For although David really passed through these experiences, the Bible does not say that everyone must pass through the same experiences and suffer in the same degree. As regards the sealing with the Holy Spirit, we read in Ephesians 1.13, In whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. The sealing presupposes faith, although it may be a very weak faith, a faith that is constantly struggling with anxieties and doubts. God does not grant to every one immediately boldness of faith and heroic courage. That this is the pure, unadulterated truth can be seen in every record we have of people that were converted. Take, for instance, the first Pentecostal audience. We are told that these people were pricked in their hearts and asked the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter does not say to them, Wait a while. First you must pass through a severe penitential struggle. You will have to wrestle with God and cry to Him for a long time until the Holy Spirit gives you the inward assurance that you have obtained grace and are saved. No. The apostle merely says, Repent and be baptized. And immediately they received baptism. Repent means turn to your Lord Jesus, believe in Him, and as a seal of your faith receive baptism, and everything will be right. Of these newly converted people, we are told further on, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in breaking of bread and in prayers, Acts 2, 37, 38, and 42. Hence they had become truly converted in a few moments. The same observation meets us in the case of the Ethiopian treasurer. Philip merely says to him, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest, namely, be baptized. When the treasurer answered, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, Philip was fully satisfied, for he knew what the treasurer meant by his confession, namely, that he believed in the Messiah, God and man. After he had been baptized, they parted, and probably never saw each other again. Philip was not worried in the least whether the man was actually converted. He was quite certain of his conversion, because he had declared, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, Acts 8.37 and following. The jailer at Philippi was in despair, not on account of his sins, but because he feared that he would be executed for allowing all his prisoners to escape. Paul arrested the jailer's hand as he was about to stab himself, and cried, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. The jailer was thunderstruck. He recalled the thoughts that had stirred his heart during the night while he had heard the prisoners, whom he had subjected to such cruel treatment, praising and glorifying God. Convicted of the wickedness of his heart and the magnitude of his sin, he fell down at the apostles' feet, crying, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Paul did not say to him, oh, That cannot be done tonight. We shall first have to give you instruction and ascertain the condition of your heart. We admit that you have been awakened, but you are far from being converted. No. He simply said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. Acts 16.27 and following. The jailer believed, and was filled with joy that he had become a believer. That is all that Paul and Silas did. They left him, and when they had been given their liberty, they proceeded on their journey. Try to find a single instance in the Scriptures, where a prophet, apostle, or any other saint pointed the people another way to conversion, 
telling them they could not expect to be converted speedily, and that they would have to pass through such and such experiences. They always preached in a manner so as to terrify their hearers, and as soon as their hearers realized that there was no refuge for them, as soon as they condemned themselves and cried, Is there no help for us? They told them, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and all will be well with you. Fanatics declare that this is not the proper order of conversion. It is not the order of fanatics, indeed, but it is God's order. As soon as the gospel sounded in the ears of the persons aforementioned, it went through their hearts, and they became believers. We read that David, after receiving absolution, still had to suffer a great deal of anguish, but his penitential psalms are at the same time a confession of his assurance that God was gracious to him. It is sheer labor lost when a minister leads a person who has become alarmed over his sins a long way for months and years before that person can say yes i believe such a minister is a spiritual quack he has not led that soul to jesus but to reliance on its own works in a certain sense the pietists have been guilty of this awful sin it is just those ministers who are manifesting great zeal that are in danger of committing this great and grievous sin they are sincere and well-intentioned but they accomplish no more than tormenting souls. To every sinner who has become spiritually bankrupt and asks you, What must I do to be saved? You must say, That is very simple. Believe in Jesus, your Savior, and all is well. Consider that according to the Scriptures it is not at all difficult to be converted, but to remain in a converted state, that is difficult. Accordingly, it is a false interpretation to refer the words of the Savior enter ye in at the straight gate matthew seven thirteen to repentance repentance is not a straight gate through which a person has to squeeze repentance is something that god himself must produce in a person any kind of repentance which man produces by his own effort is counterfeit and an abomination in the sight of god we need not worry about our ability to produce repentance in ourselves we must only apply to ourselves the keen word of god and we must have the first part of repentance. After that, an application of the unqualified gospel will produce faith in us. All that a person has to do when he hears the gospel is to accept it. But this is immediately followed by an inward conflict. The error of false teachers in regard to this matter is that they place this conflict before conversion. For such a conflict, an unconverted person is not qualified. The conflict comes at a later stage, and it is severe. The narrow way is the cross, which Christians have to bear, namely that they have to mortify their own flesh, suffer ridicule, scorn, and ignominy, heaped upon them by the world, fight against the devil, and renounce the world with his vanities, treasures, and pleasures. That is a task which causes many to fall away again, soon after their conversion, and to lose their faith. Wherever the word of God is proclaimed with the manifestation of the Spirit and power of God, many more people are converted than we imagined. If we could look into the hearts of worshippers in a church where the word is thus forcefully proclaimed, and no works of men are mingled with the teaching of saving grace, we should observe many framing their salvation by the grace of God to become Christians. For they are convinced that the preacher is right. But many suppress these sensations the moment they leave the church and seek to persuade themselves that they have been listening to a discourse of a fanatic. Such persons harden themselves Sunday after Sunday, and get into almost dangerous condition past conversion. The Saviour himself says that many receive the word with joy, Matthew 13.20, but smother the sprouting germ when tribulations arise. This does not necessarily refer to severe diabolical afflictions, but, in general, to tedium as regards spiritual affairs sluggishness in prayer negligence in hearing the word of god contempt which christians have to suffer from worldly men and so forth all these things may dissipate the impressions which had been made on the christians hearts in cases like these pietists declare that there had been no conversion but does not the lord say for a while they believe luke eight thirteen hence this second class of hearers who quickly accept the gospel begin to believe however they do not permit the word to strike root in their hearts but at the next temptation to which they are exposed they again surrender to the world and their own flesh 
and all they had gained is lost. Beware, then, of the illusion that men may become secure if they are told how quickly they may be led to repentance and conversion. On the contrary, consider the greatness of God's mercy. After a person has been converted, he must be told that henceforth he will have to be engaged in daily struggles, and must think of making spiritual progress day by day, exercising himself in love, patience, and meekness, and wrestling with sin. That is a lesson for converted Christians, who begin to cooperate with divine grace in them. But by the utterly abominable teaching of fanatics, these spiritual conflicts are placed before conversion, and God is robbed of the honor due him. Our Church declares in the Formula of Concord, Solid Declaration, Article 2, Paragraph 87, The conversion of our corrupt will, which is nothing else than a resuscitation of it from spiritual death, is only and solely the work of God, just as also the resuscitation in the resurrection of the body must be ascribed to God alone, as has been fully set forth above and proved by manifest testimonies of Holy Scripture. Again, the same confession states, In a word, it remains eternally true what the Son of God says, John 15.5, Without me ye can do nothing. And Paul, Philippians 2.13, It is God which worketh in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. To all godly Christians who feel and experience in their hearts a small spark or longing for divine grace and eternal salvation, this precious passage is very comforting, for they know that God has kindled in their hearts this beginning of true godliness, and that he will further strengthen and help them in their great weakness to persevere in the true faith unto the end. Where there is a spark of longing for mercy, there is faith, for faith is nothing else than longing for mercy. A person in whom this takes place is not merely awakened in the false sense of the word, but he is converted. It is remarkable that in Philippians 2, 12-13, the Apostle says, First, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, and then continues, For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. We are to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling, for the very reason that our Heavenly Father must do everything that is necessary for our salvation. That is what the Apostle tells people who have been converted. A person who is hardened, blind, dead, cannot work out his own salvation. But a converted person can, and actually does, work out his own salvation. If he fails to do it, he is again stricken with spiritual blindness, and relapses into spiritual death. Our opponents claim that God first awakens a person, and in that act gives him the power to decide whether he will be converted or not that is a rehash of a false doctrine of former times. It overlooks the fact that a person is either spiritually dead or spiritually alive. They claim that a person must first be given a liberated will, which means that he must be quickened before he is converted. We can see from Luther in what condition those must be who are to be brought to true faith. He says, St. Louis edition, 18, page 1715, to begin with, God has given a sure promise to those who have been humbled, that is, to those who bewail their sin and despair of self-help. However, no person can thoroughly humble himself until he knows that, regardless of his own strength, counsel, striving, willing, and working, his salvation depends wholly on the good pleasure, counsel, willing, and working of another, namely of God alone. Man must be reduced to this strait, that he is convinced of the necessity of his surrendering to God unconditionally, because he cannot lift himself out of the mire of his sins. When he is in that condition, he is, in dogmatic terminology, the materia, the subject, that is to be converted. It is nothing but labor lost, and means robbing God of his honor, to urge men to rely on their own efforts towards conversion. That is frequently done by men who are quite serious about their Christianity. Luther continues, For as long as a person is convinced that he has some ability, even if it is altogether trifling, to work out his salvation, he continues to trust in himself and does not at all despair of his own efforts. Accordingly, he does not humble himself before God, 
and he selects a certain place, time, and work, by which he hopes, or at least desires, ultimately to obtain salvation. But a person who entertains no doubt whatever that everything depends on the will of God, utterly despairs of his own effort, does not do anything but expects God to work in him, such a person is closest to divine grace and salvation. Therefore these things are publicly taught for the sake of the elect, in order that they may be saved after having been humbled and crushed in the manner aforestated. The rest resist this humbling, yea, they reject the teaching that a person must despair of his own efforts, and demand that some ability be left them, even though it be quite paltry. These remain secretly proud, and enemies of the grace of God, this, I say, is the one reason for teaching the godly who have been humbled to know, to pray for, and to accept the promise of mercy. Unless a person is reduced to this condition, it is useless to preach the gospel to him. He is lost as long as he takes comfort in himself, or thinks that he can help himself over his difficulties. Accordingly, a minister must first cause people to hear the thundering of the law, and immediately after that the gospel. Otherwise, many a precious soul may be led to despair and be lost. These souls would one day be demanded of the minister, for God will not suffer himself to be mocked in this matter. End of Lecture 35。Lecture 36 of the Proper Distinction Between Law and Gospel by C. F. W. Walther Translated by W. H. T. Dow this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 36th Evening Lecture, September 25th, 1885 One should think that after their fall into sin and unutterable misery, all men would with great joy accept the doctrine of the Holy Scripture, that a person is made righteous and saved by grace alone, through faith in Jesus Christ, and that they would perceive from this very doctrine that the religion of the Bible must be the only correct one, because it is just of the religion which poor sinners like them need. Alas, the very opposite is the case. Unto this day the world has again and again stumbled and been offended, just as this doctrine of Holy Scripture, which the Apostle Paul has expressed in these words. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. Romans 9.16. Accordingly, the Apostle had to testify, even in his day, We preach Christ crucified, unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. 1 Corinthians 1.23. Yea, in those days it was actually a disgrace, in the opinion of the whole world, to proclaim this gospel of the free grace of God in Christ Jesus, so that the Apostle had to assert, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to every one that believeth. Romans 1.16 For in every man there is hidden by nature a blind, self-righteous Pharisee. Accordingly, all who have not been enlightened by God through the Holy Spirit imagine that the best and most reliable religion must be a religion that makes the most numerous and most grievous demands upon man in order to gain salvation. For salvation being something inexpressibly great, man would unquestionably have to achieve something exceedingly great to obtain it. Accordingly, when man as he is by nature observes that certain religionists make their salvation a real irksome task, he imagines that these people, surely, must be traveling the straight road to heaven. When the priests of Baal displayed such zeal in their worship of their idol, and that they cut themselves after their manner with knives and lancelets till the blood gushed out upon them, 1 Kings 18.28, the poor blind people imagined that they were the true prophets of God, and challenged the other prophets to do likewise. This continued until the prophet Elijah, by a miracle, revealed the hypocrisy of the priests of Baal. Again, when the Pharisees and scribes in the days of Christ taught the people that to be saved they must fulfill the entire law of Moses to the very last tittle, and in addition keep the traditions of the elders, the poor blind masses imagine that the religion of their Pharisees and scribes must surely be a better religion than that of Christ, who called to himself even the most besotted and abominable sinners, and offered and promised them mercy. 
again when false teachers found their way into the congregations which the apostle paul had founded in galatia they said to the members of those congregations paul may be a powerful speaker but he is pointing you to a way of salvation that is too easy and too broad they said that to be a christian one must among other things indeed believe in christ but besides that one must also keep the law of moses to be saved in a short time nearly all congregations in galatia fell away from paul and his doctrine being deluded by the false glamour which those false teachers spread about themselves that has been the way at all times why does such a mass of people why do so many millions remain under popery spite of the fact that popery has been revealed as anti-christian on account of the glamour of good works with which the papists surround themselves why do so many people in our country fall in with the preachers of fanatical sects because these sects spread the glamour of great sanctity about themselves alas man regards the works of god as trifling but esteems the works of men highly that is nothing but one of the sad results of man's fall into sin would that this horrible confounding of law and gospel and in particular this horrible leavening of the gospel with the law occurred only in popery and among the fanatical sects sad to say this takes place even in our dear evangelical lutheran church it has occurred in former times and the same error is still proclaimed in our day from lutheran pulpits although not in such a crass form under this head belongs the error which has been rejected in the second part of our twenty-second thesis to which we shall now turn our attention the so-called pietists of former times and the preachers of the fanatical sects in our time not only made a false distinction between awakening and conversion and refused to regard those who were awakened as christians but they also mistook the inability to believe for not being permitted to believe when the pietists had brought a person to the point where he considered himself a poor miserable sinner unable to help himself and asked his minister what he must now do the minister did not like the apostles answer him believe in the lord jesus christ and thou shalt be saved but as a rule they told him the very opposite they warned him against believing too soon and against thinking that after having felt the effects of the law he might proceed to believe that his sins had been forgiven they told him that his contrition must become more perfect that he must feel contrite not so much because his sins would call down upon him god's anger and hurl him into perdition but because he loved god unless he could say that he felt sorry for having angered his merciful father in heaven his contrition was declared null and void he was told that he must feel that god was beginning to be merciful to him he must get so far that he could hear an inner voice telling him be of good cheer thy sins will be forgiven thee god will be merciful to thee he must continue struggling until his agony was over and having rid himself of the love of sin having been thoroughly converted he might begin to take comfort now that is an awful method the truth is we are not to be converted first and after that believe we are not to have a sensation first that we are in possession of grace but without any feeling we are first to believe that we have received mercy and after that will come the feeling of mercy which god apportions to each according to his grace some persons are without feeling of grace for a long time they behold nothing but darkness about them they feel the hardness of their hearts and the powerful stirring and raging of evil sinful lust within them accordingly to point a person to the way of salvation it is not the proper procedure to tell him that even when he feels himself a poor lost sinner he may not yet believe himself saved true no man can produce faith in himself god must do that a person may be in such a condition that he cannot believe and god is not willing to bestow faith on him a person who still considers himself sound and righteous cannot believe the full soul loatheth and honeycomb proverbs twenty seven seven a soul spiritually sated and surfeited tramples on the honeycomb of evangelical consolation john five forty four we read how can you believe which receive honour one of another 
these words which the Lord addressed to the Jews are unquestionably directed chiefly against the Pharisees. As long as a person is ambitious of honor, he cannot come to faith, because seeking one's honor is to be numbered with all other mortal sins. By the above statement, the Lord has declared that a person who simply will not quit a certain sin cannot believe in him. The law must first crush the sinner's heart before the sweet comfort of the gospel is applied to him. But from this fact the inference must not be drawn that the sinner may not believe. It is forever true that any person may believe at any time, even when he has fallen into the most grievous sin, and realizing suddenly that he has forsaken God, rises with a crushed heart, he may believe. Whoever tells him that he may not yet believe is either a wicked person, or one who in this respect is still blind. To tell a person that he may not believe is, in the first place, contrary to the perfect redemption of Christ from all sins, and to the perfect reconciliation which he has accomplished. For in 1 John 2, 1 and 2, the Apostle says, If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The entire world, then, has been reconciled. The wrath of God which hung lowering upon the whole world has been removed. Through Jesus Christ, God has become every man's friend. That is the reason why the holy angels sang, even over his cradle, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, good will toward men. Luke 2.14 In Christ, God showed his good will toward all men. Second Corinthians 5.14 we read, If one died for all, then were all dead. By this precious statement, the Apostle means to say that since Christ died, it is the same as if all men had suffered death for their sins, namely the death which Christ died. It is the same as if all had atoned for their sins by death. Now that the entire world has been redeemed and reconciled to God, is it not a horrible teaching to tell any person that he may not believe, that he has been reconciled and redeemed, and has the forgiveness of sins? By that doctrine, the completeness of redemption and reconciliation with God is shamefully denied. Furthermore, this doctrine is contrary to the gospel. After finishing the task of redemption and reconciliation, Christ says to his disciples, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. Mark 16.15 To preach the gospel means nothing else than bringing to every creature the glad tidings that they have been redeemed that heaven is opened to all, that all are made righteous, that perfect righteousness has been brought to them by Christ, and that men are but to come and enter by the gate of righteousness, even as they shall one day enter by the gate of eternal salvation. Is it not horrible to tell men that they may not believe this? Everybody is to know that the gospel is for him, that God has had the glad tidings brought to him. For what purpose? in order that he may believe it and take comfort in it. If he refuses to believe it, he declares God and all his prophets and apostles liars. Is it not horrible to tell people who have learned by experience that they are poor lost sinners and are still mired in sin, that while God has indeed redeemed them, much remains still to be done on their part before they may believe and be actually redeemed? By this horrible teaching, the sinner wants to share with God in the work of redemption. That is nothing short of blasphemy. Nor does this harmonize with the fact that God has already declared in the presence of heaven and earth, of angels and men, My Son has reconciled the world to me. I have accepted his sacrifice. I am satisfied. He was your surety, and I have set him free. Therefore rejoice, for you have nothing to be afraid of. By the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, God has absolved the entire world of sinners from their sins. Is it not horrible for men to say that this is indeed a fact, but that a person may not yet believe it? Does not that mean to charge God with lying, and to deny the resurrection of Christ from the dead? Furthermore, this teaching is also contrary to the doctrine of absolution. 
Christ says to his disciples, Matthew 18, 18, Whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And in John 20:23, 20, Whosesoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them, and whosesoever sins ye retain, they are retained. He does not speak of certain qualities which persons must possess, but simply said, Whosesoever sins ye remit, they are remitted. Whatsoever ye shall loose, shall be loosed. Only a genuine Lutheran believes this. To all sects it is an abomination to hear it. They twist these precious words from the mouth of truth, so that they are made to say something altogether different, different from what they really do state. However, it is verily true, my friends, that Jesus Christ, after redeeming the entire world, has given his followers power to forgive everyone's sins. Some claim that the meaning of Christ is this. When a minister notices that a person is in the proper condition, he may persuade him to believe that he has forgiveness of sins. But these are human imaginings. What the Lord says is simply this, Thy sins are remitted. Moreover, this statement is readily comprehended by anyone who believes in the completeness of the redemption and reconciliation with God, which Christ accomplished. To illustrate, suppose a king has declared that a rebellious town has been granted full amnesty, and no one is to suffer for his sedition. In a case like that, anybody can say, the king has quelled the rebellion, he has conquered you rebels, but you can be of good cheer, because he has pardoned you. I know this for a certainty, because I myself heard the king say so. If the speaker, in addition, were to bring a document signed and sealed by the king which contained the same statement, everybody would rejoice and begin to celebrate the event. The situation is identical with the case now under discussion. By the resurrection of Christ, God has declared that he is reconciled with all mankind and does not intend to inflict punishment on anybody. He has this fact proclaimed in all the world by his gospel, and, in addition, has commanded every minister of the gospel to forgive men their sins, promising that he will do in heaven what the minister is doing on earth. The minister is not first to look up to heaven to ascertain what God is doing. He is merely to execute his orders on earth and forgive people's sins, relying on God's promise that he is forgiving them. To some people this looks like a horrible doctrine, but it is the most comforting doctrine imaginable, and is firmly established on the blood of Christ that was shed on the cross. Sin really has been forgiven, and all that God is now concerned about is that we believe this fact. We absolve men from their sins for no other purpose than to strengthen the faith of those who ask absolution in what they have heard proclaimed from the pulpit. Accordingly, none of them can say, how can the minister know the condition of my heart? What is absolution to profit me when I am impenitent? Answer. Indeed, in that case it is of no benefit, but it is of benefit when it is believed. However, this is certain, that you have been absolved. Your eternal punishment will be all the more grievous, because you did not believe the absolution which God himself has pronounced to all sinners, and which he has ordered his ministers to continue to pronounce to them. This applies also to the sacraments. The water in baptism saves us. When the Lord offers communicants the blessed bread, and says, This is my body which is given for you, it is plain that he means to tell them they must believe, or his body will not benefit them. A person who believes that Christ, by sacrificing his body, has paid for the communicants' sins, can leave the altar rejoicing and exalting. When the Lord offering the cup says, This is my blood which is shed for you for the remission of sins, he means to emphasize particularly the words, For the remission of sins, and to cause every communicant who believes them to shout inwardly with joy when he goes home from church after communing. Lastly, mistaking inability to believe for not being permitted to believe is contrary to the practice of the apostles. Whenever a person showed the mark of a poor sinner, they told him to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. They never asked him to wait until his condition had more fully developed. To his hearers on the first festival of Pentecost, Peter said that 
while they had hated Christ, they were now believing in Him, and should be baptized in His name. Remember also the instance of the jailer at Philippi, which I have adduced so often. Fanatics, unless they plead ignorance of the apostles' practice, object to that practice because they claim that they would preach people into carnal security, and ultimately into hell by that method. Well, the blessed apostles, tis true, also had the sad experience of seeing that hypocrites had found their way into their congregations. I shall merely point to the instance of Simon the sorcerer. We are told Simon himself believed also, Acts 8.13, namely before the eyes of men, but he was revealed later as an altogether wicked man. That did not cause the apostles to become more cautious, to resolve not always to invite people to believe in the Lord Jesus. We find no evidence to that effect. For all the beautiful instances of sinners being invited by the apostles to believe immediately upon their confession of sin, follow after the account of Simon the sorcerer. It is likewise great folly to appeal to one's good intention. Pietists and many preachers among the fanatics have reasoned that to make the conversion of their hearers thorough, they must not allow them to appropriate what does not yet belong to them, because it would prove false comfort to them. But this reason is a great piece of fanaticism. They ought to reflect that our Heavenly Father is wiser than they. He knew very well that when the consolations of the gospel are imparted to all hearts, many will imagine that they too can believe them. But that is no reason why these consolations should be hushed up. We must not starve the children from fear that the dogs would get something of the children's food. But we are cheerfully to proclaim the universal grace of God freely, and leave it to God whether people will believe it or misapply it. When a trench has been dug for the erection of a very solid building, the trench must not be kept open too long, lest the rainstorm fill it up, and all previous labor be lost. A good builder promptly lays the foundation in the trench. Now the digging of the foundation takes place spiritually when men are convicted of their sins. That done, the gospel must be promptly applied to their hearers, and the entire structure of Christianity must be reared upon that. Or take another illustration. When a physician has squeezed out an ulcer, he does not decide to wait two weeks before applying the soothing balm. He puts it on immediately, lest the wound become dangerously infected and prove deadly. When the ulcers of men's sins have been squeezed out, the soothing balm of the gospel must be applied immediately. That is the correct method, while that of the Methodists is wrong. Let us now hear a few testimonies from Luther's writings regarding this matter. He writes, St. Louis edition, 11, page 1141. While regarding the first kind of preaching, namely, that of the law is going on, men are filled with anxiety when they think of God, and discover that they are damned with all their doings. They do not know what to do, their conscience becomes evil and timid, and if no one comes to their rescue speedily, they have to despair. Therefore the other kind of preaching must not be delayed a long time. The gospel must be preached to them. They must be brought to Christ, whom the Father has given us for our mediator, that we might be saved by him from pure grace and mercy, without any merit or works of our own. That is what makes the heart cheerful. It hastens to this grace like a famished deer to the water. David felt that, when in Psalm 42, 1 and 2, he wrote, As the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. Many a person might have been saved if the gospel in its fullness had been preached to him immediately. Since it was not preached to him, he either gave himself over completely to despair, or he joined the world and decided that the church was worthless. In a sermon on Easter Sunday, Luther says, St. Louis edition 12, page 1586, Now then, the benefit of the suffering and resurrection of Christ is this. He did not undergo these things in his own behalf, but in behalf of the entire world. He trampled underfoot the devil, and my sin, which on Good Friday were suspended on the cross together with him. And the devil must now flee at the mention of the name of Christ. 
if you wish to make use of these great treasures, behold, he has already bestowed them on you as a gift, but do accord him the honor of receiving them with thanks. Ponder this last statement. The gift has already been made. It is only for the sinner to accept it. Again, Luther says, in a sermon on Pentecost Monday, St. Louis edition 11, page 1104, it is none of our doing, and cannot be merited by our works. It has already been bestowed on us as a gift, and handed over to us. All that is necessary is that you open your mouth, or rather your heart, and let God fill it. Psalm 81.10 That can be done in no other way than by your believing these words. God so loved the world, and so forth. As you are here told, that faith is required for appropriating this treasure in its entirety. This is what is missing in all other churches. They do not believe that redemption has been completely bestowed as a gift on all men. They imagine that the gospel is merely an instruction regarding what men must do in order to be reconciled with God after he has been reconciled by Christ. This is a self-contradiction. Lastly, Luther writes, St. Louis edition 11, page 733 and following, Accordingly, unbelief is nothing else than blasphemy and brands god a liar for when i say to you thy sins are forgiven thee in the name of god and you do not believe it your action is tantamount to saying who knows whether it's true whether god really means what he says if you do not believe it would be better of you to be far removed from the word of god for god wants to have the preaching of his word to be regarded as nothing less than his own preaching now this is the authority which every Christian possesses as a gift from God. Of this matter I have spoken a great deal many times, therefore let this suffice. Most people, when they are being absolved, reason thus. That is indeed very comforting, provided I know that I am in the proper condition to receive it. Now that is not at all what God wants. But after redemption has been acquired, He wants it communicated to all. The situation is exactly as if God were standing before us and were pronouncing absolution to us. What would we do if God were to manifest himself to us as standing before us with life and death in his hands, calling us by name and saying, Thy sins are forgiven thee? With what joy would we depart from his presence and shout, No devil shall make salvation unreliable to me. Now, when a preacher absolves someone, it is God who is doing that. He does not want to deal with us immediately, but mediately. When hearing a Lutheran minister pronounce absolution, the sects imagine our doctrine to be that by his ordination a minister has received a mysterious power, a peculiar ability to look into men's hearts. However, that is not what we teach. But we are absolving men whenever we preach the gospel. The trouble is only that many are in the pews before us who do not believe our preaching, and go home after the service as condemned and hardened sinners. But the children of God rejoice over the good sermon they have heard, and return to their homes with a feeling that they have been eased from the burden of their sins. End of Lecture 36《Of the Proper Distinction Between Law and Gospel》by C. F. W. Walther, translated by W. H. T. Dow. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Thirty-seventh Evening Lecture, October 2, 1885 One of the most necessary and important qualities of a minister, my friends, is this, that he is animated by a sincere and ardent zeal to discharge his office properly and accomplish something of real value in the sight of God namely to pluck every soul that has been entrusted to him from hell, lead it to God, make it truly godly, and bring it into heaven. A faithful minister must have definitely given up seeking after good times, money, and possessions, honor and renown in this world. His supreme joy must be the assurance that his labor in the Lord is not in vain. That must be the most delightful reward for all his great and grievous anxieties and concerns. Daily and hourly, the sigh uttered by the aged and upright pastor Lollman in one of his beautiful morning hymns, must arise in his heart. O God, whose bread is feeding me, 
would I were of some use to thee. The most exalted example of genuine zeal in the discharge of one's office, unquestionably is Paul, the great apostle to the heathen, who in his great zeal for the salvation of his brethren according to the flesh, went so far as to say that he could wish himself accursed from Christ for his kinsmen. Romans 9.3 Luther's opinion regarding this zeal is thus expressed in his church apostle. No reason can grasp what the apostle is doing. It is too sublime a thought that a preacher would rather be accursed himself than be the cause why any soul entrusted to him must perish. However, while a genuine zeal in the discharge of one's office is necessary and important, this cannot be said regarding any kind of zeal. There is a false, ungodly, carnal zeal that does not come from God and is not produced by the Holy Spirit, but is rooted either in animosity against those who teach a different doctrine, or in the selfish thought that a display of zeal will bring the minister honor, at least in certain congregations, or in fanaticism. In the days of Christ, what zeal in the discharge of their office do we behold in the high priests, elders, scribes, and Pharisees who opposed Christ? They shunned no trouble, and never tired of using their authority against him. Accordingly, Paul says concerning the Jews, I bear them record, that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Romans 10.2 what zeal was shown by the false teachers who tried to make the congregations in Galatia distrustful of the pure evangelical doctrine of St. Paul? They traversed land and sea in their efforts. But the Apostle says concerning them, He that troubled you shall bear his judgment, whosoever he be. Galatians 5.10 He means to say, No matter how highly you esteem him as a great hero of faith, he has made you doubt the evangelical doctrine that you are saved by grace, through faith alone for Christ's sake. What great zeal was manifested by the Anabaptists in Luther's time? For the sake of their religion, they forsook house and home, wife and children, and a great number of them suffered to drowning rather than revoke their doctrine. But why cite instances? All church history proves, and our own experience in this country corroborates, the assertion that false spirits, fanaticists, manifest greater zeal in inculcating upon people their doctrine than orthodox preachers in preaching the pure truth into men's hearts. It is easy to explain why this is so. Preachers of false man-made teachings are not hindered in, but incited to their activity by their reason and their flesh and blood, while preachers of the pure doctrine of God's word are continually restrained by their reason and their flesh and blood. That makes their task a thousand times more difficult. It is easy to speak from out of one's natural heart, but it is difficult to proclaim the truth on the basis of God's word after earnestly searching the same, after fervent prayer, and after earnest struggles for enlightenment by the Holy Spirit. Why is it so difficult? Chiefly because it is so difficult rightly to divide the word of truth, or to separate properly the law and the gospel, and in no wise to confound these two doctrines as the Apostle Paul requires of every approved laborer in the vineyard of God. Our twenty-third thesis utters a warning regarding this matter. Thesis 23. In the nineteenth place, the word of God is not rightly divided when an attempt is made by means of the demands or the threats or the promise of the law to induce the unregenerate to put away their sins and engage in good works and thus become godly. On the other hand, when an endeavor is made by means of the commands of the law rather than by the admonitions of the gospel, to urge the regenerate to do good. The attempt to make men godly by means of the law, and to induce even those who are already believers in Christ to do good by holding up the law and issuing commands to them, is a very gross confounding of law and gospel. This is altogether contrary to the purpose which the law is to serve after the fall. This will very readily become manifest, when we examine, among others, the following passages of Scripture. Jeremiah 31, 31-34 Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which covenant they break, although I was a husband to them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts, and write it in their hearts, 
and will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. This precious, valuable text is like a sun that rose suddenly upon the grey dawn of the Old Testament. We see from it that while the law was written into the hearts of men even before the fall, it did not serve the purpose of making men godly. For men had been created godly and righteous in the sight of God. The only reason why men had to have the law in their hearts was that they might know what is pleasing to God. No special command was needed to inform them on that point. They simply willed whatever was God-pleasing. Their will was in perfect harmony with the will of God. This condition was changed by the fall. True, God, after the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt, repeated the law and re-established a legal covenant with the Jews. However, what did the Lord tell them by the prophet Jeremiah? This, that the legal covenant had not improved their condition, because God had to force them to comply with his will and forced obedience simply is no obedience. Accordingly, he speaks to them prophetically of a time when he will make an entirely different arrangement. That does not mean that the new arrangement was not in force even in the time of the Old Testament. The covenant, so far as it had been established with the Israelites, was a legal covenant. Yet during the time of this covenant the prophets were continually preaching the gospel and pointing to the Messiah. Concerning the new covenant, which God purposes to establish, he says that he is not going to issue any commandments, but is going to write the law directly into their mind, and give them a new and pure heart, so that they do not need to be plagued with the law with enforcements and urgings. Thou shalt do this, thou shalt do that, because that will not help matters at all. We cannot fulfill the law either. We are by nature carnal and manifestations of the Spirit are not forced from us by the law. God says, I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. That is why the law is written into our hearts. That means nothing else than this, that what the law could not effect is accomplished by the gospel, by the message of the forgiveness of sins. All that were saved in the Old Testament were saved in no other way, as Peter expressly declared at the First Apostolic Council. Now then, what are those doing who make such a perverse use of the law in the time of the New Testament? They turn Christians into Jews, and that Jews of the worst kind, who regard only the letter of the law and not the promise of the Redeemer. Not only do they mingle the law with the gospel, but they substitute the law for the gospel. Romans 3.20 Therefore by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. The plain meaning of the remarkable reason which the Apostle offers for his statement is this. At the present time the law has no other purpose than to reveal men's sins, not to remove them. Instead of removing them, it rather increases them. For when a person conceives evil lust in his heart, the law calls to him, Thou shalt not covet. That causes man to regard God as cruel in demanding what man cannot accomplish. And thus the law increases sin. It does not slay sin, but rather makes it alive. Romans 7, 7-13 What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the laws. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. This is the most appalling feature of our condition, that as we are by nature, we do not know hereditary sin, and imagine when evil lusts arise in us, and we do not exactly delight in them, that God will not lay them to our charge. However, the law serves notice on us that evil lust renders us damnable in the sight of God. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. Even pagans, the wicked Ovid among them, have declared, Nimitur invetitum, semper cupumusque negata. That means, we desire the very things which are forbidden. If they had not been forbidden, we might not desire them. The prohibition rouses our desire and a rebellious thought like this in us. What, is this to be denied us? The fall of Adam proves this. The devil had quickly turned him to his side when he said, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Genesis 3.1 That brought about the fall of our first parents. 
for without the law sin was dead. While the spiritual meaning of the law remains unperceived by man, sin lies dormant in his heart, like a frozen serpent. Man does not observe what an utterly corrupt creature he is, and while this condition lasts, he may not break forth in gross crimes. But as soon as the law is proclaimed to him, in its spiritual meaning, it becomes malicious, and cries, What, am I to be damned because sin is stirring in me? Yes, indeed, the law damns him. If he refuses to believe it, he will learn by experience that this is so. That is all the law can do. For I was alive without the law once. Paul means to say that he did not know the law because he was so blind that he regarded himself as being without the law. It is of no benefit, then, that people know the Ten Commandments if they do not understand their spiritual meaning. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died, and the commandment which was ordained to life I found to be unto death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. 1 Corinthians 3.6 For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. If the law kills, how can it make a person godly? For these words do not mean, the letter of the Holy Scripture kills. That is usually the way rationalists, and also the evangelicals, unierte, interpret them. In consequence of this ungodly and abominable perversion of the words, these people say, one must not stick to the mere words. The context shows that by the term letter, the apostle means nothing else than the law. That kills, and therefore cannot make any one godly. It may accomplish this much, that on account of it we quit this or that vice, but it cannot change our heart. Psalm 119.32 I will run the way of thy commandments, when thou shalt enlarge my heart. The psalmist does not say, When thou smitest me with the thunder of thy law, I shall run the way of thy commandments. No, in that case I do not run. But when thou comfortest me, so that my cramped heart is made large, I become cheerful, and willing to walk the straight, the narrow way to heaven. That is an experience which you may have had personally. After a long season of sluggishness and lukewarmness, during which you began to hate yourself, because you saw no way to change your condition, you happen to hear a real gospel sermon, and you leave the church a changed man, and rejoice in the fact that you may believe and are a child of God. You suddenly become aware of the fact that it is not difficult to walk in the way of God's commandments. You seem to walk in it of your own accord. How foolish, then, is a preacher who thinks that conditions in his congregation will improve if he thunders at his people with the law and paints hell and damnation for them. That will not at all improve the people. Indeed, there is a time for such preaching of the law in order to alarm secure sinners and make them contrite, but a change of heart and love of God and one's fellow man is not produced by the law. If anyone is prompted by the law to do certain good works, he does them only because he is coerced, even as the Israelites had to be coerced by the covenant of the law. Galatians 3.2 This only would I learn of you. Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? The Galatians had suffered themselves to be misled into regarding Paul's preaching of salvation by faith, through the grace of Christ alone, as very imperfect, to say the least, and hence as a dangerous doctrine by which a person might easily be led into perdition. Accordingly, they accepted the false prophet's doctrine of the law. With great sadness, Paul learned that these congregations, which he had founded himself, and which had flourished wonderfully, were being disrupted and devastated by false preachers. Accordingly, he asked them the question in our text, his object being to remind them of the great change which had taken place in them when he preached to them the sweet gospel of God's mercy. He called to their minds that they had received the Spirit, namely the Spirit of rest, of peace, of faith, of joy. He asks them, Where is the blessedness ye spake of? Yea, he says, If it had been possible, ye would have plucked out your own eyes and have given them to me. Galatians 4.15 
so thoroughly had they been seized by the grace of God, and so vividly had they perceived what a glorious, heavenly, precious doctrine Paul's was. They were transformed in heart, soul, and mind. The apostle wants them now to tell him whether they had received this new heavenly peace in their hearts, this spiritual joy, this exceedingly great confidence, through the false teachers who had dragged them back into bondage under the law. The apostle knew that the members of the congregations in Galatian went about sad and depressed, uncertain of their salvation. They were like men bewitched. They imagined, since salvation was such a great treasure, they must do something great for it and their later teachers impressed this upon them as their duty. They regarded their misery, their unfitness for everything good, as something for which they had themselves to blame, and not the false doctrine that had been put in their hearts. Remember what the Apostle is saying in this text. If you want to revive your future congregations and cause the spirit of peace, joy, faith, and confidence, the childlike spirit, the spirit of soul rest, to take up his abode among the members of your congregation. You must, for God's sake, not employ the law to bring that about. If you find your congregations in the worst condition imaginable, you must indeed preach the law to them, but follow it up immediately with the gospel. You may not present the law to them today and postpone the preaching of the gospel to them until a later time. As soon as the law has done its work, the gospel must take its place. This abominable confounding of law and gospel is practiced in the grossest form by rationalists. There really are rationalistic preachers who regard the gospel as a dangerous doctrine, a doctrine that makes men secure and unwilling to strive after godliness, because they are constantly being told that a person is made righteous and saved by faith alone. To make people godly, they preach ethics with great earnestness. What do these rationalists accomplish? The most zealous of them accomplish no more than this that some of their hearers adopt a certain kind of probity, and abstain from gross, shameful vices and crimes, but regard it as something not to be thought of, that they must obtain a new heart, and love God and their fellow men. If some one were to arise in a congregation of such people, and declare with great joy that he is loving God above all things, and that God is his all, that he is everything to him, he would be regarded as speaking out of his mind. Such people have not the least inkling that it is possible to love God above all things. The second table of the law receives no better treatment from them than the first. Little it is that a member of a so-called free congregation knows of the second table, in spite of the zealous preaching of virtue and piety by his minister. When he returns from church, he proceeds to cheat people in enormous fashion, and calls that business. He may be merged in sin and shame, and pass for an honorable man. On occasion he may show himself liberal, and give a hundred dollars today, but cheat people out of a thousand tomorrow. His maxim is, charity begins at home. When he is reproved for not conducting his business in the interest of his fellow men, but for the purpose of making a lot of money, he considers that fanaticism. You see, by means of the law we cannot raise anything better than miserable hypocrites. The situation among the papists is similar. They know nothing of the free grace of God in Christ Jesus. They preach ethics continually, interspersed with all sorts of references to Mary and the saints, but not a word of the gospel. They do not direct the poor sinners to Christ, but represent Christ as the judge of all the world, and urge men to seek help from the saints, who are to intercede for them with Christ, and make Christ gracious to them. That is the diabolical teaching of the antichristian papacy. What do they accomplish? What is the fruit of their teaching? Read the reports from countries in which the papists are dominant and are not to be watched by the Protestants. Conditions in those countries and the lives of those priests are the most abominable. The people know that their priest is the father of a number of illegitimate children. But since he has received ordination, they believe that one can obtain forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation from him. The most faithful Catholics are the Irish, a vulgar people, who practice all kinds of knavery and go to confession at Easter, where they recite their wrongdoings to the priest, have a money fine imposed on them, and are told to fast or eat fish on such and such days, and their account is settled. What an abominable practice! However, this confounding of law and gospel occurs not only among rationalists and papists, but also in the Orthodox Church, in numerous instances. It is committed in the first place by such 
as have arrived at the assurance of their state of grace only after much struggling and great anguish. They may have struggled for many years, refusing to be comforted, because they did not know the pure doctrine. When such people start out to proclaim the pure doctrine, they always intersperse their gospel preaching with remarks which cause their hearers to say to themselves that the preacher must be a godly man, but that he does not know what poor men his hearers are, for they are sure that they cannot meet the requirements laid down by the preacher. These preachers represent the best type among errors of this kind. In the second place, this confounding of law and gospel occurs when ministers become aware that all their gospel preaching is useless because gross sins of the flesh still occur among their hearers. There may be drunkards among them, or people who indulge in fistfights and so forth. These people come to church occasionally, but rarely to communion, and refuse to contribute when a collection is taken up. Now the preacher may come to the conclusion that he has preached too much gospel to them, and must adopt a different policy. He must hush the gospel for a while and preach nothing but the law, and conditions will improve. But he is mistaken. The people do not change, except that they will become very angry with their minister for not permitting them to do what they very much like to do. A collection is taken up which nets twenty cents, when he had expected twenty dollars. He resolves to give these people hell and damnation next Sunday. Possibly he may increase the collection by a few dollars, but the offering is worthless in the sight of God, because it was made under coercion. Would a planter be pleased with slaves, whom he sees, as a rule, lazily lounging about the plantation, working only at the crack of a whip? Certainly not. Neither does God love service rendered under coercion. Preachers who have succeeded in abolishing certain evils by the preaching of the law must not think that they have achieved something great. Even the most corrupt congregation can be improved, however, by nothing else than the preaching of the gospel in all its sweetness. The reason why congregations are corrupt is invariably this, that its ministers have not sufficiently preached the gospel to the people. It is not to be wondered at that nothing is accomplished by them, for the law kills, but the spirit, that is, the gospel, makes alive. Let me submit Luther's comments on Romans 12. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. He writes, St. Louis edition, 12, page 318. Paul does not say, I command you, for he is preaching to such as are already Christians and godly by faith, in newness of life. These must not be coerced by means of commandments, but admonished to do willingly what has to be done with the old sinful man in them. For any person who does not do this willingly, simply in answer to kind admonitions, is not a Christian. And any person who wants to achieve this result, by force applied to such as are unwilling, is not a Christian preacher or ruler, but a worldly jailer. A preacher of the law comes down on men with threats and punishments. A preacher of divine grace coaxes and urges men by reminding them of the goodness and mercy which God has shown them. For he would have no unwilling workers nor heedless service. He wants men to be glad and cheerful in the service of God. Any person who will not permit himself to be coaxed and urged with sweet and pleasant words, which remind him of the mercy of God abundantly bestowed upon him in Christ, to do good joyfully and lovingly to the honor of God and for the benefit of his fellow man, is worthless. And all that is done for him is labor lost. If he is not melted and dissolved in the fire of heavenly love and grace, how can he be softened and made cheerful by laws and threats? It is not a man's mercy, but the mercy of God that is bestowed on us. And this mercy Paul wants us to consider, in order that we may be incited and moved by it to serve God. It is a shocking sight to see a preacher do all he can do to produce dead works and turn the members of his congregation into hypocrites in the sight of God. When good works are forced from men by the threats or even the promises of the law, they are not good works. Only those are good works which a person does freely from the heart. Everybody knows that. When a person whose funds are low is approached by a beggar, and he reluctantly gives him an alms, his conscience tells him that the deed was worthless, because it was done from constraint, not willingly. Or if someone makes you a present, and you notice that he does it only to obtain a favor from you, you will not relish the present. You rejoice over a gift only when you know that it has been given from love. 
Even the most beautiful present is loathed when it is given under constraint. To our Father in heaven, likewise, forced gifts are repulsive. An enforcer of laws, like a jailer, is not concerned about the condition of the heart of the person with whom he must deal, but only about enforcing that person's obedience. He stands before his victim with a scourge, and tells him that the scourge will come down on his back if he does not obey. The jailer is not concerned about godly motives among his prisoners. The prisoners, on the other hand, while they are fast in stocks and in their cells and are forced to obey, are revolving plans in their minds how to avoid being caught at their next theft. That is what a preacher of the law does to the members of a Christian congregation. He puts them in stocks and fetters them. Let no minister think that he cannot induce the unwilling to do God's will by preaching the gospel to them, and that he must rather preach the law and proclaim the threatenings of God to them. If that is all he can do, he will only lead his people to perdition. Rather than act the policeman in his congregation, he ought to change the hearts of his members in order that they may, without constraint, do what is pleasing to God with a glad and cheerful heart. A person who has a real understanding of the love of God in Christ Jesus is astonished at its fire, which is able to melt anything in heaven and on earth. The moment he believes in this love, he cannot but love God, and from gratitude for his salvation do anything from love of God and for his glory. It is a useless effort to try to soften with laws and threatenings such hearts as are not melted by the love of God in Christ Jesus presented to them. The best preachers are those who, in this respect, do as Luther did, such as preach the law only accomplish nothing. In such measure as you exhibit the law in its spiritual meaning, in that measure you sink your hearers into despair, but do not make them willing to serve God. In conclusion, let me cite to you what Luther says in explanation of the words of Psalm 110, verse 3. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power, in the beauty of holiness. The prophet means to say, At the present time sacrifices are not offered to God willingly, but in dread terror of hell and from fear. But when thou shalt have conquered, after the completion of thy redeeming work, then people shall offer willing sacrifices. Luther writes, St. Louis edition 5, 988 and following. Furthermore, when the point is reached where preachers purpose to teach the people what God requires of us, and preach the law or Ten Commandments, with their threats of punishment, and their promises of blessing to incite and urge men to godliness, it is possible that some may be moved to attempt being godly, and serving God, and exercising themselves diligently and earnestly in the works of the law, as St. Paul did before he was converted and became a Christian. Saul was quite earnest in his efforts, but all his doings were hypocritical, for the law accomplishes no more than to make people perform outward acts in which their hearts do not cooperate. It leads men to a pharisaical knowledge of the law and to pharisaical activities. However, all this is sheer hypocrisy and mere external piety under constraint of the law. It does not pass muster in the sight of God. There is not yet any cordial love for the law in it, nor any cheerfulness of heart to do the law. No genuine inward obedience, fear, trust, or knowledge of God. Yea, such people do not know or understand that the law requires perfect obedience of the heart. They do not recognize their sins and disobedience. They behold the law only through a veil, and continue in their blindness, never understanding what God requires from them, and how far they are from rendering it. But when the law reaches its culmination, and puts forth its best and principal effort by bringing man to a clear knowledge and understanding that God requires of him perfect obedience with all his heart, that he is not rendering and cannot render such obedience, and hence feels in and about himself nothing than sins and the anger of God. Then it is that the real, horrible disobedience against God begins to stir in him, and he realizes the utter inability of his nature to render such obedience, and the futility of forcing from him cordial and willing obedience to God by the law. He finds that the very opposite effect is produced in him. Sentenced by the law, subjected to the anger of God, and condemned to hell, his nature begins to hate the law, and conceives a horrible anger and bitter hatred against God. Sin is becoming very sinful in him, and he falls into blasphemy, despair, and eternal death, 
unless he is rescued out of this condition by the gospel of Christ. End of Lecture 37「Lecture 38 of the Proper Distinction Between Law and Gospel」by C. F. W. Walter, translated by W. H. T. Dow. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 38th Evening Lecture, October 23, 1885 Many ministers, not all inefficient otherwise, imagine that they have accomplished much, in fact that they have achieved their aim when they have aroused their hearers from their carnal security and reduced them to a state of mind where they despair of their being in a state of grace and of their salvation. It is indeed necessary that every person who is to be saved be brought out of his false security, false comfort, false peace, and false hopes. He must indeed be made to despair of salvation and of his present condition, but that is merely a preparatory stage through which he must pass. It is not the matter of chief importance, nor the chief aim that is to be achieved with regard to him. The principal matter is that he attain to full assurance of his state of grace and his salvation, so that he may exult as a pardoned sinner with the godly poet Voltersdorf, and sing, I know, yes, I know, and shall e'er be maintaining, that as sure as God's hands in his kingdom are reigning, as sure as his Son does the heavens adorn, his pardon for sinners to me has been born. That such is the principal aim of an evangelical minister, there can be no doubt. For the minister must preach the gospel to those entrusted to him. He must bring them to faith in Christ, baptize them, and administer absolution and the Holy Supper to them. However, preaching the gospel means nothing else than telling men that they have been reconciled, perfectly reconciled, with God by Christ. Living, genuine faith of the heart means nothing else than the divine assurance that one has the forgiveness of sins, and that the gates of heaven are opened to him. Baptizing a person means nothing else than taking him out of the world of lost sinners by the command and in the name and the place of God, and giving him the solemn assurance that God is gracious to him, that God is his Father, and that he, the baptized person, is God's child, that the Son of God is his Savior, and the baptized his child and already saved, that the Holy Spirit is his comforter, and the baptized an abode of the Holy Spirit. Administering absolution to a person means nothing else than saying to him by the command and in the name and place of Christ, Thy sins are forgiven thee. Administering holy communion means nothing else than saying to him in the name of Jesus, You too are to share in the great achievement of redemption. To confirm your claim of it, this precious pledge is given you, namely the body and blood of Christ, the ransom with which he purchased the entire world. An examination of the scriptures reveals the fact that the aim of all true ministers has been to train their hearers so that they could declare themselves children of God and heirs of salvation. When Christ said to his disciples, Rejoice, because your names are written in heaven, Luke 10.20, he evidently called upon them to rejoice in the certainty of their salvation. Paul writes to the Corinthians, Ye are washed, ye are sanctified, Ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus, and by the Spirit of our God. 1 Corinthians 6.11 Peter writes to the Christians living in the dispersion, Ye were sheep going astray, but ye are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. 1 Peter 2.25 John says to his spiritual children, including himself in the statement, Now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. 1 John 3, 2 Nowhere in the Holy Scriptures do we find the apostles treating the members of the congregations as if they were uncertain regarding their standing with God. Their treatment of all of them is always such that one can see they presuppose that their members, in spite of their weaknesses and blemishes, are dear, beloved children of God. Conditions are different in our time. As a rule, even the best ministers are well satisfied if they have trained their people to come to them occasionally and complain that they have no assurance of their salvation, that they are afraid they would be lost if they were to die the next night. 
A complaint like this alarms a truly evangelical minister, whose aim is to get his hearers to profess, I know that my Redeemer lives, I know in whom I have believed. But ministers who are not truly evangelical take this complaint as evidence that they have made good Christians out of their hearers. What is the reason that so many in our day live in uncertainty about their being true Christians? The reason is that ministers as a rule confounding law and gospel, and do not heed the apostolic admonition, study to show thyself a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. 2 Timothy 2.15 For when the gospel is preached with an admixture of law, it is impossible for a hearer to attain to faith in the forgiveness of his sins. On the other hand, when the law is preached with an admixture of gospel, it is impossible for a hearer to arrive at the knowledge that he is a poor sinner in need of the forgiveness of sins. Thesis 24. In the twentieth place, the word of God is not rightly divided when the unforgiven sin against the Holy Ghost is described in a manner as if it could not be forgiven because of its magnitude. This current description of the unpardonable sin is a horrid confounding of law and gospel. Only the law condemns sin. The gospel absolves the sinner from all sins without an exception. The prophet writes, Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Isaiah 1.18 The Apostle Paul writes, Romans 5.20 Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Accordingly, Luther sings out in a glorious strain, Though great our sins and sore our woes, His grace much more aboundeth. His helping love no limit knows, Our utmost need it soundeth. Now then, what does Holy Scripture say regarding the sin against the Holy Ghost? Concerning this sin we have three parallel passages in the Synoptic Gospels, a passage in the Epistle to the Hebrews, and one in the first epistle of St. John. These passages are the real seat of doctrine for the sin against the Holy Ghost. Matthew twelve thirty through 32 He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. Wherefore I say unto you, All manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him, but whoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world nor in the world to come. This is the principal passage. It states to begin with that all blasphemy against the Father and the Son shall be forgiven. Only the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven. Now it is certain that the Holy Spirit is not a more glorious and exalted person than the Father and the Son, but He is co-equal with them. Accordingly, the meaning of this passage cannot be that the unforgivable sin is blasphemy against the person of the Holy Spirit. For blasphemy against the Father and the Son is exactly the same sin. The blasphemy to which our text refers is directed against the office or operation of the Holy Spirit. Whoever spurns the office of the Holy Spirit, his sins cannot be forgiven. The office of the Holy Spirit is to call men to Christ and to keep them with him. The text mentions in particular that the person committing this sin speaketh against the Holy Ghost. This shows that the sin in question is not committed by blasphemous thoughts that arise in the heart. Not infrequently, dear Christians imagine they have committed this sin when they are visited with horrid thoughts of which they cannot rid themselves. Our Lord Christ foresaw this, and for that reason he informed us that the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost that is not forgiven must have been uttered by the mouth. The devil shoots his fiery darts into the hearts of the best Christians, causing them to resolve in their hearts the most horrible thoughts against their Heavenly Father and against the Holy Spirit, however, against their will. Earnest Christians have complained that while going to communion they have been harassed with the most horrible thoughts against the Holy Ghost. Such thoughts are the devil's filth. When I am sitting in a beautiful room with windows open and a bad boy throws dirt into the room, I am not responsible for this. In his wise providence, God permits his dear children to be vexed day and night with such thoughts. 
the best preachers have met with such instances among the members of their congregations but that is not the sin against the holy ghost which consists in blasphemy that is pronounced orally i have had to treat spiritually a girl who even uttered thoughts of this kind but at the same time fell on the ground weeping and moaning to be delivered from her affliction by god she did not come to rest until she realized that it was not she that was uttering those thoughts satan had taken possession of her lips of course modernists who deny such power of the devil call this explanation a superstitious notion mark three twenty eight through thirty verily i say unto you all sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of men and blasphemies wherewith soever they have blasphemed but he that shall blaspheme against the holy ghost has never forgiveness but is in danger of eternal damnation because they said he hath an unclean spirit here we have the record of an actual blasphemy against the holy ghost when christ by the finger of god cast out devils the pharisees who had come down from jerusalem declared this operation of the holy spirit a work of the devil they were convinced in their hearts that it was a divine work but since the saviour had rebuked them for their hypocrisy and mean of sanctimoniousness they conceived a deadly hatred against christ and that incited them to blasphemy against the holy ghost accordingly we have here this explanation offered to us to declare a work of the holy ghost a work of the devil when one is convinced that it is a work of the holy ghost that is blasphemy against the holy ghost this shows us what a serious matter that is there are no christians that do not occasionally resist the operations of divine grace and then try to persuade themselves that they were only chasing away gloomy thoughts. Does this mean anything but that such thoughts are of the devil? The doctrine now before us warns us that if we wish to be saved, we must yield promptly to the operation of the Holy Spirit as soon as we feel it and not resist it. For in the next stage the person who resists may find himself saying, This operation is not by the Holy Spirit. The following stage will be that he begins to hate the way by which God wants to lead him to salvation, and ultimately he will blaspheme that way. Accordingly, let us be on our guard. Let us open the door to the Holy Spirit whenever he knocks, and not take the view of worldly men who regard these sensations as symptom of melancholia. This is not a jesting matter, for unless the Holy Spirit brings us to faith, we shall never attain it. Whoever rejects the Holy Spirit is beyond help, even by God. God wants the order maintained which He has ordered for our salvation. He brings no one into heaven by force. On the occasion to which our text refers, Christ had just healed the man with the withered hand, and had driven out a devil. Everybody saw that the power of God was making an inroad into the kingdom of Satan. But the reprobates who stood by said, Ah! Beelzebub is in this Jesus, that's why he can cast out inferior devils. The very action which they had witnessed, the works and the words of Christ, showed that he was arrayed against the devil and was destroying the devil's kingdom. It was wholly out of reason to imagine that the devil would help Christ in that work. Luke 12.10 Whosoever shall speak a word against the Son of Man it shall be forgiven him. But unto him that blasphemeth against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven. Again we see that it is essential to the sin against the Holy Ghost that the blasphemy is uttered, and that knowingly and purposely. We have a very important statement regarding this sin in Hebrews 6, 4-8. through 8. For it is impossible for those who are once enlightened, and have tasted of the heavenly gift, and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost, and have tasted of the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they should fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh, and put him to an open shame. For the earth that drinketh in the rain that cometh oft upon it, and bringeth forth herbs meet for them by whom it is dressed, receiveth blessings from God. But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected and nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. It is characteristic of the sin against the Holy Ghost that the person who has committed it cannot be restored to repentance. That is simply impossible. It is not God who puts men into this condition, 
but the sinner by his own fault produces this state of irretrievable impenitence. When this condition has reached a certain degree, God ceases to operate upon him, and there is no further possibility for the person to be saved. Why? Because he cannot be induced to repent. The soil of his heart has been finally blasted, and is no longer fructified by the dew and rain of divine grace. 1 John 5.16 if any man see his brother sin, a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. This passage contains important information for us, but we cannot act upon it. For we can say of no person before his death that he has committed the sin against the Holy Ghost. Even when his mouth utters blasphemies, we do not know to what extent his heart is implicated, or whether the phenomenon is not perhaps an operation of the devil, or whether he is acting in great blindness, and whether he may not be renewed unto repentance. The Christians in the days of the apostles had the gift to discern the spirits. Accordingly, St. John here means to say, when you see that God has ceased to be gracious to such or such an individual who has committed this sin, you are not to wish either that God should be gracious to him, and you are to cease praying for him. Neither may we say to God, Save those who have committed the sin against the Holy Ghost. This is a shocking statement, and yet it contains a great comfort. Someone may come to you and say, I am a wretched man. I have committed the sin against the Holy Ghost. I am quite certain of it. The afflicted may tell you of the evil he has done, the evil he has spoken, and the evil he has thought. It may really look as if he had blasphemed against the Holy Ghost. Now remember the weapon which Hebrews 6 furnishes for attacking a case like this. The person is not at all rejoicing over what he tells you. It is all so awfully horrid to him. This shows that God has at least begun to lead him to repentance. All that he need do is lay hold of the promise of the gospel. When you ask him whether he has been doing all these evil things intentionally, he may affirm that involuntarily, because Satan makes him affirm the question. When you ask him whether he wishes he had not done those evil things, he will answer, Well, yes, indeed. These things are causing me the most awful worry. That is a sure sign that God has begun the work of repentance in that person. A case like this is indeed not to be treated lightly. The sufferer must be shown that since there is in him the beginning of repentance, he has an indubitable proof that he has not committed the sin against the Holy Ghost. In general, when preaching on this subject, the minister must aim at convincing his hearers that they have not committed this sin, rather than warn them not to commit it. To a person who has really committed this sin, preaching is of no benefit. Whoever is sorry for his sins and craves forgiveness should be told that he is a dear child of God, but is passing through a terrible tribulation. Acts 7.51 We read, Stephen said to his hearers, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost, as your fathers did, so do ye. Had these people committed the sin against the Holy Ghost? No, for Stephen died praying for them. Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. Verse 60. This shows that although the Jews had committed willful sins, they had not committed the sin against the Holy Ghost. Otherwise the martyr would not have prayed for them. He was, when praying for them, thinking that an hour might come when they would no longer resist the Holy Ghost. Let us now hear Luther's comment on 1 John 5.16. He writes, St. Louis edition 9, page 1519. By the term sin unto death, I understand heresy which these people set up in the place of the truth. If they do not repent after the first and second admonition, Titus 3.10, their sin is a sin unto death. However, we may number with this class such as sin from stubbornness and indefiance, like Judas, who had been given ample warning, but because of his obstinate wickedness was beyond help. Also Saul, who died in his sins because he would not trust in the Lord. But the highest degree of obstinacy is found in those who insist on maintaining and defending their known error. The sin is not unpardonable because of its magnitude. 
For the apostle, as we heard, has distinctly declared, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. But, because the person committing this sin rejects the only means, by which he can be brought to repentance, faith, and steadfastness of faith. Luther here refers to men whose sin consists in this, that they obstinately defend against their better knowledge and conscience an error which they have recognized as such. Luther continues, Of this kind is also the sin against the Holy Ghost, or hardening in wickedness, fighting against the known truth, and final impenitence. It is undoubtedly incorrect to regard impenitence unto the end as the sin against the Holy Ghost, as Luther does, for in that case most men would have committed this sin. However, final impenitence is a feature of this sin. The special peculiarity of this sin is that it opposes the office, the operation of the Holy Ghost. To return to Luther, there is another kind of sin which is not unto death. Of this kind was the sin of Paul to which he refers in 1 Timothy 1.13, saying, I was before a blasphemer, and a persecutor, and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly and in unbelief. Paul had committed the awful sin of blaspheming, and trying to force Christians to blaspheme, but he was acting in appalling blindness. He had no inkling that he was fighting against God. Of this sin Christ speaks in Matthew 12.32, saying, Whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. Likewise, the sin of the men who crucified Christ was not unto death, for Peter said to them, And now, brethren, I wot that through ignorance ye did it. Acts 3.17 And Paul says, Had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. 1 Corinthians 2.8 However, this sin is unto death when it is defended after having been sufficiently revealed and recognized as sin, because it resists the grace of God, the means of grace, and the forgiveness of sin. Where there is no knowledge of sin, there is no forgiveness. For the forgiveness of sin is preached to those who feel their sin, and are seeking the grace of God. But these persons who have committed the sin against the Holy Ghost are not frightened by any scruples of conscience, nor do they recognize and feel their sin. Let everyone beware of resisting the Holy Ghost. When a sin has been revealed to him, and his own heart affirms that it is sin, let not his mouth deny the fact. That may not yet be the sin against the Holy Ghost, but it may be a step in that direction. There are many people who admit that we all sin in many ways every day, but when they are reproved they claim that they never harmed a child. As regards people who are distressed because they think they have committed the sin against the Holy Ghost, they would not feel distressed if they really had committed that sin and were in that awful condition of heart, but they would find their constant delight in blaspheming the gospel. However, Christians in distress still have faith, and the Spirit of God is working in them, and if the Spirit of God is working in them, they have not committed the sin against the Holy Ghost. An excellent exposition of this matter is found in Byer's Latin Compend of Positive Theology. He says in Part 2, Chapter 3, Paragraph 24, The most grievous of all actual sins, which is called the sin against the Holy Ghost, consists in a malicious renunciation and blasphemous and obstinate assaults upon the heavenly truth which had once upon a time been known by the person committing this sin. A. The manner of denominating his sin thus is derived from its object, which is the Holy Ghost. The term Holy Ghost in this place is understood metonymically. It stands for the office which the Holy Ghost discharges in converting the souls of men by the ministry of the Word. This meaning of the term is also found in Second Corinthians 3.6. The sin against the Holy Ghost, then, is a sin which is committed against the office and ministry of the Holy Ghost, and against the heavenly truth which is revealed by that office and ministry. To blaspheme the Holy Ghost means to blaspheme his ministry, to declare the operations of the Holy Ghost operations of the devil, and to offer resistance to his office. It is also called a sin unto death, this denomination being derived from the effect of the sin, because it leads quite definitely to eternal death or damnation. 1 John 5.16 
sin unto death must not be confused with mortal sin. b. The seat of doctrine for this sin is found in Matthew 12.30 and following, Mark 3.28, Luke 12.10. c. The doctrine of heavenly truth may either have been approved once upon a time with an assent of divine faith and by public profession, or it may have only been perceived so clearly that the heart of the individual was convinced and had no argument to set up against it. In the former manner, the sin against the Holy Ghost is committed by those apostles who renounce and vilify the truth which they had once known and believed, such as the author of the epistle to the Hebrews describes in chapter 6, 4 and following. In the latter class belong the Pharisees and scribes, who never approve the doctrine of Christ by their profession, although they were convinced of its truth in their heart by the scripture and the miracles of Christ, and had nothing but calumnies to set up against it. There are Lutheran theologians who claim that only a truly regenerate person can commit the sin against the Holy Ghost, but that's going too far. For nobody will believe the Pharisees to whom the Lord speaks of this sin had been truly converted at some previous time. They had simply grown up in their wickedness. It is true, however, that a person can commit this sin even after his regeneration, a fact that is to be maintained over against the Calvinists. It is probable that Judas had been a believer. One can scarcely believe that the Saviour would have called him while he was under the wrath of God. Judas fell away later, and Satan took possession not only of his body, but also of his mind. d. In other words, the renunciation of and assaults upon the heavenly doctrine must be made ecusios, willfully, Hebrews 10.26, in such a matter that the source of this renunciation and assault is pure downright malice. However, those who renounce their faith from ignorance or fear of death are not on that account sinners against the Holy Ghost, but can obtain remission of their sin. For the examples of Paul in 1 Timothy 1.13 and of Peter in Matthew 26.70 and following, when the word of God has been clearly and plainly presented to a person, and it is evident that he has been impressed by it because he is abashed, he begins to tremble, and feels that God is approaching him. It is a shocking thing in such a case to hear the person saying, No, I do not believe that. I do not believe that. You misinterpret Scripture. That may not be the sin against the Holy Ghost, but it is a step in that direction. I say a step in that direction, for the person may reconsider this act and be saved. Peter had taken three steps toward the sin against the Holy Ghost. However, he acted not from hatred against Christ, but from fear. He expected to be put in prison if he were to admit that he was a disciple of Jesus. That fear of Peter gave the devil an opportunity to overthrow this great and solid pillar of the church. But the Holy Spirit re-entered the heart of Peter, and Peter repented of his sin. e. In the passages cited under b., this sin is called speaking a word against the Holy Ghost, or blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. Accordingly, the form which this sin takes is a reviling talk that is aimed against the office of the Holy Spirit. For instance, when his teaching and the wonderful works that were performed in support of it are ascribed to the power and operation of Satan, as was done by the Pharisees. F. Accordingly, it is in its very nature a sin of such a character that it cannot be forgiven, and never is forgiven to any one, according to the passages in Matthew and Mark, because by its very nature it blocks the way to repentance. The reason, however, why final impenitence is so closely connected with this sin is that the men who commit it directly and with full malice oppose the means for their conversion and that God therefore withdraws his grace from them, and gives them over to a reprobate mind. A person who has committed the sin against the Holy Ghost is condemned not so much on account of this sin, as rather on account of his unbelief. Unbelief is the general cause, causa communis, and malicious and constant vilification of the truth, the particular cause, causa singularis, of his damnation. It is not due to an absolute decree of reprobation, as the Calvinists teach, who maintain the really diabolical error that such men cannot be saved, for the reason that Christ did not suffer and atone for their sins, and did not redeem them. There is a current opinion, 
that a certain spiera had committed the sin against the holy ghost he had come to know the evangelical truth but renounced it twice the second time under oath he got into an awful condition of mind everybody could see that he was suffering the torments of hell all attempts to comfort him failed paul vergarius attended to him in his illness and ministered the consolation of the gospel to him however all our theologians hold that spiera did not commit the sin against the holy ghost because he condemned that sin and was fully convinced that he had merited eternal perdition his sin was despair of the mercy of god moreover the reason why spiera renounced the truth was that he had feared that he would be burned by the romanists quenstedt's account of spiera is cited in byers compend part two page three hundred and twenty eight the case of Spiera is an important, solemn warning for all time. It furnished Vergarius the final impulse for quitting the papacy when he beheld the infernal agony which a person had to suffer who had renounced the evangelical truth. End of Lecture 38Lecture 39 of the Proper Distinction Between Law and Gospel by C. F. W. Walther Translated by W. H. T. Dow This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 39th Evening Lecture, November 6th, 1885 There is not a profession or calling, my friends, that has been made the subject of as profound contempt and intensive hatred as that of theologians or teachers of religion. The world regards these men as the chief, if not the, cause that delays the coming of the Golden Age. A hundred years ago, Diderot, notorious French encyclopedist, wrote, Better times will not come for the world until the last king shall have been hanged with the guts of the last priest. On account of this and similar statements, the French government ordered that the writings of Diderot be burned and the author put in prison. However, his appalling statement became not only the slogan of the French revolutionaries in 1789, but it has been the slogan also of all revolutionaries until the present time. We may expect, too, that it will be translated into action some day, for all signs point in that direction. You may live to see it realized. If only theologians and teachers of religion would not make themselves so contemptible and hated by their own fault. Alas! This sad fact is recorded not only in the annals of the history of the Church, but it is also confirmed by our own experience. There are too many teachers of religion who misuse their sacred office, their minds, their greed of money and glory, and their love of domineering. They do not only hush and even deny the truth continually, partly from a miserable fear of men, partly from an abominable fear of men, but instead of preaching the pure gospel, they proclaim the very opposite, and spread lies and errors. Why, there is no vice too shameful, no crime too awful, but teachers of religion have desecrated their office with it, and have given the world offense, grievous beyond utterance. Is this fact to deter you, my friends, from continuing your devotion to the study of theology? God forbid. Consider in the first place that the omniscient God has foreseen these sad events, and has nevertheless in his infinite wisdom adopted this order of administering the sacred office not through holy angels who did not fall from their holy estate but through fallen men who are subject to sin may god keep us from taking offence at this arrangement let us rather adore god for having made admirable provisions that his church shall not be overcome by hell in spite of the fact that it is served by such poor and at times such abominable ministers Consider in the second place, that notwithstanding the contempt of the world, the great God has highly honored the office of teachers of religion, and has exalted it above every other office. To begin with, the Son of God in the days of his flesh, and while personally administering his office, from the very beginning, cheered the first teachers with these words, He that heareth you heareth me, and he that despiseth you despiseth me, and he that despiseth me despiseth him that sent me. Luke 10.16. What glorious credentials he has furnished his ministers by these words for their itineraries to the world. Furthermore, the word of God has revealed to us the fact that not only marriage unions, 
but also unions between ministers and their congregations are concluded in heaven. What is told us concerning Jeremiah and Paul applies to all true ministers. They are appointed not only in the present time, not only at their birth, but they have been appointed by God from eternity to be his helpers for saving those who are entrusted to them. Lastly, no one has been given more glorious promises than teachers of the gospel and ministers of the word of God. By the prophet Daniel, God says, They that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars for ever and ever. Daniel 12.3 When the time comes that the worldly shall gnash their teeth, they shall witness all the elect and angels, saying to God, This man has been a faithful minister and teacher. He has proclaimed the saving word of God to a world of castaways. On yonder earth he was despised, persecuted, and maligned, but he shines now as a star, with imperishable luster. Verily, my dear friends, this fact should cheer us and keep us from becoming unfaithful to our God who has called us into this office. Of course, what the prophet has said applies only to true and faithful ministers. Bearing this in mind, let us take up the final thesis in this series, which treats of the distinction between the law and the gospel, and of the confounding of these two doctrines. In studying this thesis, we shall ponder the chief and primary requisite of a true teacher of the Christian religion. Thesis 25 In the twenty-first place, the word of God is not rightly divided. When the person teaching it does not allow the gospel to have a general predominance in his teaching. It is an exceedingly important subject that we are taking up in this our concluding study. For we are told in this thesis that law and gospel are confounded and perverted for the hearers of the word, not only when the law predominates in the preaching, but also when law and gospel as a rule are equally balanced, and the gospel is not predominant in the preaching. In view of the precious character of this subject, I am seized with fear, lest I spoil it by my manner of presentation. The longer I have meditated this subject, the more inadequate does the expression that I can give it, so precious is this matter. Let us return to the Holy Scriptures and become convinced that in a general way the gospel must predominate in the preaching of a Christian minister. The first proof of this claim is furnished by the first preacher after Christ had been born into this world. He was an angel. He preached to the shepherds who were terrified by his celestial splendor. Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy which shall be to all people. Luke 2.10 In his address there is not the least trace of the law, of injunctions, of demands that God makes upon men, but he preaches the very opposite concerning the good will and mercy of God to all men. He is joined by the heavenly host, who sing exultingly, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, good will toward men. Luke 2.14 Again, we hear nothing but a sweet, pleasant message of joy. Our Father in heaven has had his honor restored to him. He had created a race of men of whom he knew that they would fall, but he did everything possible to save men. The infant born in the stable at Bethlehem has established peace between God and mankind. The only thing that God requires is that men be pleased with his arrangement for their salvation, and take comfort and rejoice in this infant. This heavenly preacher gave us an illustration of how we are to preach. True, we have to preach the law, only, however, as a preparation for the gospel. The ultimate aim in our preaching of the law must be to preach the gospel. Whoever does not adopt this aim is not a true minister of the gospel. Mark 16, 15-16, we read, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. When these words were spoken, the time had arrived for Christ to proclaim in clear and distinct terms the basic facts of his religion for he was about to ascend to heaven, and must now give his apostles instruction how to continue his work. What does he say to them? He tells them to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. The mere term gospel serves notice on them that their message must be a message of joy. 
lest they think that his word is so infinitely great that nobody will grasp its meaning, he adds these words immediately, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, to let them know that this is what he understands by the word gospel. He proceeds, He that believeth not shall be damned. This, too, is a sweet word, for he does not say, He that has sinned much for a long time shall be damned but states no other reason for man's damnation than his unbelief. Humanly speaking, one might say that these last words are the very sweetest and the most comforting. Ponder the meaning of this statement, He that believeth not shall be damned. No matter what a person's character is, and how grievously he has sinned, nothing in his past record shall damn him. But naturally, when a person refuses to believe the words, the message of Jesus, he has to go to perdition. The Lord never makes mention of hell except for the purpose of bringing men to heaven. So in this passage, the alarming reference to damnation is merely to prompt men to accept his gracious message and not to put it from them. These last words of the Lord should not be emphasized thus, He that believeth not shall be damned. But thus, He that believeth not shall be damned. He means to say, your damnation has already been removed from you, your sin has been taken away, hell has already been overcome for you, I have rendered sufficient atonement for everything, it is now for you to believe this, and you will be saved for evermore. Second Timothy 4, 5, Paul writes, But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, ergon oyangelis do, make full proof of thy ministry. Granted that the term evangelist may refer to a special office, that does not weaken our argument. Those who were not apostles but evangelists were such because they were to preach nothing but the gospel, that is, only the doctrine by which they were to save men. True, if you meet with people who are merged in self-righteousness, in sins and vices, and in carnal security, you must first crush their stony hearts. But that is merely preparatory work. The waters of grace cannot penetrate a stony heart, but the law is merely an auxiliary doctrine. It is not the real doctrine of Christ. The law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. John 1.17 By Christ came only grace, the gospel, not a new law, as the miserable papists claim in their blindness. He preached the law merely to prepare men for the sweet comfort which he had to offer them. 2 Corinthians 3, 5-6, through 6, Paul writes, Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. The Apostle speaks of this apostolic activity. Preachers of this Christian era must bear in mind that they are preachers, not of the old covenant, but of the new. That is the reason why the apostle refers to the letter, that is, the law, which kills, and to the spirit, that is, the gospel, which gives life. A New Testament preacher, as such, has to preach nothing less than the gospel. He is really discharging an alien function when he preaches the law. It is due to the horrible blindness that papists assert that in the scriptures two doctrines must be distinguished, the old law and the evangelical law. The latter term is self-contradiction. How can there be glad tidings in a law? Add to this that the Antichrist goes so far as to contend that the evangelical law is the more grievous of the two. For the Mosaic law had been satisfied with external obedience, while the evangelical law lays its injunctions on men's innermost heart. 1 Corinthians 2, 2, Paul writes, For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. It is remarkable that during his sojourn in Corinth, Paul was day and night wrestling with the problem how to bring Christ into people's heart, and how to lay a solid foundation for their faith in Christ and their joy in Him. Jesus Christ was the marrow and substance of all his preaching the golden thread that ran through all his sermons. He wrote this fact down for our benefit. When saying farewell to our congregations, we can do so with a good conscience only if we can repeat the statement of Paul that has just been cited. 
Woe to the preacher that preaches other things. Woe to him if, in order to make men godly, he has preached the law, because he imagined that the pure, unadulterated grace of God would not save men. If he has done that, he has been an unfaithful servant. 1 Corinthians 15.3 Paul writes, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for your sins according to the Scriptures. The Apostle says, first of all, and protois, imprimus. He regarded all other matters as subordinate to this primary subject for preaching, namely, the gospel concerning Christ. Now, do not merely listen to this statement of the Apostle, but think of the time when you will be the pastor of a congregation, and make a vow to God that you will adopt the Apostle's method, that you will not stand in your pulpits sad-faced, as if you were bidding men to come to a funeral, but like men who go wooing a bride or announcing a wedding. If you do not mingle law and gospel, you will always mount your pulpit with joy. People will notice that you are filled with joy because you are bringing the blessed message of joy to your congregation. They will, furthermore, notice that wonderful things are happening among them. Alas, many ministers do not meet with those wonderful experiences. Their hearers remain sleepy. Their misers stay stingy. What is the reason? Not sufficient gospel has been preached to them. The people who go to church in America really want to hear the word of God. We are living in a free country where it is nobody's concern whether one goes to church or not. In accordance with God's will, it should be the preacher's aim to proclaim the gospel to his hearers till their hearts are melted, till they give up their resistance and confess that the Lord has been too strong for them, and henceforth they wish to abide with Jesus. It is not sufficient for you to be conscious of your orthodoxy and your ability to present the pure doctrine correctly. These are indeed important matters. However, no one will be benefited by them if you confound law and gospel. The very finest form of confounding both occurs when the gospel is preached along with the law, but is not the predominating element in the sermon. The preacher may think that he has proclaimed the evangelical truth quite often. His hearers, however, remember only that on some occasions he preached quite comfortingly and told them to believe in Jesus Christ. Without telling them how to attain to faith in Christ, your hearers will be spiritually starved to death if you do not allow the gospel to predominate in your preaching. They will be spiritually underfed, because the bread of life is not the law, but the gospel. Second Corinthians one twenty four, we read, Not for that we have dominion over your faith, but are helpers of your joy. For by faith ye stand. This is a fine text for your initial sermon. Remember this word of the apostle well. When you become ministers, you become helpers of the Christian's joy. Do not become ministers who vex and torture the people, filling them with uncertainty and causing them to go home from church heavy-hearted. Write your sermons so that you can say, If anyone hears this sermon and is not converted, it is his own fault if he goes home from church unconverted and hardened. Do not worry when you hear fanatics say that you are not truly converted, otherwise you would come down on your people with the law much more forcefully and that you are preaching your people into hell, and so forth. Let fanatics say about you what they please. You may rest assured that your method is the correct one, because you are to be helpers of joy to Christians. You are not to put them on the rack of the law. The longer you preach to your people after this method, the more they will praise God for having given them such a pastor. You may believe me when I say that in the entire course of history of the church, there will be found few communions that have such achievements to show as our synod, spite of its weaknesses and defects. That is not due to our prudence, our hard work, our self-denial. The true reason is that we have really preached the genuine gospel to the people. As soon as there arises in the hearts of hearers a desire for God's grace and mercy and the cheerful assurance that they too will be saved, they are believers. Many remain in their sins, because they think that they will never get to be so that they can go to heaven, since they can never become as godly as their godly pastor is. Do not hesitate to preach the gospel of the grace of God in Christ Jesus frankly and cheerfully, and such gloomy thoughts will soon vanish from the hearts of your hearers. Let me offer you two quotations from the symbolical books 
which show that our church too has in its confessional writings declared that the doctrine of the grace of god in christ jesus is a matter of primary importance in the augsburg confession article four we read also they teach that men cannot be justified before god by their own strength merits or works but are freely justified for christ's sake through faith when they believe that they are received into favour and that their sins are forgiven for christ's sake who by his death has made satisfaction for our sins this faith god imputes for righteousness in his sight romans three and four in the small called articles part two article one we read of this article nothing can be yielded or surrendered even though heaven and earth and whatever will not abide should sink into ruin for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved says peter acts four twelve and with his stripes we are healed isaiah fifty three five and upon this article all things depend which we teach and practice in opposition to the pope the devil and the world therefore we must be sure concerning this doctrine and not doubt for otherwise all is lost and the pope and the devil and all things gain the victory and suit over us let me offer you a quotation from luther which you ought to commit to memory and of which you should make diligent use it is found in his preface to the epistle to the galatians st louis edition nine page nine and reads in my heart there reigns and shall ever reign this one article namely faith in my dear lord christ which is the sole beginning middle and end of all spiritual and godly thoughts which i may have at any time day or night luther might well have said in my sermons and writings instead of in my heart for his sermons and writings conform to the above rule no one can preach the gospel more sweetly and gloriously than our beloved luther did he does not only offer great comfort in his sermons but he preaches so as to lay hold of any doubting hearer and drag him out of his doubts compelling him to believe that he is a child of god and would die saved if he were to die that night would to god that this testimony could be offered concerning you when you have entered the ministry pray to god on your knees for his help in order that you may repeat luther's confession would to god that this confession could be repeated by all ministers and i must add alas also by all ministers in the missouri synod for they are not all alike in some there is a legalistic trend which does great injury to the owner and to the hearers souls they do not administer their office with genuine cheerfulness and do not make their people cheerful christians but that is what you will have to do to achieve wonderful results if you preach the gospel abundantly you need not fear that your people will leave your church when some spiritual mount banc and starts an unseemly exhibition in his pulpit your people will say our minister has given us what we could not get anywhere else he is a true lutheran minister and pours out a great treasure for us every sunday commenting on john seventeen ten luther writes st louis edition eight page seven ninety eight let every one then see for himself how christ is glorified in him for there are many who boast of the gospel and know how to talk a great deal about it but having christ glorified in oneself is not such a common event that it takes place in everybody for as we were told glorifying christ or believing in him is nothing else than being assured that whosoever has him has the father and all grace divine blessings and eternal life that is something which the saints of this world the pope and the sectarian spirits cannot achieve for although some talk about christ and manage to utter these words that he is the son of god that he has redeemed us and so forth yet they never learn by their own experience how he is received used sought found and held fast and how the father is apprehended in and through him meanwhile they are soaring up into the clouds and busying themselves with their own imaginations you can observe this in some of the sectarian spirits who have learned from us to speak of christ and of faith how rarely they treat this doctrine yea how cold and inept they are whenever they have to treat this chief point of doctrine and how they rush over such texts as these and merely skim their surface 
regarding this matter as a paltry thing that everybody is able to do quite well. On examining your sermon for both its law and its gospel contents, you may find that you have given the gospel very little space. Now remember, if you come out of your pulpit without having preached enough gospel to save some poor sinner who may have come to church for the first and the last time, his blood will be required of you. Luther continues. To sum up, they are filled altogether with other thoughts, and even when they hit upon something worth while, as will happen occasionally, they have no real understanding of it, and promptly skip on to their dreams. A true minister, however, urges this article most of all, yea, without ceasing, since on it is based everything that pertains to the knowledge of God and our salvation, as you see in this evangelist John, and throughout the epistles of Paul. It is of paramount importance that your heart be full of this subject, and that you speak of it from personal experience, so that when you reach this point in your sermons you are forced to confess to your hearers that you cannot fully express all that you have experienced, that it baffles all efforts to describe it in words, and that you can merely stammer forth a few inadequate words about it. A preacher of this sort will soon notice that streams of the Holy Spirit are being poured out upon his congregation, and that even the most hardened sinners are for once brought around to Christ by the comforting preaching which they have heard. We must not imagine that saving knowledge is produced in the hearers invariably by powerful preaching of the law. Many hearers of such preaching become convinced that they would perish if they had to die immediately. When they hear a real gospel sermon, full of the richest consolation, it may readily happen that they are brought around to Christ. In Luther's House Postal, St. Louis edition 13, page 2014, we find this comment on Psalm 68, verse 18. What a king is this who has ascended on high, sat down beyond the clouds at the right hand of majesty in heaven, and has led captivity captive? While on earth he was not engaged in child's play and worthless things, but captured an everlasting enemy in a great prison. He made captives of sin and the devil, who had made captives of the entire world. Hence sin and the devil, though they are my adversaries and want to torment me, yet cannot harm me in the least if I hold fast to Christ. How foolish are ministers, who, after preaching a long time without having any success, decide to preach nothing but the law for a while, in order to arouse their people from their spiritual sleep. By that method they will accomplish nothing. This does not mean that the people are to remain lazy and not do good works, as the papists say when they revile our preaching and sarcastically call us sweet preachers. Luther is willing to bear the reproach of being called a sweet, that is, a comforting preacher. He will regard that as a trifling charge when people say that his preaching prevents men from doing good works, because he is sure by his preaching he is changing men's hearts, so that they will do good works. However, they would talk in a different strain if they had ever been in this prison, when they shall be placed at the left hand of the judge, and anguish and terror lay hold of them, they shall experience what this prison means. Accordingly, this is not a subject that may be preached to men's flesh and blood, as if they were given liberty to do according to their lust. But the story of Christ's ascension and his rule is to the end that sin may be made captive, and eternal death may not shackle us and keep us in bondage. Now, if sin is to be made captive, I, who believe in Christ, must so live that I am not overcome by hatred and envy of my fellow man, or by other sins, but must fight against sin, and say, Listen, sin, you want to incite me to become angry, to envy, to commit adultery, to steal, to be unfaithful, and so forth? I will not do it. Likewise, if sin wants to assail me from the other side, and fill me with terror, I must say, No sin, you are my servant, and I am your Lord. Have you never heard the pretty song about my Lord Jesus Christ, which David sang, saying, Thou hast ascended on high, and so forth? Hitherto you have been a hangman and a devil to me. You have held me captive, but now that I believe in Christ, you shall be my hangman no longer. I shall not permit you to accuse me, for you are a captive of my Lord and King, who has put you in the stocks and cast you beneath my feet. Understand this matter right. 
By his ascension and by the preaching of faith, Christ does not purpose to rear lazy and sluggish Christians, who say, We shall now live according to our pleasure, not doing good works, remain sinners, and following sin like captive slaves. Those who talk thus have never had a right understanding of the preaching of faith. Christ and his mercy are not preached to the end that men should remain in their sins. On the contrary, this is what the Christian doctrine proclaims. The captivity is to leave you go free, not that you may do whatever you desire, but that you sin no more. Luther means to tell us to preach the real gospel with its comfort without hesitation, and not to fear that we shall preach people into hell with the gospel. True, some may derive a carnal comfort from our gospel preaching, but we must not think that they will have an easy death with their false comfort. In the presence of death their comfort will vanish like snow before the sun in March. We are not responsible for false comfort which a hearer draws from our preaching. He lives in security and imagines that, since he is not so awfully wicked and has many good traits to show, and his getting drunk occasionally and his cursing are merely bad habits to cling to him, he will undoubtedly go to heaven. Such a person never has received the gospel that was preached to him in his heart. We must not allow occurrences of this kind to disturb us. We must cheerfully preach the gospel, since Christ has commanded us, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Oftentimes all hope seems to vanish from those who have lived in a false comfort and imagined that they were resting their confidence on what their faithful minister has preached. The minister may have an awful time with such people when preparing them for their departure from this world. They seem to despair of their salvation. God grant that some day people may say about you that you are preaching well, but not too sweetly. Do not hold forth with the law too long. Let the gospel follow promptly. When the law has made the iron to flow, apply the gospel immediately to shape it into a proper form. If the iron is allowed to cool, nothing can be done with it. Lastly, Luther writes in his house postal, St. Louis edition 13, page 800 and following, This, then, is the other rule laid down by the Lord. We are to disregard specious displays and look for fruits. He says, By their fruits ye shall know them. He illustrates his meaning by a parable. No one is so foolish as to go into a field full of thorns and thistles and look for grapes and figs. Such fruits we seek on a different plant, which is not so full of barbs and prickles. The same thing happens in our gardens. Seeing a tree full of apples or pears, everybody claims, Ah, what a fine tree that is! Again, where there is no fruit on a tree, or the tree is worm-eaten, cracked, and misshapen, everybody says the tree is worthless, fit to be cut down and cast into the fire, so that a better tree may be planted in its place. These tests, the Lord says, you must apply to the false prophets and you will not make a mistake, no matter how good their appearance may be. If a wolf had put on twenty sheepskins, still you must know him to be a wolf, and not be deceived by him. Now, what is the fruit of a true prophet or preacher, by which we can know that he is not a wolf but a good sheep? It is not his way of living, his title and office, nor his peculiar gifts of grace. For our Lord testifies, and our own experience corroborates his testimony, that people are often duped and deluded by these external marks. The genuine fruit, as the Lord states at the end of his parable, is the doing of the will of the Father in heaven. Note that the Lord in this place is not speaking of Christians in general, but of prophets. True, all Christians are to do the will of the Father, and are to be saved through doing it. We are frequently misunderstood. People imagine they can know a true prophet by the fruit of his godly life and by his great success in the ministry. But Christ says, Not every one that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Matthew 7.21 Now, doing the will of the Father refers not only to that which is expressed in the Ten Commandments and to the obedience which God demands in his law, for since we cannot do this will of God perfectly in the present life, it would be impossible for us to glory in having done the will of the Father, and hence we could not go to heaven. But the will of the Father has been expressed in John 6.40, where Christ says, This is the will of him that sent me, 
that every one that seeth the Son and believeth in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up on the last day. This is the only way in which we all, both preachers and hearers, are to walk if we are to be saved. Now the Lord in this passage speaks in particular of preachers or prophets whose real and proper fruit is nothing else than this, that they diligently proclaim this will of God to the people, and teach them that God is gracious and merciful, and has no pleasure in the death of a sinner, but wants him to live. Moreover, that God has manifested his mercy by having his only begotten Son become man. Whoever now receives him and believes in him, that is, whoever takes comfort in the fact that for the sake of his Son God will be merciful to him, will forgive his sins, and grant him eternal salvation, and so forth, Whoever is engaged in this preaching of the pure gospel, and thus direct men to Christ, the only mediator between God and man, he, as a preacher, is doing the will of God. That is the genuine fruit by which no one is deceived or duped. For if it were possible that the devil were to preach this truth, the preaching would not be false or made up of lies, and the person believing it would have what it promises. After this fruit, which is the principal and most reliable one, and cannot deceive, there follow in the course of time other fruits, namely, a life in beautiful harmony with the doctrine, and in no way contrary to it. But these fruits are to be regarded as genuine fruits, only where the first fruit, namely, the doctrine of Christ, already exists. End of Lecture 39 Recording by Jonathan Lang End of the Proper Distinction Between Law and Gospel by C. F. W. Walter Translated by W. H. T. Dow Because it is an ever-enduring gift. For that reason we must be truly grateful to God after having received eternal life for all that we are and possess. Only works proceeding from gratitude are genuinely good works. Even in our secular relations, when a person is very willing to render service to another because he hopes for a reward, we denounce him as our miserable cheat, who pretended love to us while he speculated on financial gain and simulated disinterested service for pay. Such a person nauseates us. He figures on getting more from us than he does for us, and becomes malicious and hostile to us when his hopes are frustrated. The real good works, therefore, are works to which gratitude toward God prompts us. Whoever has true faith never thinks of meriting something good for himself by his service. He cannot help expressing his gratitude by love and good works. His heart has been changed. It has been softened by the richness of God's love which he has experienced. Over and above this, God is so gracious that he rewards even the good works which he accomplishes in us. For the good works done by Christians are God's works. The objection is raised against us that, in sanctification, a person is surely doing something himself. But a person never begins any good work of his own accord. God must prompt him, and work in him, even to will, to desire to do the good work that he is to perform. Accordingly, whenever Christians seem to do something good, it is by the power and operation of God in them that they do it. The papists occasionally say that a person is justified and saved by faith, but they add, provided love is added to faith. They do not mean to say merely this, that the person who has no love has no faith. That is what we also teach in accordance with Scripture. What they mean is this, a person may have the true faith wrought in him by the Holy Spirit, but if love is not added to it, faith is absolutely worthless. That is why they call love the forma of faith. In theological terminology, you know, forma is that which makes a matter what it is, that is, an essential quality. The papists declare that if love is not added to faith, faith may be genuine, but it is not justifying faith, because love is the forma of faith. It makes justifying faith what the name indicates. Such faith they call fides formata, faith that has received the proper form. If love has not been added, they call that faith fides informis, 
faith without its proper form. The Council of Trent, in its sixth session, adopted chapter 7, canon 28, which reads, Faith, when love is not added to it, neither forms a vital union with Christ, nor does it make a person a living member of the body of Christ. Catechumens acquire the faith which confers eternal life, which faith without love cannot confer. For this reason they are told immediately the word of Christ, If thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. The papists do not speak of faith from which love springs. That would be correct. For if faith does not produce love, it is a mere sham. What they mean is this. You may have a good faith, but it does not justify you if love is not added to it. Love is not to flow from faith. That is something altogether impossible, according to their teaching, because they understand by faith the mere inert mental perception of the doctrines of the church. Love, they say, must be added to faith. Then faith will justify you. Well, if that is the case, what then is it that justifies? Only love, or a person's good works. They do not say this in plain terms, but any person who reflects but a little on what they say is compelled to get this meaning out of their remarks. If faith does not justify in the first place, then it must be that alone which is added to faith which does the justifying. By catechumens, the papists mean those who want to join their church. These are told that without love, faith does not confer everlasting life. And the words of Christ in Matthew 19.17 are cited to them for proof. Here we have the papists' faith. Faith, though admittedly necessary, does not obtain everlasting life. They say, if a person does not keep the commandments, faith is of no help to him. After he has complied with the command of Christ to believe, he must comply with the other command, to keep the commandments. The rich young man in Matthew 19 had asked the Lord, What good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? His question had not been, What must I do? But what good thing shall I do? Accordingly, Christ had to tell him, You must keep the commandments. That did not mean that the rich man could really keep them. The Lord was simply answering the question of the person who was head over heels merged in self-righteousness. When the Lord failed to cure him of his awful blindness by telling him he must love God above all things and his neighbor as himself, he gave him an additional lesson by telling him to sell all that he had and give it to the poor. That lesson sent the young man away with a sad heart. The sting had without question been driven home to him. He knew now that he did not love God above all things. He had to acknowledge that Jesus had judged him rightly. But he was not seriously concerned about his salvation. Otherwise, he would have admitted that he was unable to do what the Lord commanded, and would be lost if that was the only way to obtain everlasting life. Had he admitted that, the Lord would have told him, Here is one who can save you. Believe in me, and though you were an abominable man and had wantonly transgressed the commandments, you wilt be saved. But he went away. Without doubt, if he had become a believer, Scripture would have recorded that fact. Someone might think that possibly the papists, after all, meant only this, that a dead lip faith does not justify a person, exactly what we teach ourselves. But no, they mean to say, no matter how good a person's faith is, it does not save him unless love is added to it. That is about as wise a statement as if I would say, an apple tree may be ever so good, but unless you add fruit to it, it is not an apple tree. Why, the reverse is true. Apples do not make an apple tree, but the apple tree produces apples. However, the papists have expressed themselves quite plainly on this matter. In the aforementioned chapter in Canon, the Council of Trent decreed, If any one says that faith is lost at the same time when grace is lost by sin, or that the faith which remains in the sinner is not genuine faith, although it may not be a living faith, or that the person who has faith without love is not a Christian, let him be accursed. They assert, then, that a person falling into mortal sin does not lose faith. We would say that a person living in mortal sin may possess a perfect historical faith. However, we add that such faith is not genuine, but a mere sham. The papists, however, declare it to be genuine faith. 
They speak of faith as something apart from love. Love must join faith, in their view, in order to make faith good. They regard faith to be a beautiful receptacle that serves no other purpose than to store something away in it. The treasure that is to be placed in this vessel is love. When placed in the vessel, it makes the vessel much more precious than the vessel previously was. Thus the papists hold that faith is made precious through the addition of love. Or, they may put it this way, faith justifies, however, with the understanding that it has love. In the days of John Gerhardt, the theologians of Cologne, at that time the best reputed theologians of Rome, published the Centura Coloniensis. In this treatise they state, the fact that the just lives by his faith is not due solely to Christ or his work. Yea, its justifying forma or power it does not derive from Christ, whom it apprehends and possesses, but from its own love. This statement declares, not only that love must be added to faith, but that in justifying faith love is the only reason why it justifies. Let us now hear a few testimonies from Luther on the so-called fides formata, as contrasted with the fides informis, or faith that has a true essence, as placed over against that faith which, according to the papist view, is indeed true faith, but does not justify. In his commentary on Galatians, Luther says, The sophists, he means the papistic theologians, ready to pervert the scriptures, add these acute glosses to this passage, Galatians 3.11, The just lives by his faith. However, by the faith that is efficacious, operates, or has obtained its proper form by love, formata caritate. If faith lacks this form, informis, it does not justify. This gloss they have spun out of their own brain. They are doing violence to the prophet's, Habakkuk's, words. Luther means they have twisted and perverted this precious comforting passage. Indeed, they say, the apostle, as well as the prophet Habakkuk, have stated, the just lives by his faith. But what faith does he mean? Why, an active faith that does good works, that has love, and that has renewed the person. That, that alone, is the faith which he meant. And it is only for this reason that man lives by faith. Luther proceeds. I would not be displeased with their gloss, if, by faith properly formed, they understood a genuine faith, of which we speak in theology, or, as Paul calls it, faith unfeigned. For in that case, faith would not be set up as something distinct over against love, but it would be in opposition to a vain opinion which men may have of faith. We too distinguish between spurious and genuine faith. A spurious or fictitious faith exists in a person who has heard about God, Christ, and all the mysteries of incarnation and redemption, who has perceived these matters mentally, and knows how to talk about them beautifully, yet all remains vain imagination. His hearing of these matters has merely left an echo of the gospel in his heart, concerning which he babbles. But it is not in reality faith, for it does not renew and transform the heart, does not produce a new man, but leaves the person in his former opinion and conduct. Such faith is actually baneful, it would be better for such a person not to have it. A moral philosopher of this world is better than a hypocrite who has this faith. Mark well. Luther admits the phrase fides formata, if it is to signify nothing else than genuine faith of the heart. He knew that faith which does not purify the heart does not justify, but keeps its possessor in sin. The papists have at all times represented the Lutherans as teaching that faith alone justifies, and that therefore the believer must do no good works. This is a shameful doctrine, calculated to repel people from the practice of good works. It would amount to telling the people to quit doing good works and only to believe, and heaven would immediately be their heritage. The better in did not zealously oppose the forces of unbelief. What a change has taken place since then within the so-called Protestant Church. Vulgar rationalists, who turn the Bible into a code of ethics and declare the specifically Christian doctrines to be oriental myths and fantasies, valuable only as far as moral lessons may be drawn from them. These men have done acting their part and have gone into bankruptcy. 
Persons laying claim to intelligence nowadays refuse to be classified as vulgar rationalists. True, the so-called Society of Protestants has made an attempt to reintroduce and rehabilitate vulgar rationalism, but without success. Even the spokesman of the society declares that vulgar rationalism is antiquated. In order to be regarded as a person of brains, it is nowadays absolutely necessary for one to acknowledge that the Christian religion is a religion supernaturally revealed, and the Bible, in a sense, the word of God, namely, in as far as it contains God's word. By what process did these up-to-date believers attain to their faith? Was it by a living knowledge of their misery under sin, or by a keen perception of their damnable condition and their need of redemption? Alas, there is pitifully little evidence that such has been the case. A careful observer can hardly get any other impression than that they arrived at their faith by rationalistic speculation. That is the reason why nearly all of them reject the verbal inspiration of the Bible, and subject all books of the Bible to criticism such as only enemies of the Bible would engage in. Of course they are not conscious of being enemies of the Bible. They have turned the Christian religion into a religious philosophy. Modern theology, as to its essential qualities, is something entirely and absolutely different from the theology of former times. It does not pretend to be a system of faith. It wants to be a system of science. Modern theologians propose that, starting out from the principles of human knowledge, they are able to prove, as absolute truth, what the common people merely believe. Accordingly, there is not in modern theologians that fear which animated David when he said, My flesh trembleth for fear of thee. Psalm 119-120 Such a reverence in the presence of holy writ is found hardly anywhere. The Bible is nearly everywhere treated like the fables of Aesop. I am telling you the truth when I say this. When you begin later to compare the old with the modern theologians, you will see that I have not exaggerated. Science has been placed on the throne, and theology is made to sit at its feet and await the orders of philosophy. Accordingly, as soon as someone has become prominent in a domain of science that had not been cultivated by anyone previously, he is promptly created a doctor of theology, as if science or learning were identical with theology. Oh, my dear friends, unless you keep the light of the pure gospel shining in this land of the setting sun, which has been visited last by God, it is not possible that the day of judgment be delayed. Our time is down to the dregs of the cup. The end is at hand. While the world stands, may God help us, at least in this part of it, which was reached last by the gospel voice, to remain true to it. Do not forget, my dear friends, that there is but one way to arrive at true faith. God did not construct two or several ways, one for learned, the other for simple folk. God is not a respecter of persons. If the learned scholar wants to become a believer and be saved, he must come down from his height and sit with poor sinners, just like the cowherd or other simple folk. There is no other way to faith than that which leads through a person's knowledge of his sin and damnable condition, through the inward crushing of his heart in contrition and sorrow. A person that has not come to faith in this way is not a believing Christian, much less a theologian. However, I hope that I shall not be misunderstood when I call the aforementioned matters the only preparation for faith. If this statement is not understood correctly, it may result in an abominable confounding of law and gospel. This reflection leads us to the consideration of Thesis 11. Thesis 11. In the seventh place, the word of God is not rightly divided when there is a disposition to offer the comfort of the gospel only to those who have been made contrite by the law, not from fear of the wrath and punishment of God, but from love of God. This thesis describes chiefly the method of the Roman Church. However, the same method is adopted by all fanatics and all pietists within the so-called Protestant Church. If among these people a person is found who is alarmed over his sin, and is in a state of contrition and sorrow because of them, he is asked to state the source of his contrition, particularly whether he feels sorry for his sins merely because he knows that he is going to perdition 
and sees nothing above him but the wrath of God, and nothing beneath him but the abyss of damnation. If he admits that such is his condition, the papists and fanatics tell him that contrition, to be genuine and worthy of the name, must proceed from love of God, and the gospel cannot be proclaimed to him until he has such contrition. This is an appalling error, which can easily be shown to be such. Since the fall, the law, you know, has but a single function, namely, to lead men to the knowledge of their sins. It has no power to renew them. That power is vested solely in the gospel. Only faith worketh by love. We do not become spiritually active by love, by sorrow over our sins. On the contrary, while still ignorant of the fact that God has become our reconciled God and Father, through Christ, we hate Him. An unconverted person who claims that he loves God is stating an untruth, and is guilty of a miserable piece of hypocrisy, though he may not be conscious of it. He sets up a specious claim, because only faith in the gospel regenerates a person. Accordingly, a person cannot love God while he is still without faith. To demand of a poor sinner that he must, from love of God, be alarmed on account of his sins and feel sorry for them, is an abominable perversion of law and gospel. Here is the biblical doctrine. The sinner is to come to Jesus just as he is, even when he has to acknowledge that there is nothing but hatred of God in his heart, and he knows of no refuge to which he may flee for salvation. A genuine preacher of the gospel will show such a person how easy his salvation is, knowing himself a lost and condemned sinner, and unable to find the help that he is seeking, he must come to Jesus with his evil heart and his hatred of God and God's law, and Jesus will receive him as he is. It is his glory that men say of him, Jesus receives sinners. He is not to become a different thing, he is not to become purified, he is not to amend his conduct before coming to Jesus. He who alone is able to make him a better man is Jesus, and Jesus will do it for him if he will only believe. The proof for this doctrine from God's word is contained in the most general statement, Romans 3.20. By the law is the knowledge of sin. Here the apostle states the function of the law. It produces not love, but the knowledge of sin. A person can indeed possess that knowledge without love of God. Romans 5.20, we read, the law entered, that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. The Greek text reads, Hina pleonase ta peroptama, that is, that sin might be increased. Many sins are slumbering in a person who is still ignorant of the law. Let the law be preached to such a person forcefully. Let it strike his conscience with lightning force, and the person will not become better but worse. He begins to rear up against God and say, What, am I to be damned? True, I know that I am an enemy of God, but that is not my fault. I cannot help it. That is the effect of the preaching of the law. It drives men to desperation. Blessed the person who has been brought to this point. He has taken a great step forward on the way to his salvation. Such a person will receive the gospel with joy, while another who has never passed through an experience of this kind yawns when he hears the gospel preached, and says, That is an easy way to get to heaven. Only a poor sinner on the brink of despair realizes what a message of joy the gospel is, and joyfully receives it. Romans 4.15, the apostle writes, The law worketh wrath, Luther, wrath only. It incites men not to love God, but only to hatred of him. Romans 7, 7 and 8. St. Paul says, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, brought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law sin was dead. We always reach out for what was definitely forbidden. Man is always tempted to act contrary to an injunction or a prohibition. Even filthy Ovid had made this experience when he wrote, Litimur invetitum semper cupumusque negata. 
To be sure, even a heathen could have an experience of this kind. Ovid was a genius, but a profligate person. Among other things, he turned his thought also upon himself. Galatians 3.21, the Apostle writes, Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. Why this question and the hypothetical clause? The Apostle, no doubt, means to make the intended negation stronger. Often, when a question is raised concerning something which everybody knows is not so, the intention is to bring about a very strong negation. That is the case in this text. The Apostle means to say, The law certainly cannot save a person. Second Corinthians 3.6 we read, The letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. This precious text is horribly perverted by the evangelical, unierte, church. These people argue, it is wrong to insist on the letter of Scripture. The Spirit, general ideas drawn from the Scripture, is what must be held fast. Luther's action at Marburg, when he wrote the words, Tuto esti to somo mu, and pointed to these words again and again, is regarded as not a Christian action by these people. Indeed, Luther's action was not unionistic, but it was genuinely Christian. The meaning of the Apostle in this text, as further study will show you, is, the law killeth, but the gospel giveth life. These Bible texts are illustrated by beautiful examples recorded in Scripture, which relate exactly the conduct of certain persons before their conversion and after they had become believers. There are not many of these instances recorded, but all of them show that contrition does not flow from love of God. Lecture 21 of the Proper Distinction Between Law and Gospel by C.F.W. Walther Translated by W. H. T. Dow. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 21st Evening Lecture, March 6th, 1885. My friends, the world of unbelievers regards the tenet of the Christian religion, that for salvation everything depends on a person's faith, as an impossibility, and discredits it. It seems to them a manifest folly, yea, a proof that even the Christian religion, like all the other religions that have originated from so-called supernatural revelations, is bent on deluding people. They claim that the Christian religion, which purports to be supernaturally revealed, by making faith the chief requisite for salvation, is not superior to Brahmism, which requires faith in the Vedas, the sacred books of the Hindus, or Mohammedism, which requires chiefly faith in the Quran of Muhammad, the acknowledged prophet of lies, as containing the true religion of salvation. Their argument is that it is a matter of no moment to the Father in heaven that a person believes or disbelieves, since true religion cannot consist in anything else than an upright life, the exercise of virtue and good works. What sin, they say, can there be in a person's failure to believe, something that is utterly contrary to his God-given reason? If there is a God and a future judgment, men, they claim, will on that day not be asked what they have believed, but how they have conducted themselves during their present life. Others, endeavouring to enter more deeply into the matter, assert that, if the Father in heaven is especially pleased with the person's faith, because it is such a glorious work and such a beautiful virtue, they can see no reason whatever why he should not be equally well pleased, for instance, with a person's charity, patience, fortitude, justice, impartiality, truthfulness, and similar qualities. What is the source from which these objections to the Christian doctrine concerning faith spring? Gross ignorance is without question the primary source. People simply do not know what faith is according to the Holy Scriptures. Far from regarding justifying and saving faith as nothing else than holding fast stubbornly and strictly to certain religious teachings, as the Hindus and Mohammedans view faith, the Christian doctrine rather declares this to be entirely useless, yea, as leading people astray to perdition. It tells men that if they have no better reliance, they are building on sand. Moreover, far from assigning to faith such a prominent position on the assumption that faith is a glorious work and oppressor's virtue, Christianity teaches, on the contrary, that faith does not justify and save a person because it is such a good work, but on account of the redemption accomplished by Jesus Christ, which faith apprehends. 
This reflection takes us back once more to our tenth thesis. A week ago we were told that faith is not a dead, inert affair, but something that transforms and renews the heart, regenerates a person, and brings the Holy Spirit into his soul. Tonight we shall be occupied chiefly with the second part of the tenth thesis, which states that the word of God, the law, and the gospel is not rightly divided, but commingled, when the preacher describes faith in a manner as if it makes a person righteous and saves him for the reason that it produces in him love and a reformation of his mode of living. Holy Scriptures emphatically testify that there can be no genuine faith without love, without a renewal of the heart, without sanctification, without an abundance of good works. But it testifies at the same time that the renewal of the heart, love, and the good works which faith produces, are not the justifying and saving element in a person's faith. Innumerable passages of Scripture could be cited in proof of this statement. We shall only dwell on the principal passages. Romans 4.16 says, Therefore it is of faith, that it might be by grace, to the end that the promise might be sure to all the seed. Paul here declares that the very reason why we teach righteousness by faith is because we teach that a person is justified in the sight of God and saved by grace. Now, if faith were to make us righteous because of some good quality inherent in us, it would be a wrong conclusion to teach a person's justification by faith, since he is justified and saved by grace. Justification is by grace through faith, however, not because of good qualities inherent in faith. In justification, that is not at all taken into consideration, but merely the fact that Jesus Christ has long ago redeemed the entire world, that he has done and suffered all that men ought to have done and suffered, and that men are merely to accept his work as their own. Hence, the way to salvation is this. We are doing nothing, absolutely nothing, towards our salvation, but Christ has already done everything for us, and we must merely cling to what he has done, draw consolation from his finished work of redemption, and trust in it for our salvation. The passage in Romans is a precious text, a text that deserves to be remembered. If something that we must do belonged to the justifying quality of faith, the apostle would, in this text, be drawing a false conclusion. In that case, he should have said, By faith, in so far as it aids us to accomplish something good. But that is not the reason why faith justifies. It justifies because it accepts the merit of Christ. Faith is only the hand with which we grasp what God offers. Philippians 3, 8 through 9, the same apostle states, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Another precious passage, a veritable sun shedding bright light on the real essence of faith. The apostle declares that he is indeed righteous. However, the righteousness which he has obtained by faith is not at all his own righteousness, but the righteousness of Christ. Accordingly, when we become righteous by faith, we are made righteous by an alien righteousness. God beholds in us absolutely nothing that he could count as righteousness to our credit. It is another's righteousness which we have by faith. We have not acquired it or contributed anything towards it. Had we contributed love towards it, and were God to justify us on that account, our righteousness would not be an alien righteousness, or it would at least be only half alien to supplement our own imperfect righteousness. The Apostle declares, I have no righteousness of my own, but only the righteousness which God credits to faith. Romans 4.5, the Apostle states, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. When a person is justified, he has been previously a godless, not a godly person made godly by faith, and on that account godly. Any one possessing genuine faith acknowledges that he has been godless, meriting hell and damnation, lost, contaminated with sin from the crown of his head to the sole of his feet, 
and that a divine miracle of grace was performed on him when God said to him, the moment he believed in his Saviour, Thou art counted as righteous. I behold in thee no righteousness of thine own, but I cover thee with the righteousness of my Son, and henceforth behold in thee nothing but righteousness. Whoever does not come to Christ as an ungodly person does not come to him at all. Ephesians 2, 8-9 through 9, we read, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. This sounds as if the apostle felt that he was not saying enough to keep men from being led astray into self-righteousness. First, he says, By grace are ye saved. Next, he adds, Through faith. Lest someone think he had achieved this feat by his faith, the apostle continues, and that not of yourselves. Whence then is it? It is the gift of God. And to head off any thought of a person's own merit, he adds, not of works, such as a person's love or charity would be. He winds up with the statement, lest any man should boast. Now a person who claims that faith justifies on account of love which follows it, could say, I have been justified by faith, but that was because I loved at the same time, because I had performed good works at the same time, because I had become a different person. That is why God regards me as righteous. This thought the Apostle rules out of order by his concluding remarks. Whoever imagines that there is a little areola, a little glory, that he may claim as his own, is still without the faith that justifies is still blind, and is not walking in the way of salvation, but is headed straight for perdition. Romans 11.6, the Apostle writes, If by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. The Apostle tries to make the element of grace quite plain. He invites his readers to reflect, that when they admit that their salvation is by grace, it cannot be by merit. For that would destroy the idea of grace. Adding merit to grace renders grace void. In that case, all talk of grace is miserable bosh. On the other hand, if salvation is by the merit of works, grace does not count, or merit would not be merit. Nothing remains, then, for a person but to believe firmly that he has been made righteous out of God's pure, everlasting mercy by faith. Even when his faith bears good fruits, these follow later, after he has received all that is necessary for his salvation. First a person is saved, then he becomes godly. First he must be made an heir of heaven, then he becomes a different person. Here we have the wonderful quality of the Christian religion, if a person wants to do everything himself to get to heaven, he is lost. No, he must first be made an heir of salvation and be saved. After that, he begins to live a life filled with gratitude to God. That is why Luther says that the Christian religion is, in a word, a religion of gratitude. All the good that Christians do is not done to merit something. We would not know what to take up for the purpose of acquiring merit. Everything has been given to us. Righteousness, our everlasting heritage, our salvation. All that remains for us to do is to thank God. And then there is this, that out of great kindness, God proposes to give to those who are specially faithful in this life a peculiar glory in addition to their salvation. That is no paltry affair in the life to come. For God bestows extraordinary gifts when he gives those gifts of glory. There will be a great difference among Christians in the life to come. For even the least plus, which one of the saints receives above that which his fellow saints get in heaven, is no trifle. Why? On the first Christian festival of Pentecost, a multitude of people had gathered and heard the Apostle Peter preach. The gist of his remarks was that they were the murderers of the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth, and must tremble when thinking of the judgment. They had listened to Peter's whole address, but when he reached the point where he raised this charge against them, they became alarmed by the Holy Spirit. The record says, They were pricked to the heart. They felt as if Peter had run a dagger into their heart. They reasoned, If we have done that, we are all doomed men. 
What will God say to us when we appear before his judgment seat? He will charge us with the slain of the Messiah. We are not told that they said, Oh, we feel so sorry for having grieved our faithful God. It was not love of God, but fright and terror that made them cry, What shall we do? Nor does the Apostle Peter say to them, My dear people, we shall now have to investigate the quality of your contrition, whether it flows from love of God, or from fear of the punishment due you for your sins, from fear of hell. Not a word of this. When they put their frightened and terrified question, Men and brethren, what shall we do? The Apostle says, Repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. Since these people were already in terror over their sins, the term repentance in this text refers not to what is called the first part of repentance, contrition, but to the second part, faith. We are told that they received baptism immediately. Their metanoia, or change of mind, consisted in this, that they no longer desired to be murderers of Jesus, but wished to believe in him. Accordingly, the apostles received them, and they were numbered with the congregation of those who were saved. The example of the jailer at Philippi, to which I have referred a number of times, also illustrates the point now under discussion. I have to refer to it again and again, because it is one of the most illuminating passages of Scripture. The jailer was a scoundrel, who relished the task of beating the servants of the Lord, casting them into the inner prison or deepest dungeon, and putting their feet in the stocks, which he had not been commanded to do at all. When he imagined that all his prisoners had escaped during the earthquake, he was seized with despair and wanted to commit suicide. Paul cried to him, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. And now the jailer fell writhing and trembling at the apostles' feet, and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Nothing but his fright and terror moved him to do that. Now Paul does not say to him, First you must become contrite from love of God, but Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. Saul was put through the same experience. He had persecuted the church of God, breathing threatenings and slaughter against all Christians. He was on the way to a place where he wanted to shed the blood of Christians when the Lord himself met him in a vision. He was hurled to the ground and was astonished, stunned, while Jesus said to him, It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. When the gospel, with its sweet heavenly power, had entered into his heart, this wretched man was plucked out of his distress and misery. And now the Lord prescribed for this sinner, who had been terrified and crushed and then comforted, no other lesson than this, that instead of persecuting him, he was to confess him, after he had received baptism as a seal of the forgiveness of his sins. When you preach, do not be stingy with the gospel. Bring its consolations to all, even to the greatest sinners. When they are terrified by the wrath of God and hell, they are fully prepared to receive the gospel. True, this goes against our reason. We think it strange that such knaves are to be comforted immediately. We imagine they ought to be made to suffer much greater agony in their conscience. Fanatics adopt that method in dealing with alarmed sinners but a genuine Bible theologian resolves to preach the gospel and faith in Jesus Christ to a person whom God has prepared for such preaching by his law. There is a passage in Scripture that is frequently misunderstood, namely Second Corinthians 7.10, which reads, For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. Godly sorrow is supposed to mean sorrow of contrition from love of God. This is a mistake. The apostle refers to sorrow which man has not produced himself, but which God has caused in him by his word. The text reads, Kata theon lippe, sorrow in accordance with God, or produced by God. It is another grievous perversion of the Christian doctrine to tell an alarmed sinner that he must first experience contrition and when he asked how he must go about that, to tell him that he must sit down and meditate, and try to draw or elicit repentance from his heart. That is what the papists teach. But their teaching is sheer hypocrisy. There is not in all the world a person who can produce contrition in himself. 
he may labour to bring it forth until he becomes dissolved in tears, but it is all a hypocritical sham. Godly sorrow is required, because faith is required. God, by terrifying us, wants to produce this sorrow. We must not imagine that contrition is a good work which we do, but it is something that God works in us. God comes with the hammer of the law and smites our soul. A person who wants to make himself sorrowful desires ever to increase his sorrow over sin, but if person merged in the right kind of sorrow yearns to be rid of it, he is tormented day and night. He may frequent saloons and make a futile attempt to drive away his sorrow by drink. Among his companions he may be a braggart, but when he is at home his conscience tells him, You are damned. If you die to-night you will go to perdition. That is godly sorrow, produced not by man but by God himself. God has no regard for any miserable product of man. Let me present two testimonies from the Apology of the Augsburg Confession. We read, Moreover, our adversaries teach and write many things that are still more inept and confusing. They teach that grace may be merited by contrition, when they are asked to explain why Saul and Judas, in whom there was quite an awful contrition, did not merit grace. They ought to answer that Judas and Saul lacked the gospel and faith, that Judas did not comfort himself with the gospel and did not believe. For faith constitutes the difference between the contrition of Peter and Judas. But our adversaries give no thought to the gospel and faith, but to the law. They say that Judas did not love God, but was afraid of the punishment. Is not this an uncertain and inept way of teaching repentance? In that real great distress described in the Psalms and Prophets, when will an alarmed conscience know whether it fears God as its God from love, or whether it flees from and hates his wrath and eternal damnation? These people may not have experienced much of these anxieties, because they juggle words and make distinctions according to their dreams. But in the heart, when the test is applied, the matter turns out quite differently, and the conscience cannot be set at rest with paltry syllables and words, as these nice, leisurely, and idle sophists are dreaming. In the papists' view, the reason why Judas perished was because his contrition did not flow from love of God. If it had, he would have acquired merit. Papists are always looking for some merit, either of the de congruo or of the de condigno kind. The adversaries infer that works merit grace, sometimes de congruo, and at other times de condigno, namely when love is added. Again from the Apology. It is impossible to ascertain the motive of a person's contrition. No matter what it is, when we behold someone in terror of hell, we are to comfort him. The love of God will surely be manifest by him later. Papists talk about contrition as a blind man talks about color. They have never experienced the salutary terror on account of their sins. When a poor sinner comes to one of their learned theologians, he asks, What is the quality of this contrition that causes your distress? The poor man may be unable to explain this point properly, and he says that he knows nothing about it, but that he feels terribly distressed. Then the learned doctor may direct him to apply to a surgeon for a cupping. He will feel better when he is rid of his sluggish blood. Good heavens! What great theologians! How can they properly speak of matters of which they have no experience, and which are to them mere subjects of speculation? Again, the Apology says, When we speak de contritione, that is, regarding genuine contrition, we cut out those innumerable questions which they cast up, namely, whether a person's contrition flows from love of God or from fear of punishment. For these are nothing but mere words and a useless babbling of persons who have never experienced the state of mind of a terrified conscience. But we say that contrition is the true terror of conscience. When it begins to feel its sin, and the anger of God against sin, and is sorry for having sinned, and this contrition takes place in this manner when our sins are censured by the word of God. Amidst these terrors, the conscience feels the serious anger of God against sin, which is a matter entirely unknown to such idle and carnal men as the sophists and their like. It is then that the conscience first becomes aware what a great disobedience to God sin is, 
It is then that the terrible anger of God presses down on the conscience, and human nature cannot possibly bear up under it unless it is raised up by the word of God. Thus says St. Paul, By the law I am dead to the law. For the law does nothing but accuse the conscience. It commands people what to do and terrifies them. In this connection the adversaries do not say a word concerning faith. Hence they do not teach one word regarding the gospel, or Christ, but their teaching is entirely from the law. They tell people that with their pain, contrition, sorrow, and anguish they are meriting grace, provided their contrition is from love of God, and provided they love God. Good heavens, what kind of preaching is that to consciences that are in need of comfort? How can we love God when merged in such great distress and unutterable agony? when we feel the great and terrible earnestness and anger of God, which is stronger than any person could express by words. Why, it is nothing else than sheer despair that these preachers and doctors are teaching, when they preach to poor consciences in distress, not the gospel nor any comfort, but only the law. The Lutheran confessions offer to poor sinners this sweet comfort, that when God has given them the grace to be alarmed on account of their sins, they are in a fit condition to approach the throne of grace, where they receive forgiveness, the true remedy for all their ills. They must indeed have contrition, however, not to the end of acquiring some merit by it, but in Ormed Papists, of course, know that this is not Lutheran doctrine. However, there are ever so many Papists, even among the priesthood, who actually regard the Lutheran Church as a noxious sect, which teaches that the mere mental perception of certain tenets justifies and saves men and lands them in heaven, no matter what kind of life they lead. In opposition to this view, Luther declares that if fides formata signified the faith wrought by the Holy Spirit, this faith is a fruitful source of all good works. And if it is said that this faith justifies, he is in full harmony with the papists. However, they must not add faith saves because it has the aforementioned beautiful form for faith first justifies and saves a person and after that it is also productive of good works luther continues accordingly if they the papists were to distinguish faith properly formed fidem formatum from false or fictitious faith their distinction would not be offensive to me but they are speaking of faith that receives its proper form from love, and they establish two kinds of faith, faith unformed and faith properly formed, in formem et formatam. This altogether noxious and diabolical gloss I am forced to repudiate in the strongest terms. For they say, even where there is infused faith, which is a gift of the Holy Spirit, and in addition acquired faith, which we produce ourselves by many acts of believing, still both these kinds are unformed. They receive their proper form by love. Let us remember that a host of people have been snared by the Jesuits, and when reproved by Lutherans that they do not teach justification by faith at all, they reply, Your Lutheran preacher has told you that. We do not teach that doctrine. We are teaching a better doctrine than yours. You say, only believe, and you will go to heaven. We say, a person is justified by faith, namely by faith which worketh by love, as the Apostle Paul teaches. Now, a person not knowing that all this is a piece of knavery, imagines that he has been wrongly informed about the doctrine of the Catholic Church. However, let no one permit himself to be deceived. The Jesuits do not speak of faith as a source of love, but of faith that has love existing alongside of it. Hence, it is a lie when they say, in any sense, that a person is justified by faith. When they add the term formata to fides, they really mean works. For they say that a person is justified by faith if he has works in addition to faith. Their faith is worth no more than the imitation money used in a business college, or the toy money of children, which looks like real money but has no purchasing power. The Roman Doctrine of Justification is nothing else than a complete denial, annihilation, and condemnation of the gospel. Any sect is incomparably better than the papacy, the Roman Church. 
the sects worry ever so much over their works of piety their wrestling for grace and their prayers but they still hold fast the teaching that faith in the lord jesus alone justifies and saves a person when a poor methodist or baptist is in his final agony he realizes that faith alone saves and he dies saved when he takes refuge in the lord christ but the dying papist has to think of purgatory and how long he may have to be confined in it because he lacks charity and good works he has to consider himself lost that was the devil's aim when he founded the papacy he wanted to destroy the redemption of christ by the abominable doctrine that faith does not justify and save except when there is another element added to it which acquires salvation in conclusion luther writes according to their fancy faith without love is like a painting or anything beautiful to behold that is placed in the dark and cannot be seen until light is let into the place that is until love is added to it by this view love is made the essence of faith and faith the material on which love works that means that love is placed above faith and a person's righteousness is ascribed not to his faith but to his love for whatever gives a certain quality to something possesses that quality in a higher degree therefore the romanists are really ascribing nothing at all to faith because they ascribe righteousness to faith only on account of love moreover these perverters of the gospel of christ say that infused faith which has not been obtained by preaching or some other operation but is wrought in man by the Holy Spirit, can exist in a person who is guilty of a mortal sin, and can be found in the worst scoundrels. For this reason, they declare it an inert and useless thing when it is alone, even if it were to be of the wonder-working kind. Thus they rob faith entirely of its function, and ascribe it to love, by declaring faith utterly worthless, unless that which gives faith its proper form, namely love, is added to it. In his commentary on Galatians, on chapter 2, verse 19, Luther writes, When I have thus apprehended Christ by faith, have become dead to the law, justified from sin, and liberated from death, the devil, and hell by Christ, I begin to do good works, to love God, to show Him gratitude, and to practice love towards my fellow man. But my love, or the works that follow after faith, neither give the proper form to my faith, nor do they adorn it. But my faith gives love its proper form, and adorns it. Caritas non est forma fidei, said fides est forma caritatis. This axiom of Luther shows up still more plainly the hideousness of the papist teaching regarding faith. For, mark you, they do not say that faith does not save when a person has formed faith by his own effort but even when it is genuine faith produced in a person's heart by the holy spirit even this true faith they hold can exist in a person who lives in mortal sin as the council of trent has declared and it does not justify a person unless love is added to it the very opposite luther says is true it is faith that gives love its real essence and makes it genuine and good not vice versa the papists regard Galatians 5.6 as a valuable proof-text for their doctrine, but they totally misinterpret the text. Commenting on this text, Luther says, The sophists force this text to support their view that we must be justified by our love and good works. For not to say anything of faith which a person has obtained by his own effort, de fide acquisita, they declare that even faith infused into a person by God does not justify unless it is given its proper form by love, because they call love that grace which makes a person acceptable in the sight of God, gratium gratum facientem, what we, speaking in the words of Paul, would call justifying grace. Moreover, they say that love is obtained by our merit, which God is in justice bound to reward, nostro merito congrui, and so forth. Yet they even maintain that infused faith can exist in a person living in mortal sin. Thus they remove justification entirely from faith, and attribute it to love alone. And they want to establish this doctrine of theirs by what Paul says in this passage when he speaks of faith that worketh by love. Just as if Paul had meant to say, See, 
faith does not justify it amounts to nothing unless work producing love is added to it which gives faith its proper form however all these strange horrible ideas have been fabricated by unspiritual men could any one tolerate the doctrine that faith the gift of god which is poured into men's hearts by the holy ghost can exist alongside of mortal sin one could tolerate such teaching if they were referring to faith which a person acquires by his own effort, or to historical faith, that opinion which a person, by using his natural reason, forms from a study of historical faith. Their teaching would apply correctly to the latter kind of faith, but since they speak of imparted faith, they plainly reveal that they have no true understanding whatever of faith. Besides, they read this passage of Paul through a colored glass, as we say. They pervert the text and twist it, so as to make it favor their fancy. For Paul does not say, Faith which justifieth by love, or faith which makes a person acceptable by love. A sense of that kind they have imagined and foisted upon this text by violence. Much less does the text say, Love makes a person acceptable. No, this is what the Apostle says, Faith which worketh by love. He states that works are performed by faith through love, not that man is justified by love. The papists, in their unchristian error of work righteousness, mistake the scope of Galatians 5.6. That text does not state what faith affects before God, but what it does viewed by itself. It is active through love, after it has obtained for the believer righteousness before God and everlasting salvation. With the papists, this error is fundamental, and within the Protestant churches there is also, in most instances, faulty teaching on this point. After declaring that salvation is altogether by grace through faith, many Protestants add, of course, faith must produce also good works, because they are afraid that the above statement might offend people if it were not qualified. But by adding the qualification, they have perverted and upset their whole preaching, for with that qualification all their preaching about grace and faith is futile and a wasted effort. For what they say with that qualification sounds as if faith were not sufficient for justification, and had to be reinforced by love. When you preach on this subject, this is how you must speak. Of course, a person that has not love, let him understand that he has not faith either, hence he cannot be righteous in God's sight. That is the proper way to speak not because love justifies a person in God's sight, but because only that is genuine faith, wrought by God through the Holy Spirit, which flows forth in love of God and our fellow men. End of Lecture 21《Of the Proper Distinction Between Law and Gospel》by C. F. W. Walther, translated by W. H. T. Dow. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Twenty-second Evening Lecture, March 13, 1885 It is an undeniable fact, my friends, that at the present time there is a greater number of believing theologians than when I was young, fifty years ago. In those days, hardly any others than vulgar rationalists occupied not only the ecclesiastical offices created by the government, but also almost all the pulpits. The small number of believing theologians were tolerated, provided they behaved by keeping quiet, made no serious attempt to confess their faith, and above all, did